So it's all right. So in this age, uh, with uh, the astronomic increase in cyber crime, um, cyber criminals, with all uh, thieves or criminals finding their way to the internet or computer, it is only wise that individuals as well as savvy business owners uh, learn what it takes to be able to protect themselves, their resources and businesses from cyber uh, crimes or cyber thefts. So whether it is your desire to learn uh, ethical hacking just for the sake of protecting yourself and your resources uh, from cyber theft, or you intend learning ethical hacking for the sake of uh, pursuing a career in cyber security, so you could be hired as a, a cyber security personnel, land a good job as a cyber security personnel, whatever those purposes are, so long it is uh, a good purpose for learning it, this course is definitely the perfect course for you. You are learning your uh, uh, hacking for the sake of uh, protecting your, yourself and your resources. This is the perfect course for you. Now, this course does not assume any prior knowledge of uh, uh, programming. So, as such, uh, you will first of all be taking, uh, uh, but however, in as much as that is, you require a programming language, the knowledge of a programming language to be able to uh, be able to create your own custom uh, ethical hacking tool. Okay, so as such, we, in this course, you first of all be taking through the Python programming language, which is one of the most popular and the highest in demand programming language, and one of the most effective programming language for ethical hacking. So you first of all be taught a Python programming language from the basic to advanced, uh, to an intermediate level. All right, then after the uh, learning Python, you'll be taught uh, how to set up your, your ethical hacking lab effectively, a testing lab or laboratory. And once you are done with setting up your lab, we'll go on to show you how to be able to create uh, different ethical hacking uh, tools using the Python programming language that you have learned. And that is it. So it is uh, with that, uh, on that note that I welcome you uh, officially to this awesome and special course on Python ethical hacking. In this particular lesson, I uh, want to uh, quickly introduce, uh, explain to you the meaning of hacking and uh, ethical hacking. Now, what is hacking? Hacking in the simplest definition simply means identifying and exploiting the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities of a particular computer system or network with the intent of gaining unauthorized access to it. I come again. Hacking is identifying and exploiting the, vulner the, the vulnerabilities of a particular computer system or network, ultimately with the intent of gaining unauthorized access to it. All right, with that defined, now I want to talk about briefly the types of hacking. Types of hacking. Now, I've defined hacking in the last uh, slide. So what is what are the different types of hacking? We have three types of, mainly three types of hacking. We have the black hat hacking, black hat hacking, white hat hacking, gray hat hacking. Now, what is black hat hacking? Black hat hacking is ultimately hacking with the intent of malicious uh, with, uh, with with intent of malicious attack or for malicious reason to in order to uh, for it ultimately for a personal gain ultimately most of the time is for financial gain purpose then the white hat hacking is hacking with the intent of discovering the vulnerability or the weakness of a particular computer system or network and ultimately reporting that weakness or vulnerability to the organization or the person involved then there's what we call gray hat hacking. Gray hat hacking is a combination of the black hat and the white hat. Now, what do we mean by the combination? The gray hat hacker gains unauthorized access now without the permission of the person or the organization involved. Now, but it doesn't actually have the, the same motive as the black hat hacker. It doesn't have a personal uh, uh, gain motive. Although even though you may have some gain, but not this, with the same intent as a black hat hacker. In that when the gray hat hacker hacks a system, discovers a vulnerability in a particular computer system, what he or she does is to report, it could report the, the vulnerability to the organization and then maybe the advise organization on how to uh, protect the, uh, the system or the network from the malicious attackers. Okay, then some of them, some of the gray hat hacker can also be doing this just for the fun of it. So they may not, they are not doing, they don't uh, uh, hack to, through the system 
with a malicious intent of a uh, personal gain uh, intent just like the black hat hacker all right then going over now to the, the main topic which this course cover which is ethical hacking we're talking about python ethical hacking now ethical hacking what is it all about it falls into the category which we call which have been talked about the white hat hacking now the essence is that this uh, this the this skill of an ethical hacker is to be able to identify the vulnerabilities uh the weakness of a particular computer system or a network then with the intent of reporting that vulnerability or weakness to the organization or the person involved okay and he has the permission to be able to do that and of course in order to be able to do that he has to use the same tools in which the other type of hackers use the ethical hacker uses the same tools uh, the hacking tools in which the uh the black hat and the uh, uh, gray hat hackers use to be able to discover this uh, vulnerability to be able to test the the loopholes in which the uh, uh, the malicious attackers would exploit so that the organization can uh, once the organization knows about it they'll be able to secure themselves from a such uh, attack before time okay so this is it then in the, this is the uh, the definition of uh, of hacking and we have seen the different types of hacking then also the meaning of ethical hacking so in the next lesson we'll be looking into the legal uh, issues concerning uh, hacking all right so this is the end of this particular lesson so over to the next uh, uh, video so in the last uh, lesson the last video i did tell you when we talked about uh, the, the types of hacking and the different types of hacking that I, even as an ethical hacker the ethical hacker still makes use of the same tools in which the black hat and the gray hat hacker uses uh, but ultimately the difference is that the is in the intent and that the ethical hacker has the permission often, often obtains the permission of the individual or the organization involved to be able to do the hacking to be able to make use of those tools on the system okay now in as much as that is uh an individual could want to learn anyone someone could want to learn this uh, course for the intent of using it for malicious attacks and if that is your intention this the essence of this particular lesson is to let you know that there are legal consideration there are legal, there are penalties uh, based on the different laws of different countries on uh, 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 on ethical hacking especially hacking without the permission of an organization or an individual so you hack into an organization or an individual's system or network and you are caught after investigation based on the level of of your uh, of harm that you have done into the organization or the individual you will be penalized accordingly in some countries you can uh, the, the charges for imprisonment the imprisonment charge can go from anywhere from five years to as much as 10 years imprisonment then the, on the other hand some of them could go for with uh, an option of fine up to fifty thousand dollars fine so if you are intending to the essence of learning this or co this course is for you to use it for uh malicious uh, purposes which we this course is not all about it's about ethical hacking you want to but you want to learn it for that people you need to put that into serious consideration because you are going to be fine and of course uh, we disclaim ourselves the, the, we, are, we are not uh, this course does not promote the, the illegal usage of ha uh, hacking skill hacking into uh, an organization's system without permission so if you get caught you will be fully penalized by the law and different laws it, 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 uh, it depends on the kind of uh, the, the level of the degree of your the, the harm you do to an organization system you'll be penalized accordingly so like i said already up to in some countries up from five you can get anything from five to uh, uh to ten years jail term for the, uh, for unethical hacking and up to fifty thousand dollar fine so that is just it so Based on, you have to get that handy as you plan on taking a career in uh, ethical and uh, hacking or cyber security so that is that so that is just the little consideration that we need to draw before we move further to other parts of the lesson so that is us over to the next uh, lesson right, so in this uh, uh, lesson we want to look at the reason why we should use why you should choose the python programming language for ethical hacking all right now number one that python is an open source high level programming language which means it the source code are free for you to use without having to obtain license from anyone 
it is free of charge to use then the high level uh, pro being on high level programming language unlike the uh the low level programming language the python uh, code uh the syntax are very close to english language and which makes it very readable and also brings us to point number two which makes it very easy to learn okay and that is the reason why most developers make use of python because of the easy uh, the the the, uh, the the syntax are very easy to learn the readability and the fact that it's very easy to learn uh, so it's very it become very attractive for both beginners and advanced developers alike all right then python uh, has very powerful modules and library for hacking so as a hacker in this context of hacking so the reason you want to choose the python programming language that it has powerful modules that can help you uh, modules or libraries that can help you with your ethical hacking adventure with ease okay, we have uh, such as uh, we have uh, ethical hacking uh, libraries or modules such as hash lib uh, n map which, uh, which is network mapper network s forsa and etc and etc so which means uh, and also it also makes it very easy for you to be able to develop your own custom hacking uh, ethical hacking scripts then apart from hacking python is also a general purpose programming language which has application in different fields of uh, uh, development. You can use Python for web development. You can use Python for desktop app development. You can use Python for artificial intelligence. You can use it for data science and a whole lot of it. So Python, learning the programming, uh, the Python programming language presents you with a whole lot of opportunities apart from uh, ethical hacking. All right. Then Python has a very large community, a support community that can help you in case you run into any challenge while developing your code or your application so you can easily get help from these uh, the several communities online okay so these are the reasons why you should want to choose the python programming language for your ethical hacking all right so in the next lessons we'll be looking at how to set up uh, the python development environment on windows we'll first see how to download python and install it then we'll also be able to then the other lesson we'll talk about how to install an ID so that we can be able to learn the, the Python programming language from basic to an intermediate level before we go over to the other part of the, uh, the, the ethical hacking uh, lessons properly. So now this is the end of this lesson. So over to the next right now. In this lesson, we want to see how to install uh, Python, the Python uh, programming language on our Windows machine before we start off with the other part of the, uh, with the, the Python lesson. So in order to install Python to your machine, the first thing you need to do is to open your browser. Now I will be using uh, Google Chrome. I have it already open now. So I go to Google Chrome, then visit Google, www.google.com. That is the uh, quickest approach. So you write, just type Python download. Python download. So now this opens the Python uh, the Python website here. Yeah, so we visit it. That is python.org. So we can be able to download the latest version for Windows. So here we are. Download. It shows here. Say download the latest version for Windows. So we just click on this place. That is Python uh, 3.11.1. So it's downloading now to my machine. So uh, we just wait a little. Just a few minutes. It will soon be downloaded. So it's downloaded right now. So just show where it is downloaded. Show folder. Go to the place now. So let's just take it down to uh, my de the desktop to make it easier. Or else I will just take it to the desktop. I copy to the desktop to install it on our machine. So just double click and just follow the installation wizard. So here it goes. So say okay. It, uh, yeah, it tells us the version is we are installing. We are about to install Python 3.11.164 bits version. So we'll just go ahead. So let's look at the other thing. You say, okay, add to path. Let's check the you have to add, uh, check the add to path so that you can easily be able to call Python from every uh, from the call command prompt and it will answer easily. So we'll say custom installation. You click on custom installation, leave everything the way they are by default. And click next okay uh we'll leave the rest of the thing the way they are like that okay so we just follow the default settings and that will be okay enough we'll just wait for the installation to be complete it won't take shouldn't take much time just patiently wait 
then it will install on our machine once the installation is done i uh, will be able to check it out using our command uh, prompt okay so just just waiting for the installation to get done all right okay so it's installing uh, python development libraries and all the standard library so we just wait a little while installation will soon be complete and we'll have python on our windows machine for learning uh, the python programming language before proceeding to the other part of the uh, course on uh, ethical hacking all right so let's just wait a while for the installation process to be complete all right it's almost done with installation the installation is about getting done so just a little wait and it will be done all right the installation process is going on it will simply get done All right, so it uh, now it say setup was successful. Once you see this now, it means Python uh, installation is done. So, and it has been added to the path. So just close. Now to check if Python is really indeed running on your machine, just click on this place. If you're using Windows 10, then just type CMD. And okay, and it brings the command prompt for you. So just check if your Python is installed on your machine, just type Py, and that's it. It shows Python is here. It brings in the Python command law, uh, line uh, dialog. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, then here we have uh, Python 3.11 and the rest of them. So you can go ahead now and start working with Python here. You see now, 1 plus 1 is 2. And that is it. So we have Python already installed on our Windows machine. So this is just it's very simple. So I repeat the process again. You just simply you go to a browser. You can go to python.org straight away, or you can go through Google to make it easier. Just type Python download, just like I did. All right. Uh, then from there it led us to the main Python uh, website. So you or you could just come straight here and just type python.org like downloads, and it brings you here. You download the one for your your operating system. In this case we are using uh. Windows, there is a version for Windows, there is a version for Linux, there is a version for Mac OS and others. But hence, we are using a, a window, want to learn with, from the Windows here. Yeah. I downloaded the version for Windows and you saw it. Once downloaded, just take it to where it will be easy. You can actually uh, do the installation from the download uh, uh, folder, but I just had to move it to the uh, to the desktop. Then once we are done here, yeah, we now have Python installed on our machine. And that was at this house that we found that if there's Python now, with by just typing Py, we're able to see that Python is already installed. So this is just it's very simple to install Python on your machine. Uh, uh, the, what the idea you want to install, like I said before in the last lesson, is uh, Visual Studio Code. So to do that, you can actually also make use of Google too to make your uh, to make it faster. So you write VS Code download on your uh, Google search box. So here we go. So we are going to move down to select the one for our version. I'm working with uh, Windows. So I'm going to download VS Code for Windows. So it's downloading right now. Very easy to download. Um, once it's done, we are done installing VS Code on our machine. And the system, the next thing we need to add is the, we now look for the uh, Python extension and auto so that we'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to use it for, uh, by our Python coding instead of making use of uh, PyCharm. All right, so it's a very good alternative to PyCharm. Using VS Code for Python is a better, a very good alternative to uh, PyCharm. All right, so uh, I'm going to show it like I did the last video. So just cut it to the desktop uh, for 
it to be better of just take it here and paste so i double click double click okay so we double click and wait for the installation wizard to show up so we accept and uh, continue so it to be uh, installed to the default folder here on the programs pi so next next and uh, i think uh, the defaults are okay next just install so it's really a straightforward installation process it's really straightforward it's not difficult so we just wait for the installation to get through once the installation is through we now add the we simply add the python extension to it and we are good to go with our python uh, lesson in this particular course all right so just give it a little time this will be done in a few minutes from now. So, okay, so now we have VS Code installed on our machine. No, now, so with uh, VS Code now installed on our machine, the next thing we need to do is let's just look away to at least take it to where we can easily access it. So we can just type VS Code. If you are on Windows 10, you can go through that process. Then let's just pin it to... Uh, taskbar so that it will be appearing here okay so that it will be easy for us to access so you just open it okay uh vs code the vs code is here right now okay so the next thing we need to add for us to be able to use python for you to be able to use python uh, code to be able to run python code in your vs code you need to add the python extension and the best approach to do that is to go through the marketplace okay so for that just go to your browser let's go through google to make it easy for you all right, so, and uh, you just type VS Code Python extension. It's already showing up here. Okay, so you see the mark. So you go through the market when it opens. Go to the market place, the Visual Studio Code marketplace. Okay, so you can be able to guide. All right, so in this place now, you now have the Python Microsoft, the Microsoft the Python extension for VS Code. And this is the what I will recommend for you when we are working with the uh, Windows. All right. So we click install. All right. So as it is now, if you uh, if it wasn't installed already on my machine, you see that this thing will get it. It will be installed here right away for you. The Python extension, the, the Microsoft Python extension for VS Code will be installed here. But as it is now, I've already gotten it installed on my machine. So as it is now, I, with the uh, Python extension installed installed on my uh, VS Code. I can be able to work with uh, VS Code, use, uh, work with Python using VS Code. All right, so let's go ahead now to run our first Python code using VS Code. So I'm going to quickly navigate to the desktop and just uh, create a new folder. I'll just call it, let's just call it PyTest for the now, uh, just to give you, uh, to ensure that, Py, uh, uh, to show you how to work with uh, 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 Python on VS Code. So just open our VS Code right now and just open a new folder open folder okay i'll uh, go over to the desktop i choose pytest all right okay pytest all right now i have pytest here now pytest so inside right here now i'm going to be able to create a file inside so in this place there's new file you can create new folder inside and refresh and collapse and revel now i want to just create a new file for the test i'm going to say just say hello although we're going to go out to uh we'll do out to uh okay let's just say test test dot pi test dot pi so enter all right so then let's just say uh we're going to just say print one plus one all right print one plus one then you can save it but then vs code enables you to uh, uh you can enable or to save so uh, so that once you just create any file, it is automatically saved for you. So you can click auto save. Auto save is already enabled. Okay, let me just auto save. So auto save is there. so once uh, whatever you're typing here, it will automatically save for you. All right. So that is a very wonderful feature of uh, the VS Code, uh, Visual Studio Code. So now let's see. To, uh, to run the code now, to run the Python code that we created, you just click on Terminal, then type pi. Uh, the name of the file is test.py. So you just click enter. You see, it gives us two. So which means Python is running uh, very well, working very well already with our VS code. So that is the end of the lesson on how to install 
Visual Studio Code on your Windows 10 machine or your Windows machine. All right. Then I think with for other system there will be a little different, but the procedure should be much uh, uh, different. Okay. So this is the end of the lesson. So over we'll move over to the next session of this course. So according to the tradition of our people or uh, when uh, learning any programming language. The first lesson, the first lesson should be the uh, an application, the basic application, the simplest application that says nothing but but a low word. So I'm going to see how to be able to write a low word application in the Python using the Python programming language. Okay, before we move further to the other part of the prog uh, the Python programming language. So first of all, before we move further, let me quickly move this files, this uh, source files here to okay. The particular folder so my desktop will be well organized now uh this the folder i use it for the test now i want to create another folder uh where all our python uh, uh less uh, code lessons will be installed so i'm going to just call it let me call it python uh let's say python lessons python lessons this is where we'll be saving all our python codes to so the first uh code we're going to write the first uh, program we're going to develop is the one that says nothing but hello world. So I'm going to open VS Code from this uh, taskbar here that I pinned it to for uh, easy access. All right. So continue from the last lesson. So we have already uh, seen how to install Python on the machine. We installed Python is already installed. We have VS Code installed. So we want to write our hello world application in Python. All right. So in this particular place, we have the test. So now I'm going to uh, bring in the new folder that I created now. So we can be saving all our files here. So I'm going to say uh, open folder. All right. Then on to the desktop. So navigate to the desktop here. Then I choose Python lessons. For this, I want to put up my Python lessons. So we open the folder. All right. Uh, okay. I went about opening a file instead of folder open a folder rather so from the desktop i open python lesson to so select folder so that i'll be using it for all our lessons so this ask do you trust the authors of this folder you say yes all right then from here now we'll be uh, creating our low world application inside here inside this folder in vs code so we'll say new file like I already showed you how to do in the last lesson. So new file. So I'm going to just say hello, hello world, hello uh, world. I call it this way. Hello world dot pi. Okay. So okay. So uh, what we're going to do here is to create an application that just just try to print an hello world to the screen. We're just writing an application that will print hello world to the screen. Now here it's saying that we should select interpreter so of course we are using our python uh, interpreter that we installed on the machine so let us simply say so to print hello world to your browser or uh, to this uh, to the terminal all we have to do is just to say print print uh print hello world and that's that so Python is very easy. So with this, we'll be able to display our hello world application, our hello world uh, uh, you know, string to our uh, terminal. Okay, so with this, uh, Visual Studio Code should already auto save it. It's saved already. So now let's, let's run it, open a terminal. And uh, once the terminal, now the terminal is open. So like we did before, you just come and say hello world dot pi and that's it it prints hello world so this is the most basic application of any programming language and we have been able to see how we can use the python programming language to write our basic uh, program application that does nothing but just print hello world all right then again python also if you've seen me when I, uh, we just installed the python python can also work from the interactive mode so in case you want to test out some code, you can also work with the command line. You can just use CMD here, uh, uh, system terminal from Windows here. And just to enter the, uh, the interactive mode, you just type pi. 
and it will bring you to this place. So we can also do the hello world here. So this uh, interactive world is very good, especially when you want to just test out code instead of putting it in a file. You can just come here and type it. So just say uh, print hello, hello world. So just uh, this just introduces also to the interactive mode, uh, though I've shown you before. All right. You just want to do some testing on Python. You can just and your Windows you can just go to the command uh, line instead of opening your uh, going through the process of opening your IDE and doing all that. If you want to just make it uh, do a little quick test with Python, you can just come to the command line and do your test. And but however, the code you write here are mainly temporary. So this is it. Our hello world application using a uh, Python. Okay, so now this is the end of this lesson. So over to the next lesson. Well, continuing from the last lesson, we'll be looking quickly into what we call comments. The very important aspect of programming in any programming language apart from Python. All right, so I'm going to quickly for that, I'm going to create a new file called python underscore comments dot pi. All right, so now what is a comment? A comment is simply a way of adding note to your to a block of code for the sake of remembrance. Okay? Remembrance for the developer that did it. After that is for example now you've been writing a block of code, a particular application, a code, and you come back to the code after one to two, three months, you may forget what you did, what the, the logic behind the particular block of code. But with the comment there, you'll be able to easily read through the comment and remember what you did in that particular block of code. Then secondly, the comment helps other developers. In case your code, want to, other developers want to work on your code, your code that you've written, you want to, they, they, it's handed over to another developer to modify it, to add other things to it. The comment makes it very easy to be able to add the code, uh, to be able to uh, read through the code, understand what you did, to be able to modify it effectively. All right, now in Python, there are two uh, major ways of uh, commenting. There is what we call a single line comment. So, for example, this is a single line comment. So, you just add the hash tag sign, the hash sign, and you then you can write uh, comments there. So, the browser will not, the, the, uh, in, the interpreter will not interpret this, it will not be uh, printed to the terminal or any graphical user interface that is uh, being run. All right, then then so it's double line comment, like multiple line comment. If you want to uh, achieve multiple line comment in Python, you use what we call the doc string. So here now you put a uh, triple open uh, uh, double quote. Then I think uh, um, a single quote will work, but double quote is more conventional. Then you come over here and say this is a multiple, multiple line, multiple, uh, multiple line comment in python all right python or let's write this word python okay which simply okay let's just put which simply means which simply means the comment can can multiple multiple lines so this is how you do it using a doc string so this is also referred to uh, this is referred to is referred to as a doc string doc string all right all right, so you can use a dot string for multiple line. You can use a single line. The uh, comment you can use a multiple line using a dot string in Python. Then, okay, for example, now to show you what will happen now. So let's say display. I want to uh, use a comment, a nice single line comment for the, in this instance. Say display to the terminal. Okay, this is a comment. It won't be displayed, but it's just for uh, commenting on a particular code. Now, now this code, this will comment. The comment will be for this code. Okay, that all right. So I'm going to say print uh, hello Python for instance. Hello Python. So let's uh, run. Oh, it is automatically saved now. VS Code will have, have uh, already helped us to save the code automatically, so we can easily run it now. So open a new terminal. All right. So from our terminal, we we'll just run. Uh, the name of the file is Python underscore 
comments dot pi so run you see of all the uh, things we wrote here is only the print uh, block the, the line 10 that was printed out because the rest are just comment that just for taking notes so I think this will give you gives you a good understanding of Python comment how to write comment in Python so this is the end of this lesson on Python comments so now over to the next lesson. continue from where we stopped in the last lesson on comments in this lesson we're looking at Python variables Python variables so I'm going to create another file right now I say Python variables dot pi okay now simply define a variable in Python or a Python variable is a reserved storage is a reserved uh, space for value storage all right okay so just like in uh, elementary mathematics elementary algebra where for instance you can say a you say if a is equal to uh, 5 e equal to uh, you can say a is equal to 5 then you can say uh, b right b equal to 6 they could now uh, you are not asked to say find so they will say find the value of z equal to uh, a plus okay now let's use c for better understanding c equal to a plus b all right so this is the same thing in uh in variable uh, here in python variable so in python here using it in python just to give you a quick example before we understand better what a python variable is i can just simply do that by saying c equal to uh, a plus c uh, which is uh, a is uh the value of a there is five so the a is storing uh, holding the value of six, b is uh, well, holding the value of five, y b is holding the value of six. So we can simply now print our answer to be the c now. Say print c in, in terms of uh, Python. So it will be automatically saved already. So let's run it from terminal. That will give us the answer. So quickly here, yeah. uh, pi. Uh, save it as a Python very underscore underscore variables dot pi so that gives us 11 so the, the now just we're just trying to use this as analogy to understanding uh, python uh, variables now in python what we just did now the a and b are actually variable value variables so a which is the operand at the left is a, is a variable name y5 at the right is the value which the uh, variable a is holding Okay, so hence we have said that a variable is a reserve space for value storage in python all right so depend on different so it, a variable can hold different kind of uh, data types which we'll talk about in the next lesson it can hold a string it can hold a number it can hold a float it can even hold uh, a list it can hold some other sequence and the rest of them all right now talking about variable naming let's talk about the how to name variable i'm going to get rid of this for the now now in uh, python variables to you can name a variables the variable names which is the operand at the left can begin with with a letter or an underscore for instance you, uh, you can have something like this name you can also start a variable name with the dice underscore name all right then that's for that then also you must understand also that in uh, variable names in python are case sensitive case sensitive case sensitive all right so the variable name 
is different from the variable name and also different from the variable name. All right. Now, all cap uh, names like this are said to be constants in Python. All right. Now, in Python, Python does not allow you to declare a variable, let's say name, without assigning a value to it. You see, uh, VS Code tells us right away that there's a name error. So, in Python, at the point of declaration of a variable, you must assign a value to it. Let's say here, yeah, a maker. Okay. So at the point of declaration, you must assign value to the S. You have, there will be a name error thrown. Now, then another thing we must also quickly learn about the, the Python variables is that uh, you shouldn't, when naming variable, when naming Python variables, Python variables, you must not use any of the Python reserved keywords. Okay. Keywords such as for, such as while, such as uh, uh, and not and the rest of them several reserve keyword you must avoid them when writing your python uh, variable name okay then quickly we must on that then there's also what we call uh, you can assign a, a single variable to multiple variable names in python this way for example you can do this a equal to b equal to c all equal to three. So if you print, for instance, if you are, if we print A, we print uh, B now. Print B. Print C. All these values, all of them will give us. Sorry, there's a print C, not three. If we print this out, it's going to give us the same thing, which is three. So let's say pi, Python, and that's the variables, dot pi. So you see all of them are assigned to three. So they all of them gives us three. So then also, you can also assign uh, uh, multiple values like this. For instance, a uh, to multiple uh, values to a. Well, let's just say this time around becomes uh, uh, t, then p, then let's say m. You will assign them. Let's say t should be a number. Then the other one should be a four. Then then the other one, let's say, will delay a string. Then you can print all out this way. The print T. All right. Print. So T will go for nine. Print T. All right. Then print M. All right. So we can quickly now go. Let's just copy this and run it. Now, knowing that uh, Python will help us to already do the uh, auto saving, that is a, a VS code. So, Python uh, underscore variables dot pi. So, you see, you can do all this. You can assign uh, multiple variables to different objects all at once okay so what next again we need to understand we need to also understand that uh, in python uh, you can when uh, you want to use a word that is at least two words or multiple words at once in naming your variable you should uh, separate them with underscore and each of the words will be in small letter 
Okay, so let's say we want to name a variable called first name. You see the first name is one letter underscore name. So this is the naming convention. First name, let's say a maker. All right. So you should always name your variable, Python variables, this way. All right. So basically, this is what how to uh, work with uh, variables in Python. So continuing from where I stopped in the last lesson on uh, variables, in this lesson, we are looking into the Python data types. So I'm going to name this file Python data, uh, data types dot pi all right so what uh python the python uh, variables can hold different kind of data types so in this lesson we want to look at the different data types that are available in the python uh, language python programming language so first we have to talk about the numbers numbers data types and numbers include integer we have uh, after num after integer we have uh, floats which are decimal numbers we have uh, complex numbers complex numbers all right so for that to make it very easy so we're going to just say for uh, this so we're going to look at the first one an uh, integer so integer uh, is uh, for example a whole number so this is an integer so then um, B floats, they are decimal numbers. Then uh, C, we're going to be able to use uh, the py uh, Python type function to be able to check out their data type very soon. We'll print them all out to we'll see it using the type uh, function. So then after that, we have uh, a complex number. All right. Then then I found there, the another data type we want to look into here is what we call the string. Python also have a data type known as string. We've been using that before. For example, you say name equal, okay, let's just say following what we are doing to make it easy, D equal to, uh, let's say John, John Dewey, all right, as a string. Then we, Python also supports what we call booleans, booleans. Booleans are simply true or false values. So we have D there, so here E is equal to true. True or false value are said to be Booleans. All right, so here true, then false. Okay, then we also look into what we call uh, sequence, Python sequence, different uh, sequence data types. So from here in the sequence we list we have the list we have tuple and we also have dictionary dictionary all right then so let's just print them out if this is the e f g or a list a list is represented this way in with a square two uh, square brackets okay opening and closing square brackets then tuple h tuple so a tuple is represented with normal brackets so four five this we can add the string here go or whatever then then we can represent dictionary h g h i so high i here so we can have a dictionary with curly brace so let's say name equal to name a uh, name uh let's say or uh, look okay, let name a maker okay name a maker uh, let's put a uh, capital letter but okay, there should be a string so name value pairs here which is an object so uh name a maker uh let's say Sex, sex, male. All right, then let's say age, 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 
go be uh, age, let's say uh, 30, 35. All right. Okay, it should be a string holding it as the key. So, yeah. So, this is a dictionary. So, now to check the data types, it's very easy. You use the type operator. I'm going to print out all the data type from A to H. So, print. So, here we'll come and say print type. You're calling the type operator so that we'll be able to know the data type. Uh, let Python be able to help us to print the data type. So, print A. So, control C. Here, control V. I'm going to just paste as much as possible, then I just change the variable names to save our time. Right? So, and uh, come, let's come over here now. So, A, B. Here now we have a C. Then here, D. Here, E. Here, right now, F. Then, G and right here H then we end with I so this will help us the type uh, the Python type function will help us to print out the data type so if you want to know a particular data type you need to make use of the type function so let's you open your terminal now it's automatically saved by uh, VS code so we'll open our terminal and pi Python data types let's run the code dot pi so you see it prints us all the data type the first was is an integer the second the float second uh, the third uh, complex a string we have the two boolean true uh, boolean true and false there is list there is tuple there is dictionary these are the major uh, data types in python there are other ones such as a set and uh, the rest of them there's also a type called none all right, for example, let me just put it here. A none. So let's say H I J to write none. So let's print it out with type. So print. Uh, okay, let's print that particular one out now. So type J. So we're going to run the code again now. Let's see the, uh, the data type of of j now so pi python uh, python data types data types data types dot pi you see it is a non type non type so it's another kind of data type non all right so these are the major data types in uh, python then quickly we want to see how we can do some little conversion now for instance we may want to convert from uh, a boolean to from a, a float to an integer or from an in, uh, from a string to uh, from a string back to an integer or from a, a, a different different uh, conversion what you call type casting now, for instance, let's uh, convert uh, the B now, which is a Boolean, to an integer. So let's do that here. So I'm going to come down right here. Let me scroll down so that I can see it clearly. So that is type, data type conversion. Python data type conversion. Okay. So for instance, you can just convert, let's say, uh, we have a B here. B is a, a bool, is a Boolean. So I'm going to say, we already have J, let's say K. Uh, so int uh, B. We'll convert that and then print it out. To so just make it clearer, let's try to comment out all this. Let's comment them all out. And so that the example I want to give now can be clearer. So just, I just comment them all out and just focus on the type 
conversion right now. Go over here now. And uh, so let's print. Print type. Or let's just print a, a key first before uh, checking the data type now. So, so pi, Python underscore data data types data types dot pi. We see it gives us two, so it's rounded it up converted it from being a boolean to an in integer all right then we can also convert we want to convert it back now to uh an integer let's say i k l so a variable l now to so convert it back to a float that is k for instance you can use the float functions and uh, it becomes okay so Load key. So let's print out uh, L now. So pi print Python underscore data types data types dot pi. All right. So you see now it has become a, a float. So if you check the data type now, so print type L. So this will give us, okay, let's run it again now. So pi, Python underscore data types dot pi. So you see the type is float. So with this, you can be able to do a lot of conversion. You can even convert from a, a string, from an integer to a string, from a string to integer. So you can do a lot of, a lot of function, different uh, these things. So for a string, for instance, you can just put a string, and this will take this to become a string. All right? So for the now, these are just a good understand. This just gives you a good understanding of, I believe this gives you a good understanding of Python data type. In this lesson now, we're looking at the Python operators. Now, the Python programming language provides us with different categories of operators. We have the arithmetic operators, the assignment operators, comparison operators, logical operators, identity operators, membership operators, and bitwise operators. All right. Then, quickly, we're going to go through them. Then here, for the arithmetic, these are operators you use for the arithmetic operations and uh, these are examples you have the uh, the plus you have the that which is addition we have the subtraction we have multiplication with the example here we have the division we have the mod, uh, the modulus we have the exponentiation we have the floor division operators now going further then we have the assignment for the assignment operator uh now the equal to sign is not actually called uh the, it's not called equal to in programming. We call it uh, assignment operator. So you can see how they are being, is being used there. You use it to assign value, especially when we're talking about a, a creating of uh, variables. So you see here, the uh, uh, S here is assigned to four. Then you can also add, uh, use the arithmetic operator along with the assignment operator to be able to do some arithmetics. So this place, for instance, now you see plus uh, equal to here gives us S plus equal to 2 and which is the same thing as s plus 2 so which is almost so added with all the other arithmetic operators uh, added with the uh, assignment operator you'll be able to use it for arithmetic uh, uh, operations all right now we're going to get a better understanding of all these operators as we make use of them in the course of these uh, uh, lessons that will be taken in this course all right so now number four we have the, the comparison operators such as the equal to you are seeing the example you can pause the video to to look at uh, the examples of them the examples then we have the not equal to we have the greater than we have the less than we have the greater than or equal to we have the less than or equal to so you can if you want to get a better understanding of them you can just pause the video to see uh, the examples better all right 
Then here, yeah, going further, we have the logical operators. The logical operators. Well, here we have the AND, which returns true if both statements are true. For example, S is equal, if S is equal to Y and S is less than Z, so then if it returns true, then we have the OR. It returns true if one of the statements is true. For example, now if S is equal to Y or S is uh, equal to Z, so if any of the statements are true, it returns true. All right? Then the NOS reverses the results. Well, that is what it does. So it returns false if the result is actually true. For example, now, if S equal to Y and S is less than Z, if the statement here is true, then the NOT operator reverses the result and returns, it returns false. All right? So that is for the logical operators. Then quickly, we'll talk about the membership operators. The membership operators. So here we have two major operators, the IN and the NOT IN. So here, you say it returns true. For example, if S is in Y, in, a, in, ob, in object Y, it returns true, or else it returns false. Then we talk about the the uh, the not in operator. For example, if S is not in Y, it returns it returns. If S is not in Y, it returns uh, true. If a sequence if with the uh, specified value is not present in the object, all right. Then finally, we talk about the bitwise operator, which is mainly used for working on binary numbers. And of course, in the during the course of this lesson, we will not be working with binary number, but it's still good you make uh, you get understanding of them. Then you can pause this video if you want to get an understanding of the, the bitwise op, uh, operators. Yeah, for example, we have here the bitwise and the bitwise or the bitwise or and the bitwise no, not, and the rest of them. So you can pause the video if you want to learn them. Then uh, for a better understanding of all these operators, although you are going to get, uh, see, uh, you're, you're going to get a better understanding of them as we see us use them in the course of uh, these lessons, the other lessons in this video uh, to the end, you'll be able to understand. Well, of course, we're not going to be using all the uh, operators that we talked about here. It's really this uh, bitwise operator, because we, may, we are not, like I said before, we're not going to be working with uh, binary numbers here. We will not see us use them, but it's still good you have a good knowledge of them. So how you get a better understanding of them is to go online, just go to Google, just type Python uh, operators. Then you'll be able to see all the few tables, and you copy them and put them in a, maybe in a Microsoft Word or a WordPad so that you can be using them for a reference whenever you want to get a, a, a make use of them in your uh, the operators in your application. So that's that. This uh, 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 this is the end of this lesson on the Python uh, operators. So in this lesson, uh, we want to quickly look at a very useful Python uh, function called the input uh, function, Python input function. So I'm going to say Python input, Python input dot pi, all right? So this function is very, very useful, especially when you are creating a command line application for interactivity, at least to uh, create a a kind of interaction with the user to be able to get user input, which is the input for this is a function input function. All right, uh, the input function generally returns a a string. It returns a string value. All right, so let's see how to make use of. For example, I can think I can print something like this. Uh, I can just say, please enter your name your name i could as well put it inside okay or i can put it as an empty string say name let's say name for instance name impute all right they'll give it i make it empty for the now then and when the name is gotten we can print out the name the value that was received all right so uh i open the terminal and uh Let's run it. So pi, Python input, Python input dot pi. All right. They say that the prompt comes in. So all I need to do is to put in my name, a maker. They say now it gives us a maker is printed out. All right. Then now suppose I want to get some more values. You can get more. Let's say I want to get first of all, uh, let's say first name here. Our first name, first name, 
Then here you have uh, let's say uh say let's say second name here instead of putting in the value there first name uh, okay sorry uh, let's say second second name equal to input uh yeah just simply say instead of going over to the other place say, enter your second name right then i will also want to collect the age now the value that is returned is being that uh, the input function returns uh, a string our uh, the age should be uh, an integer all i need to do is at the point of collection or using the input function i need to type cast it okay to be able to collect a so yeah let's say enter your age enter your age then once we are done with all that i can come over here and print now this variable is no longer available so that's why it's having that error so simply i'll just simply say okay uh hello uh hello then i can call the first name hello uh first name first name uh first name let's say i add a, a concatenation it gives in some space here using the right a kind of uh, space yeah just some um, string space then the second name second name then once that is done uh you'll say uh, your name your your you are let's say you are uh the age at the age you are age years old okay so let's go now so running the code right now so i'm going to come over here and do this so i say enter your name now supposed to be for the first name here so let me just put a maker all right so i think i should to get it even clearer let's stop the running of the application okay let me just add that we'll get back to that okay uh Odili. okay the age is let's just put 23 for the now so you get it hello emeka Odili. emeka Odili, you are 23 years old all right so that is for that and uh, so ultimately this function is very very important and that's why i have to take it as a single lesson on its own so you use it very uh, importantly very much in collecting user input from the command line especially when we are developing a command line application so this place we would have just changed it to enter your first name so we've seen now that you can either do this right do uh, uh, request the information you want to print at the top or you can inside of it you can put in the value uh, the enter the string of whatever uh, information you want to request from the user then in the end if you want to uh, change the data type maybe the, if you want to get a, an integer or a float you can actually type cast from the the string to the value you want to if you are actually maybe for example you want to get a float you can type cast it here before it is returned all right but in this contest we actually needed an integer so this is it for the python uh the very useful sorry i wanted to clear here uh, for in case you are not used to um the uh, vs code you want to get rid of all this code that you're written for every letter to be clear you type the clear command and that's that so this is the end of this lesson on the very useful uh, Python function, the input function. So now we'll move over to the next lesson right now. Okay, so in this uh, lesson, we want to look at uh, the basic aspect of Python string. Although in our lesson on data type, I did introduce, uh, we talked about the string data type. What is requires a better understanding. We require to we need to look into it for better understanding because there are so many things uh, we need to get a better understanding about the Python strings. So I'm going to call this file Python strings or string. Let's put it that way. Python string. Now, what is a string? 
a string uh, is a data type or a, or a collection of characters that are wrapped with or in a wrap we let us use a wrap with double or single quotes all right now i think this is too long the better is done this way all right now for instance say uh name john I say john dewey this is a string then it can also be okay let's say uh last name just for instance last name so let's for a better for more clarity first name let's make that john so John will be having a single ring at the first name. Then the second name here, or last name, let's say do we as a double quote. Now, if you want to use a string of uh, multiple line, you can also use what we call yes. If you want to use a, 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 a create a multiple line string. Like for example, I want to make use of this now as string rather than a comment. You can actually uh, use the triple quotes to do it. If for example, say let's say multiple, multiple line. Let's just leave it at that. So you come. You can either use multiple. Uh, that is three uh, quotes or just single quote or triple of them so this automatically becomes a string you can by this way you can write as many words as many lines as possible so this can contain this can be broken into many lines as possible okay and it can also also be used as a doc string doc string or commenting a code for commenting a block of code now most of the spellings may not be correct the grammar may not be correct but what we are after here is not the grammatical accuracy but for the understanding of the concept that a string can if you want to have a string with multiple lines you have to use these triple quotes here it can be, it can be single it can be a triple quote that way at the beginning or uh, that double quotes or you can also use a triple single quote it will still work okay so that's a, another fact about strings in python then again you must understand that strings in python are actually arrays or substrings so python arrays python string rather strings are arrays of sub strings or bytes all right which means for instance i call you can assess john doe now i want to assess the values that are in john in the first name uh, variable for instance the john variable you can actually print uh first name want to get the first value let's uh, and of course because our race start uh, normally start with zero so you print first name so it's going to give us here yeah, in position the an array basically uh 
start from position zero, the four, one, two, and three. So here, what we, the, when we run this, it's going to give us it will give us a J out of the John. So let's just run it. So pi Python ring dot pi the J. So you can be able to manipulate a string in Python as an array. You can access it, you can slice it, you can even loop through it. All right, for instance, you can just go ahead and say for uh, I in first name, right? Say print I. Okay, so let's print that. So it's automatically saved by VS Code. So let's go ahead and run the code now. By Python string. By. See, it loops through it. Okay, this other first one was for this. And that was why you saw the first J was for this first example. So this is for the looping. Okay. So looping. Looping through the a string Python, right? And maybe for the sake of clarity, we could just uh, print a new line here, which we're going to talk about very soon. Talking about uh, string operate, uh, string characters or escape characters. Okay, so this will help us to get a new line. So if I get this now and print again, it will now be clearer. Okay, you see now this is for the first uh, example here, which is talking about on line 17. Then this or remaining part talks about the looping of the uh, of the string. All right. Then as you can see already, Python has a lot of string. Then before we go talking about the escape strings or some uh, escape characters in, Pyth uh, in Python string, uh, Python the string escape character, let's talk about uh, concatenation, concatenations, string concatenation, concatenation, right? Now that if you have two strings such as uh, first name and last name, you can concatenate them. Now, in order to bring them together, firstly, by using uh, the concatenation operation, which is the addition sign, like this. You can say first name and just print. Let's print first name. Uh, first name. And last name. Because the, both of them are strings, you can actually concatenate them. Now, you must understand you cannot concatenate uh, a string and other data. For example, you cannot concatenate a string and an integer together. It will be first of all, let's see the, how the concatenation works. Before then, let's add uh, some space on it before we run it. All right, so I'm going to come here, concatenate a space. Come over here concatenating them all right so let's go ahead now and run get the terminal open now and uh, okay i already got that printer you see john doe concatenated that is bringing the two strings together using the plus sign all right now if i try to you now another example now using the f print f format uh the printer the, the f string Python F string. Now let's assume that uh, uh, we are, we have two string here. Let's say the other one. Let's say age is equal to fifty. Age now is an int integer. So let's try uh, to print. Try to concatenate first. Uh, let's say first name plus age. You see, it's going to show error. So let's run the code. And you're going to see error there. So you see, 
age it cannot age cannot be concatenated with first name because first name is a string while age is a is a, an integer so how do you do first of all let's clear here how do you be how can you be able to get it done so what you do you use what we uh, call as of uh, python 3.6 and above python provided a very powerful uh, way of getting this done of uh, adding two values together uh, uh, maybe even though they are not different uh, the same data types okay although i've shown you how to go about it in the uh, formal lesson but let me make it clearer now for example now this how they want to have, have the approach you can use to combine this together effectively is to use a comma approach and just say age and this will work okay, so let's run it okay it doesn't work it so this is for uh this doesn't this approach will work for normal strings okay, but now let's see a way to get this work to get this to work what you do is you use the f string here yeah? since these are variables or you can just go straight let's just for better for more clarity let's say first name is actually john for instance so john John, John, and this place now. I have this, this, and put this. So let's run now. John, okay, John, your age is. Okay, so in this literal now we to be seen they uh, to tell the system the interpreter to see this as a variable and we uh, you know executed as a variable before adding it up to this so let's clear this for just more clarity so let's run again so john your age is so we're going to get the age now so let's print All right Okay, uh, it seems there is something wrong somewhere. Let's see where the error is coming from. So string in line 33. So let's see line 33. All right. Yeah, this is where we are still having the issue from. Okay. Our first code was supposed to work. But sorry, that is Python comment. All right. So well, I was trying to say this. So we're having an issue here. So first name, you could do this and it will work. So let's run it again. So clear the air first. So let's run again. So you see this line 34 works. If you're using the comma approach or you can use the print F approach. So any of the approaches will work. Then quickly, we want to quickly look at uh what we call some escape string in uh in uh in uh, python uh, string uh, string uh, escape strings for example the only i don't want to talk about two of them for instance and say print hello hello i um currently learning now please uh, don't uh, take too much uh pay too much attention to grammatical error here don't focus on the concept that you've been taught okay so hello uh hello i am currently learning the python programming language all right you see now these tests are getting too long so if you want to create uh, put some part of it in a new line you use what we call a new line operator okay this guys backslash then n then this will put bring this part of it from the deep side to the a new line so let's run it so you see it brings from the d it brings it to a new line then what if you just wanted to use a tab so the other escape character i want us to work in is what the tab so backslash you put t 
So let's clear here and uh, let's run. So you see, it gives you this space here. So there are very other escape uh, Python uh, string escape uh, strings or characters that you need to learn. You just go online and study more about the Python strings because very important. You use it a lot. Very important to understand how to work with Python strings in developing your applications. So for the now, this will be the end. This is the end of this uh, lesson on Python strings. So we'll be moving over to the next lesson right now. So in this lesson, we want to look at we are going to, as we progress in the in our uh, knowledge of Python, we are going to a very uh, another very important aspect of uh, programming or Python programming, not only in Python in every other programming language, is the if statement. If statement, let's call it if statements because we're going to explore all the different aspects of if statement in this single lesson. So now if statements and other words for it uh are you that are used interchangeably are conditional statements conditional statements or decision decision control statements okay these are other interchangeable words now i haven't learned uh the operators in our lesson on operator we talked about uh comparison operator so we're going to use our knowledge there here yeah? so we're going to let's say s equal to 70 for instance then here y equal to uh let's say uh five all right then we can bring an if statement here to test the condition if let's say if y is less than x which we know it is true then you print out your value you execute a code here let's just say we say yes y is less than x all right now one thing i want to quickly bring it to your attention here is what we call indentation now the python programming language uses indentation for its block of codes all right if it's in other language such as uh uh PHP or you are working with a, a language such as a Java you can use a, a curly brace for this your if statement uh, if blocks but the Python language uses uh, what we call indentation extensively especially when you are working with uh, blocks of code like this such as the if statement so for example let me just get you to understand the concept of indentation these are just space so once you put this in order to indicate that this is a block of code that all the other codes uh, here will be under this if statement you are supposed to have an indentation although uh, our id which is vs code helped us to do it but in case you are working with an, uh, uh, an uh, a test editor or any id that doesn't help you with this indentation what you do you can add indentation manually by simply uh clicking on your the space button on your keyboard four times and you have your indentation properly added one two three four so you've got a good indentation or another approach of working with indentation you can also click your tab button to job in once the indentation will be added so you can use any of them you can use the tab or you can use the the four uh, the, the the space bar which we click four times all right so that's for each statement so let's execute this code it's already automatically saved so this is for just a single condition the if statement so i'm going to come here so i'm going to say if Phi, I want to run this code now on the terminal e pi if statements dot pi. You see, you see it? Yes, y is less than s. Then if I want to make it true, I could if I'm if I want to make it false, if I come over here now, I know you see now I've said if y is greater than s, of course we know that is not true. Y is not less than y is not greater than s, so not in prints. So you see it now because why the condition evaluates to false. So now, from here, we are, so this is for if statements, for just a single test, a single conditional, uh, a single uh, conditional test, you can use if statement. So this is if statement. Now, if you want to do multiple tests, multiple condition tests, you're now bringing what we call the elif statement. All right, 
So, for instance, now we want to uh, do more tests now on that our code. We can say if y, all right, if y is less than x, you can execute, say, print y, y, okay, let's put our quote, y is less than x. Now, what if we want to test for that condition? You're not bringing uh, your elif statement. The elif y is greater than x. Then do something as a print. So this is another condition test now. Y is greater than x. All right. So let's run this now. Uh, you can have multiple of such statement. Okay, we're already having our terminal open now. So just paste this. I've already copied it. You see, y is less than uh, x. All right. So this is for the elif. You can have multiple elif statements here. You can add more. So elif. Uh, there's another condition. Want to test it? Y is equal to x, which we know it is not. So print y is equal to y okay let's say y is equal to x and of course that will not be true because y is not equal to s so you go in and do this now that is for the early statement for testing multiple condition then again there's what we call the else statement s statement okay for the s statement what you do now in case all your evaluation all our evaluations are not correct for instance and if in case all your evaluations are not correct you want to have a block of the if block that uh, of the uh, of the code that handles the case of, of where there is no uh, no none of the the conditions are true how do you handle them so you use the the uh, the else block so let's say if y y is actually five so if y is less than five which is not true they print let's say five let's just print five all right okay let's say y is less than five then we can go ahead now let's just add a uh, for the sake of uh on that better understanding let's add another air leaf block and an air leaf block air leaf y is greater than five what do we do say print y and of course we see as we can see this none of the conditions are correct y is greater than five now we can see the two condition the two uh, tests are not going to be correct because y is not less than five neither is y greater than five so how do we handle this uh, a situation where none of the conditions are true so you say else, yeah, we'll call the else statement here. Yeah. Else, print, you can just say print none of the above. None of the above. All right, so let's run the code now to see how it goes. So right now, we see none of the above. So this brings us to the L. That's how you use the else statement. Then from there, we'll move over to another part of if statement what you call nested if statement so which means you can have more if statements inside a particular block of this any of the if uh, blocks whether from the if under the if block under the early block or under the else block so for instance so let's say nested if statement okay so for example now i can say if let's like use the same example we used before if, if, okay, let's use another. This time around, let you work with uh, x. If s is our value of s is seventy, yeah. So let's say if s is less than seventy, okay. And so we'll come over here. Okay, before then, let's do something. If s is greater than thirty, right? Say print. We want to print for that. In case that condition is run, it is true. Print s is greater than 30. And that is true. 
then we want to have more if statements so that we can add extra if statement with another nest so we don't have this is what we call nested if statement so we can say continue by saying if after the first condition is met if s is now less than 100 is less than 100 all right print s let's quote it s is less than 100 all right so that's a, a statement under a statement all right so you come over here and continue so elif you can use your elif statement here elif s is greater than 100 which is not okay sorry we have to come out of here you have to be at the same line here so elif s is greater than 70 or let's say greater than 80 we can do something else here print uh greater s is greater than 80. okay then finally we cannot bring in our s block that we did before and for with this i want to introduce you to something else here now in case now in you in your in python you cannot leave a, a particular block of if or s or elif block empty as you have written else block here you must pass in something either you print out something or you boy or whatever you can we must execute a particular line of code here so you can you are not allowed to leave it empty so instead of that if you really want to leave the place empty without executing any code what you should do is to use what we call a pass keyword so if you use pass the uh, the error code will uh, it will actually just pass the, the uh, system will not print any error so you can make use of that so let's to make the place clearer let's just clear off then just run the code so you run it so you see now everything is so why is less than the, that was for the first one this place now uh, we have s is less than first of all it said s so this is why i could have place now from this place talking about s is greater than 30 it was printed first then for the nested block we have what uh, s is less than 100 so s is greater than 30 then when we did the the uh the nested block we're able to get the same uh, uh the s is less than 100 was also printed so this is what we'll talk about the nested if statement so this is it on this lesson on if uh, the python uh, if statement so we'll, this is the end of this lesson so we'll, the, uh, we'll move over to the next lesson okay so in the last lesson we talked about if statements uh so in this lesson we'll be quickly looking at uh the python loops loops how to work with loops in python so first we'll be dealing with the while loops while loop dot pi right now what are loops loops or a loop a loop or loop let's just say loop is the repetition 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 of the execution execution of a block of code so long a particular expression or condition evaluates evaluates to true all right so in this case we're looking at the while loop in a while loop what you do basic most of the time you have to for example i want to give an example of your art to work with a while loop now so you come over here and say x for example say s is equal to zero initialize to zero and you can come over and use the while loop say while x is less than s while s is less than or equal to let's say less than five print x then you now increment it 
So incrementing it s plus one. All right, so let's run this block of code first before we go further. So we open our terminal as usual. Then we run the uh, code while the file is while underscore while underscore loop. That's the name of the file we want to run. So it gives it now, it starts the iteration from zero. So first it prints zero. Then it checks if zero is less than five, which it is. It prints zero, then goes again. Uh, add one to the zero, it becomes one. It will not check is one less than five, it prints it. So it goes on and on and on until the truth value is uh, exhausted. All right. Now, so that's how to work with a loop. Then if you want uh, the loop to start from the addition, from the increment first, what you do, you can bring this down, bring this to this place now, and uh, we can run it again. Okay, we already have our terminal on. Yeah, so I just paste that. Okay, let me just type it. So pi uh, while underscore loop dot pi. All right, so you see it starts from one because why the the uh, initial value was is first incremented before the loop begins all right so quickly uh before as we round up this lesson because i want this to be as brief as possible we want to talk about what we we'll call uh okay let's see also how to uh, do a looping from a descending order so looping from descending or in descent looping in descending order okay so i could say you also in, in looping in descending order most of the time it's better you you initialize with a bigger value then you can say while uh, y is greater than one for instance say print y then after that, you can now let's just decrement. Then you decrement y, which is the same way. Another way of doing that is y minus one. So let's run the code now. So it's automatically saved by VS Code. So we come over here. So pi while underscore loop dot pi. All right. So we got the seat there. So the first, this, uh, the first, okay, let's just try to put some space so that we understand better. I put a new line here. Okay, uh, bar slash n. So I will execute the code again for better understanding. So print, uh, so pi, pi, uh, while underscore loop dot pi. So we see that the first one ended by with five the second one started with ten and as we can see you see that it is going now but now let's clear so that we can get a better understanding so coming back here now we see that we started it off from uh by putting it this way so if i actually wanted to begin with one what we're supposed to do now is to take this and bring it under okay let's bring it this under now so let's print again let's run it the code again so while underscore loop dot pi so you see now it begins from nine down to one so basically that is for that how you do a descending order uh, uh, you know you loop in a descending order all right then we we'll talk about finally as we uh, as i round up this lesson we'll talk about the infinite loop infinite loop now basically if a, a, there are so many uh, evaluations that can be uh, be true forever so you you create an infinite loop with you have a testing condition that remains true forever and so once such conditions occur the loop continues indefinitely okay then uh in uh, another lesson we'll talk about the break statement and the continuous statement i will show you how to be able to break out how to be able to break out of such loop or how to be able to control such loops there are several ways of also actually coming out of such loop. We'll look at it in another lesson. After uh, after the next lesson, the other lesson, we'll talk about 
uh, the break and the continue statement. So let's see how we can create uh, an infinite loop. Now, one of the easiest way to create an infinite loop is just simply to type while to type the word the key uh, the true boolean, and then you print and just print. So whatever we print here, we we just keep on running because true will remain true. So let's run the terminal now. Run the code now on the terminal. So pi y underscore loop dot pi. You see, yes, keeps on printing and printing and printing and printing. It goes on and on and on and on and on and on till we kill it. All right. So that's it. This is it for uh, the basic uh, understanding of the Python while loop. So in the next lesson, we'll talk about a for loop. Before we talk about uh, how to break, how to control a loop, or how to break out of a loop, or manage loops in Python. So now this is the end of this lesson. So over to the next lesson right now. So in our last lesson, we talked about uh, a Python while loop. In this lesson, now we're looking at another kind of loop in Python, which is a for loop. Right, for loop dot pi. Okay. Now the Python uh, for loop is unlike uh, the for loop, the usual for loop uh, syntax in other uh, languages such as uh, uh, Java and uh, PHP. Uh, rather, in Python, we ha uh, Python provides what we call the for in loop, which is similar to for each the for each loop in other languages. Okay, it's similar to the for each loop in other uh, programming languages programming languages the similar similar to for each loop in other programming languages such as a php and java then what is his function the for loop, the Python for loop, Python for loop is mainly used for iterating through a sequence, a sequence, sequence such as list tuple, dictionary, a set, or even uh, a string as we saw in the string lesson. All right. So, for instance, if you have a list, a list of names, names, create a list for it. List, say John. Here we have do we and uh, here we have hockey, for instance. Now we can run and loop through it this way. Say for let's say for x in names print x. Okay, now let's run that or go further. So uh, we have to run it on the terminal. Yep, uh, that is the VS Code terminal as usual. For loop, that is the name of the file. Why? So yeah, it brings out everything there. All right. So going further here, yeah. and now. Suppose there's another way now, another approach of running the code using index. So looping for loop with index. Okay, so for this, I'm going to use fruits as an example, a list of fruits. And let's say orange, orange. And uh, mango and 
finally banana string right then you can go now let's use the uh, the index approach for this we say for y in range Land, you count the length of fruits. Okay, was it? They print fruits and then using the y as the index. So this will also help us to print it out. Okay, we had a terminal there. I didn't look well. All right, so print five four loop dot pi. We see it loop there. It prints out the or uh, the fruit the fruit set uh, list. Okay, just like it did for the names list. So first of all, for clarification, let just put a new line here. So this. For it to be clearer, so I'm going to come over here and copy this, just paste it, and this. So you see, this is for the second loop. So those are the two ways you can use for looping. Then again, there's what we call the range, the range function. So if you want to loop, I'm talking about the range. Okay, we've already used it there for that other place, but let's see how we work with it most of the time. So you could just want to loop. If I say for, let's say I in range so this range so let's say in range seven this one will count from zero down to six zero down to this not up to seven so let's say print i for us here sorry print i all right so i'm going to save this so let's put some uh, I just print an empty space there for there to be space so let's run it again and see what it brings okay so here we run it so for underscore loop dot pi this gives us this we see it from the range function is able to to bring that then you can also go further for the range and give it a beginning and a, a starting and a ending a starting and a ending value for h in range two then to this let's see what comes out of this the print h now let's put a uh, piece between this and that one. Come over here, print that so that it's for us for better understanding. Come over here right now, and uh, okay. So pi four underscore loop dot pi. So you see now it brings it from two. Three, four, five. That is between the video. So where you want to start the range from was specified. So it's from two to six. So that's that. So six is not uh, inclusive. So having looked at uh, range, having looked at range. So the next one I want to quickly look at before rounding up this lesson is the what is called nested loop. Nested loop right uh, so in this context we're talking about uh, i want to just give you an example with a nested for loop in python you can also have nested while loop whatever in this lesson let's just conclude this particular lesson talking about a nested for loop so for instance you, to have a nested you can have for s in uh in range one to five it will be called the outer loop then you can have an inner loop inside here say for t in range one to six 
all right then let's just print the a, the pairing of the both of them the outer and the, uh, uh, the inner so yeah come over here add some space of an empty string then the t which is the, the index of the inner loop all right so this then let's add a 90 uh, space so we'll be able to see it clearly so before then for it to be clearer uh, to uh, differentiate it from the upper uh, values i'm now also going to print an empty value there then come here and print and say a nested for loop so i'm going to come over right, right now so come over here now and uh, run so pi for underscore loop dot pi so you see now uh the nested loop started from here see it's combining the outer values with the inner the outer and the inner again outer and the inner so that is that so basically this is what how you work with the python for loop so this brings us to the end of this lesson on the python for loop so now we'll move over to the next lesson right now okay so we have understood the python while loop and also the for loop so in this lesson we want to quickly learn uh talk about how to control loops so i'm going to say loop controls I'm going to create a file loop controls dot pi now basically in python to control loops you have three statements for the controlling of a loop we have the break statement we have the continue statement and the pass statement now we want to first of all see how to control a loop using the break statement so we'll come over here so for instance you have a we we'll have a loop here uh we're going to say v we're going to say v let's initialize v to one then we'll, we'll call a loop while v is less than 10 all right print v okay this is normal all right then we need to do the number incrementing so we increment by one all right then let's run it vs code has helped us to auto save so run open the terminal so pi uh, loop controls controls dot pi so you see it prints from one down to nine as usually now suppose we want to break out of this loop once the value of v gets equals to five we can use uh, the break statement this way because if uh if v is equal to five break okay now let's run it now this will give you a good understanding of it so let's copy this to save our time so all right so let's just go ahead and run right now so let's go so you see now it breaks off the loop breaks off at the point where uh the value of uh the value of v became five so quickly let's see the next control statement which is the con the continue statement but before then let's print uh some space here okay so then i also come over here and say print continue so let's say continue statement so that it will be clear as at the point of running it continue statement all right so let's clear here for it to be better off so how do we use the clear uh, the continuous statement? so let's use i'm going to use the example of the uh, nested uh, for loop that we did in the other lesson so for uh, s in range let's say in range one to four and also so we we'll come in with a nested loop so for d in range one to five okay then we now bring in the continuous statement we can just say uh, if the value of s becomes equal to the value of t in any of the loop in the outer and the inner loop then the 
the continue statement she will come in and the continue what it just does is to help us keep the execution of a particular line of code and continue in the other line we'll see the output by the time we see the output we we'll get a better understanding of that all right so continue and we say print uh print s then put in the value because we want to pay it up uh then yeah also put t all right then when we are done with that want to also have some space so just print uh some space so that the value could be all right so now let's quickly run the code now so with this we go ahead and run so you see let's just let me give you a little explanation so at this first it's a continuous statement you see it's supposed to be one one so once uh, one uh, the one one pair could not come in because at that point one uh, the value of s and t were the same so it skips it and continue from one and two then going further two and one so they will now after they were able to have two two but two two that is the outer and the inner that is s and t were equal so it was skipped then going further again three and one three and two three and three was skipped because as at that point the value of s and t were equal so what we use it, the continuous statement is saying that once the value of s and t are equal it should be skipped and we move move to the next uh line of code okay so that's how basically the how the continuous statement works helps you to uh, you know once a particular condition is met that particular, you can use it to skip the execution of a particular uh, part of a code in in a loop and continue from the other one right that's how it works then quickly uh, the past statement although i've talked about it before now the Python programming language does not allow you to create a loop without executing a code out of it. So for example, now I can say uh, w equal to zero, and uh, then come over here, yes, or let's just use a for loop to make it easier. Say for uh, g in range, let's say range four. Now this is a loop, range four, then now you are expected to execute a code here. If not, there will be an error thrown here. So I can just say pass in case I don't want to, because I don't want to execute any uh, code here. I just say, I just call the pass statement and that will take care of it. It will not throw any error. But if you didn't put the pass statement here, you must have to execute a code there, else there will be an error. So you, most of the time, in a loop and an if statement, you use the pass statement to escape errors. All right? So that is majorly... These are the major ways through which you can use to control a loop. To control a loop, whether a while loop or a for loop, as you can see in the example, you can either use a break statement, you can use a continue, you can also use a pass. All right, so that's it on this particular lesson. Okay, let me just run it again to just see. You see it has passed. It will, nothing was uh, executed and there was no error. So this is the end of this lesson on loop control in Python, Python loop control. So having covered the different uh, loops in Python, we talked about the for loop, we talked about the while loop and how to control it. So in this particular lesson, we'll start talking about covering the Python uh, collection data types, talking about uh, or the sequence data type. Or in this particular lesson, we'll be kicking off with the Python list. Now we've talked about in the data type, we talked about uh, that the Python uh, uh, programming language for apps provides for uh, Four sequences, four sequence data types, namely list, tuple, dictionary, and set. We'll be covering all of them. Uh, for the now, in this lesson, we'll be looking at uh, talking about the list. List. Now, a list is used for holding a variable, like every other uh, other uh, collection data type we're talking about. They are used, mainly used for holding a variable in a variable, uh, holding a variable, a collection of data in a variable. All right. They are used for holding collections of data in a variable. So right now, for instance, I could write my list. Now with this, so a list is actually held in a square bracket and it has some properties which we need to understand in this particular lesson, right? And it has a lot of methods with which you use to manipulate it. Now a Python list, now this one now, what we already have here is already a list, even as empty as it is, but I want to quickly go ahead and uh, populate it with data. Now, a list can have different data types. You can have an integer, you can have a string, it can contain uh, both uh, boolean, it can contain a float inside. So different data type can be inside of it. And of course, then again, a list 
can contain duplicate value. We already have one. I can say add one again. I can say add true again. So it can contain duplicate values. All right. So those are very important. You take note of them. So we can just quickly print it out. Print my list. My list. So let's run this now quickly. From uh, let me launch the terminal now. Uh, so Python. Python underscore list dot pi so you see it displays them all so quickly now how do you assess the individual values in a list assessing list values the values in the list how do you assess them to assess them what you just do is to use the index you can assess them list value can be assessed using their index value so my list and uh, you come over here let's say we want to assess john for instance i will call, i'll take the index one because the index of any array in our programming language start with zero so we have zero one two three four five all right so quickly let's print it so to print out john i'm assessing from index one so i'm just going to copy this quickly now to save our time and paste here so we run so it gives us john all right now again now, the next one to talk about, now if you want to know the length of a list, a, uh, it's a, a very special Python function known as len. So the len function can help us to know the length of a particular list. So my list here, I want to count the number of items that I need. So you come over here and uh, I paste this here. So you see, count see there are six in total. Total items, six. One, two, three, four, one, zero. One okay, but let's just count the item now, not in terms of index now. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so the length function very important. Just take note of it. Then we said the list, the Python list is very mutable, it's very mutable, it can be manipulated easily. All right, so you can add to a list, you can remove the uh, value from a list, you can uh add you can uh, edit that is updated so want to see how to do all that so first of all talking about that is a uh, manipulating uh a python a python list so here yeah, i want to come here uh, next i want to add to the list I already have there a value to it i can simply come over here and say my list dot append my list dot append Want to add value to that let me just add my name a maker here all right then when i print the list again print print uh my list so print it all over again so so you see a maker has been added now i can actually change values too so for instance i may want to change uh john to do we so my list my list uh i'll use the index to change it it's index one so the john occupies index one so i can change it to do we there by writing this to do we so let me run this again now okay let me print it right now so that we can see it a new uh, value that i've changed so print uh, my list okay so i'm printing it all over again now so run so you see now we have do we so john has turned to do we all right now another thing then if you want to do deleting now you can delete actually the entire list by your calling on the deal statement and call my list this will take off the entire list but i don't want to run it uh so i want to leave it that so you can use that to delete the entire list but i want to remove a, a partial, if i want to if you want to remove particular element maybe the last element that entered you can use the pop method or you can if you're using the pop you can use the index to delete by color one but let's say we want to remove the last uh, value that entered you can just easily say pop and that will do it with this uh, let's print the list again it will delete the last element in the list so print my list right now so my list let's run the code again so after popping you see the last value a maker has been taken off okay then if you want to remove a particular value by the name let's say you want to remove it uh instead of using the pop 
you can come over here now let's say uh um, my list dot remove you can remove by calling a particular element uh, the, by the exact name of the element let's say do we and uh, we can just reprint it all over again come over here they print uh print my list again so let's print it i won't call the uh, remove so you see do we has gone out of the list now finally as a round off this topic we should also understand that a list is each treble you can loop in so there's a looping through a list so how do you to loop it's very easy to loop we already talked about the for loop you can use the for loop this way so for i in my list okay we've already seen it but let's just see it again while we're talking about list here to loop through it or iterate through a, loop, a list so you print i so let's run the code now here so you see it loops through the entire list so basically this is uh the essentials you need to know about the python list there are still other things to pass about the python list then uh, there are other many methods the, the list uh, uh, the python list has a lot of methods that you can download them you can just go to google google python list and uh, the python list methods and go through them but this gives you an essential this lesson with what we just learned here you got an essential knowledge of the python list especially that the fact that it can contain different data type and it is mutable it can contain different uh, it can contain uh, duplicate data and you've seen how to manipulate it so in the next lesson we're talking about an immutable data type known as topo so in, for the now this is the end of this lesson so right now let's move over to the next lesson right now so in this lesson we're looking at the python dictionary i'm going to name it five python underscore dict dot five for this lesson now a python dictionary is a key a python a python dictionary is used for storing data in a variable in okay as key value pairs all right okay so for example now i can have this my dict my dict equal to and they are the the values are stored as in they are delimited with curly bracket i put inside the curly bracket also like that what we have there is already a dictionary it's an empty dictionary now let can, can go ahead and have dictionary with uh value so that's my dict one now another variable okay so i'll create a dictionary now it can contain it will use uh okay for example now name we want let's say we want to collect some user credential name uh, let's say john i've always been using john in my example so let's continue with that then let's say age 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 yeah. age the value can actually be a top it could be a list it could be a, an integer so here we have an integer here 45 and then we can also have uh, it can contain different data type uh, like uh, let's say mar uh, mar let's say marita 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 the mar let's say married that we can use a boolean here false or no so let's say true okay now uh we can print it out let's just print it out before we go to the other things parts about uh, python uh, dictionary so my dict let's print out my dict one so i'm going to open a terminal so pi Python that's called dict dot pi. So you see it prints out the dictionary. Then another thing, then the next we need to find out, uh, we must understand about dictionary is that the, 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 the Python dictionary does not 
does not allow duplicates. Duplicate values are not allowed. Now for that, let me show you that. I'm gonna say my dict, my dict two, create another vari uh, variable here. My dict two, this time around, let's call it, use first name, first name as P here, first name. And for this example, first name, John, John. Second name, let's say last name, last name, last name, the do we, okay, and Beth, the Beth, Beth, yeah. Now we're trying to we're going to try to duplicate birth year value year. So birth year, let's say nineteen ninety. The second one, we're going to add another one again here. Another birth year as the key again. Birth year. So this time around, I'm going to say nineteen ninety nine. Okay. So when you see now we're having double value here. Okay, so let's try to break this up okay, for more readability. So we'll come over here now and uh, we'll print. Uh, let's print it out. My dict, dict 2, let's print it out. Okay, so that is coming in. Okay, let's run my dict. So you see. It's the, the you see we are having the my bet the bet year now. This is the, the particular thing I want us to focus on. You see, bet year the first one was 1990, the second was 1999. Now, because a dictionary does not have a, a set duplicate value, this last one overwrote this one. The first one has been the first bet year, which is 1990, have been overwritten. So, only one value was taken, which was the last one, bet year 1999. Then, quickly, we must also understand also. Let's quickly see how to loop through. A dictionary looping through a dictionary. Now, if you want to loop through a dictionary and you want to just get only the key by default, if you loop through a dictionary the default way, what it's going to give you is only the key value. So, for example, for S and my dict2, all right, print x, print x. Okay, this will give us. All the, all the values, all the keys. You see, it gives us first name, last name, and that. Now, suppose we want to, if we want to get only all the values out now, so to get the values, you come over here and say for y and my dict2, my dict2, you now put value, because we want to get the values, say values, use the values method, and you say print y. Okay, so now let's run print y so you see it brings out all the first one gives us the the uh, keys and the second one gives us the values so basically this is the major things you need to know essential information you need to know about uh, the python dictionary and of course it has a lot of methods which you should also check out online get uh, get online google python dictionary methods and you'll be able to get all of them so this is the end of this lesson on Python dictionary. We'll conclude the, this section with a Python set in the next lesson. So this is the end of this lesson. So over to the next lesson right now. So as we conclude this uh, section of uh, Python sequences or that data types that are used for collection, the last data type we want to talk about is what we call Python sets. Python sets dot pi. Okay. Now a set uh, is also used like others for storing data, but this time around uh, is for storing single. They are they, they are not in key uh, in key value uh, pairs like that of a dictionary, but they are also wrapped up in a curly brace. For example, you can come over here and can say they have a curly brace like a dictionary, but they don't they are not in they are not uh, arranged in a key value. 
Okay, so for example, I can take my sets and uh, come over here now and say uh, one. Uh, let's say hello. Okay. And uh, say five and false like this. Now, uh, let's print out now. This is a set. Well, first of all, let's check out the data type here. Okay, type my set. Let's see what Python tells us as a data type. Okay, it will just show you that this is different from a dictionary. So, Py, Python sets.py. Okay, so it's a set, right? So that is clear. So now let's print out my set now that we know the data type so print uh my set so let's print it out so i'm going to come over here right now and paste so you see it brings them out okay now the next thing we need to understand is that if a set does not accept duplicate value no Duplicates, let's say duplicates are not allowed in a set. Okay, so for example, let's say my set set two, my set two, and uh, come over here and put one, uh, John. Uh, three. Now let's try to duplicate one now. Or let's say, okay, yes, let's duplicate one. Let's see what comes out of it now. There's no comma here. We added a comma now. So let's run. As you can see, only one of the one, which is only one, was gotten. Okay. We. Okay, that is this, this for the first one rather. We've not printed the second one. Let's print it. So print I set sorry we, we overwrote it. Set two set so my set two. So let's run now. We got it now. So you have one three and john okay and that is because the first one was overwritten by the second one so as you can see uh they are unordered that's another thing you must understand about sets they are unordered they can appear in different uh, orders so that's for that so in this case the numbers came before the string the integer came before the string so basically, and as well, we can also iterate through it. So for I in my set to print I. Okay. That's for that. You run and you get it. Iterate through it. This is a lesson on sets. Now, a set. And it's immutable. Uh, you cannot actually change the set. Once I said it's created, but you can add or delete from the set. So that's another property of the set. Python has said that you need to take into cognizance. So this is the end of this lesson on the Python set. So with this, we are concluded all the Python collections uh, data types or the sequence data types. Data types that enable us to uh, raise of values with a, using a single variable. So now, over to the next lesson right now. Uh, so, having covered uh, the Python uh, collections, uh, the sequences, in this lesson, we'll be in the, or in this section, we'll be looking at Python functions. Okay, so functions, I'm going to put, uh, name this now. I'll create a file as usual. Python functions dot py. Okay. Now, uh, what are Python functions or what are functions? Now, functions are reusable piece or block 
of codes. That is the simple definition of it. Okay, let me type it again. Uh, all right, let me type it right now uh, so that you can uh, be able to see it. I said functions are reusable piece or block of codes. Now, for instance, now basically we have the Python inbuilt function. Python has an inbuilt function. There are inbuilt Python functions which I've been using. Most of them we've been using them already. Several of them. All right. Python has a several inbuilt functions. Then they can also have user defined functions. So there are functions already available which we've already been using the way the Python programming language provides for you, then the Python programming language also allows you to be able to define your own reusable code called functions. All right. Now, one of the examples of the code you'll be using often is the print statement, which helps us to print value to a, a screen, to the terminal. All right. Then, uh, we, also, we have also seen a lot of functions too, such as the, the learn function, uh, we are the, which we've been using for working on the on a list to count the values in a list for example uh, just to give us a little brief back if you have some, a list like this now uh, you can use a a len function say print len len root so this gives us the length of the fruit so let me run it quickly now on the terminal so pi pi Python, Python functions dot pi. Now let's run it. So you see, it gives you this. Uh, the first one is the hello. Then this len function helps us to. So the the print function helps us to print a value to this terminal to the screen. Then why the len function helps us to count the number of values. The number of items in a list or any other sequence such as a tuple and a dictionary and the rest of them all right then a whole lot of other functions a whole lot for example you can just say uh hello uh, here or let's say hi then you want to convert it to uh let's say to uh, upper you can just say an upper case and make it this way and uh, let's uh, run this now you see it converts a high to all capital letter then there are also another function to turn it everything there to lower case so you can go, come there and let's run we run it now you see it turns it to every of the high to small letter so a whole lot of inbuilt python has a lot of inbuilt uh, functions now then also the Python language allows us to be able to create our own function. So in working with function or in making your own user defined function, there are majorly two approaches, two procedures, two steps. Now the first step is to define the function, which is the almost the same thing in plain language we're talking about when you create it, creating the function, define a define the function. You first define a function, then the second step is what you call the function. To make use of this, the function, you call. Call the function function to make use of it. So you can call a function, a single function, over and over again. And that's what we call. Uh, why is why I would refer to function as a reusable piece of code. For example, now let's that's now to create if you define your own function in Python, you use the def keyword first. This is a syntax. Look at it clearly. We say def. For example, I want to a function called say hello just a, a simple function for the example now then you put a colon because the python language doesn't use curly brace in other programming language you, you defining a function like you have to open a uh, close curly brace for the python language uses a colon and also in uh in the indentation so for example now if i want to say say hello i can say print hello everyone hello everyone so this is already a function but this function will not work until it is called 
So I'm going to come over here now. Let's run the code now and see. So you see, hi. So say hello. For it to work, what you now do, the next second step is simply to call the function. So say hello. Say hello. So you can come over here. You see, it says hello. So what is the content of this function has now been printed at the point of call. Now, you can go ahead and even call this function several times. That is why we said it's a reusable piece of code. You can call it up to 10 times. This will still work. You can use it in different, uh, once you can include it in other files, you can use it. Although we'll talk about that, we'll talk about modules. So you can use this piece of code over and over again. And that's what we call uh, a function. So basically, so this is just the lesson on the Python function. So the function, we've seen that there are inbuilt functions, which we'll be using a whole lot of them that the Python language have provided. Then you also see how to create your own basic Python function. So in the next lesson, we're talking about, we're going deep, a little more, uh, more deeper in the Python function, talking about Python arguments and Python parameters and arguments. So, in the, so this is the end of this lesson on function, uh, the Python function. Then the next lesson, we'll, we'll build on it. We'll continue on the next, uh, on talking about what well, parameters and uh, Python function parameters and Python uh, uh, argument. So this is the end of this lesson. So over to the next lesson right now. So in the last lesson, we uh, had a, an introduction to Python functions, how to talk about the inbuilt functions and the user-defined function. In this lesson, we want to go into what to talk about function arguments. I'm not going to call it function args.py. All right. Now, in the last lesson, we defined a particular function saying, uh, say hello, for instance, say uh hello say hello we just prints out whatever value we give to it here uh print so we print here something like hello world hello world yeah in that particular lesson okay so uh, at the point of call it just prints whatever value we add now what suppose we want to actually now create the function such that whatever value we pass it we can be able to pass it value to be able to give us a return to give us an output we can do it this way put a, a value there that's in between the bracket of the function there and uh, we can now return it this way so that at the point of call we can be able to add it whatever we want to add so and i just call this now so say hello let's say say hello so it is right here so to save our time say hello and uh, we cannot put it let's say john john so at the point of call we cannot be adding any value we want so let's run it quickly and say pi Func uh, let's say function underscore args dot pi you see it gives us hello join so we can go ahead again can call this function again let's repeat it just come over here right now, Control C, and uh, we paste it. Okay, and let's uh, undo it. Okay, so where you come over to this place right now? See, instead of then we call it say hello again. Uh, we now put a uh, Betty. Say Betty. Betty. Okay, so let's run the code again. Just let's just copy this and paste. We see hello, Ben. So you can be adding whatever value you want to add here, and it will be bringing out the output. Okay, so now in this content, now this is now let me just use it now to explain the concept of argument. Now at this point of defining this function here, where we now add this placeholder a kind of variable is said to be a parameter this value that is in between this bracket which we are using to get input for outputting inside the function we, uh, we call it the parameter then at the point of usage of the function calling the function putting the value uh, uh, actual value to replace the, uh, the the parameter we call that the argument so that is just the difference between a, a parameter and argument so basically a parameter is added as at the point of definition of the function 
then the argument is putting in the real value in the place of the parameter at the point of call all right so that is the basic uh, difference between uh, the, the, uh, the uh, so the parameter and argument they are basically the same but it's just that the parameter is used at the point of definition why the argument is passed the real value that is won't pass at the point of call to replace in the place of the parameter all right then that said now you can understand we should understand that if you can actually define a function to have more than one parameter define it as function say so you can say uh, custom custom uh custom funk custom funk custom funk all right and say uh name name uh age address so here we have a function with um three arguments three parameters now we can print this let's just make it as simple as possible name age and address okay so you will just print it out so at the point of call you have to once you define a, a, a function and you pass it a certain number of argument or parameter at the point of call you must ensure that you also pass the same size number of argument at the point of call let's say here we say joe and uh, the age we have another parameter called uh, age which is 45 let's just leave it that way now let's have let's not add the last parameter uh, argument for the last parameter and let's see what will happen you see it throws error for the the last positioner parameter was not argument was not passed in so which is supposed to be an address let's say usa for just to make it fast so by the time we'll come over here now again and run you see it works very well now so this is just to tell you that at the point of definition of uh, function the or calling a function the number of argument you pass must correspond with the number of parameter with which that particular function is defined with so now from there we also want to talk about what to call uh keyword arg argument so at the point of calling the uh this function here instead of just putting in the name directly we can also call it this way using the keywords that is the name of the parameter so for example we can come here and say name uh, joy let's say that is the name then after joy age uh joy so then the name now is age the place of age you say 30 uh, 30 which time around uh it should be a number that is an integer then our address should be equal to uh let's say london okay so you see this that can also work and that is sort to be what this one do not refer to as keyword argument now uh, briefly we want to also go now going further suppose you don't want to be able to you don't really want to specify the the exact number you don't know the exact number of uh, uh, a parameter or argument you want to pass at the point of calling of the function you don't want to specify it at the point of call, uh, creating the function you can use what we call arbitrary argument so i'm going to say my funk my funk so here to use arbitrary arguments you just put that asterisk sign and arc then you can put the r can be anything you can call it kids you can call it s or whatever you want to call it all right so let's just call it arc for the now so just to make it uh, easy for this particular example okay so at the point of call so you can just say print uh arc which is the name of the arbitrary argument then the value that should be returned should be a top let's say the one in position one or position let's just make it position one or it could be position two okay so we're going to go over there now so at the point of call if this function can receive a tuple a tuple can be passed to it so the first one let's say we just make it a number and the second one in position two we just make it uh h then in position three uh we'll let's just make a pick a uh, journey so at the point this now becomes a tuple so tuple can be passed you can pass any number of value in this place 
as a tuple. So at the point of calling it, whatever you specify there to be returned in the function is what will be returned. So at this one, is a, we said the ax that should be returned to us. The only thing we want to print out is the value in the tuple that is in position two. So we have here zero, one, two. So journey will be returned to us. So let's run it. Okay. So let's run. So you see it gives us journey because it's in position two of the of the uh, topo. Then finally, as was round up this particular topic on a, a function argument, we want to also talk about the concept of returning. Let's say uh, define a function here, say uh, add up, add up, okay? Uh, we want it to take a value such as uh, x for adding, uh, adding up, or let's say uh, we want it to take two values, two values, uh, let's say, uh, a and b for addition add up okay so we just use a return keyword you can use a return keyword this way say a plus b and that will be it so at the point of calling now we cannot call this way and uh, when we say my i can just say my addition use a variable to hold it now my addition equal to add up then you pass in the parameter here, A, let's say 5, then 7, okay, then you can print out, print uh, my addition, my addition now will be printed out, so open the terminal right now, and uh, you say, okay, let's just paste that, you see it gives us 12, so this is uh, basically how you work with the return, statement so this is basically the uh, what uh, arguments are all about when you begin to work with a function and you also want to pass an argument then another final thing before we write i quickly write up that just came to me now is that you can also uh, at the point of defining a function have what we call default value i can just say let me call it my default okay uh, so if you have a default value there will be no need to call it so let's just still use the same thing Let's say f name, okay. The l name, for instance, equal to uh, do we. So at the point of calling of this function, we will not need to. So let's just print it. Uh, you'll see with example, say uh, first name, the f name, okay. Then last name, l name, rather, okay. So when I want to make use of this function now, at the point of call, it will no longer, the, the second argument, this already has a uh, a parameter, so let's come over here, my default, and the first one does not have a value, so I'm going to just say, uh, do we, or let's say, a maker, okay, or sorry, uh, let's put John, John, then because, this function already has a default value. The L name already have a default value, and they are, even though they have two parameters, if I don't pass, I, I may not. I, I can decide not to pass the value for L name because it already has a, uh, a default value, and it will definitely work. So let's come over here now and run it. So you see, it says John do we. That is because there was already a default. The, the parameter had a default value, so there, you can as well skip adding the the value for the argument for the parameter at the point of call. So this is only when you can be able to skip putting in the exact number of, param uh, of argument at the point of, that correspond with the parameter at the point of function call. So I believe this is, makes this uh, topic very clear enough. So this is it on function arguments. So in the next lesson, we're looking into uh, modules, modules over to the next lesson this is the end of this lesson now so over to the next lesson right here so i haven't looked at uh, functions so the next thing we want to look at so in this lesson we want to look into what we call python modules or modules python let's just say python modules by uh, modules now simply defined uh, modules is another name for modules in python uh, another name or oh, it's it's another name 
another name for what is generally referred to as library okay that is a, sim a collection of which is a collection of variable a library is a collection of variables classes functions and the rest okay so for instance how does it work let's just create a new file here yeah? uh, let's just say hi let's say hi modu hi modu you can call it anything one it should end with a dot pi file okay so let's just say in this place we we'll have a variable called greeting okay the greeting will just be very simple hello a variable here yeah? and let's just create another a define a function here say hi all right say hi and uh, we can be able to pass it a name ver a name parameter there and uh, what it just does is to print hi making it as simple as possible hi name all right so this becomes a model so this model here this file here with a function a, a variable and a function we can make use of it here in this particular uh, page here as a model and to use it all we just need to do is to import the model so we import using the import statement import we import high model okay so this will make all the variable the variable and the function that is inside the high model file to be available for use here so in this place we can just simply say let's i want to make use of the greetings variable that is inside the high model i say hi model dot greeting so this one will help us to print out that value for that so let's run it python modus so pi and python modus modus dot pi okay so you see prints hello which is the value of this variable here so we cannot the same way we can also make use of call the other function here if i say hi modo or say hi and that's it it's going to help us so with that we'll be able to get the value of okay now there's an error because this actually takes an argument so let's say john so let's run it again you see you say hi john so the variables the variable and the function that is inside the i model was we're able to make use of it here now another quick way okay, again we need to understand is that you can also import import a model using uh, alias so you can say i model as high for instance let's use the high as a alias so high become the alias in the place of high model you can be using high all throughout the code so and it will still work very well so let's come over here now and run this code again you see everything works very well as well then if you also decide you can also decide that instead of uh, importing everything this way using it this way you can import it individually this way again now by saying i from like i can do the importation this way again say from high modu import you can import the individual thing you needed for example you want to import the that variable greeting then want also uh, import from high modu from high modu import say hi all right say hi will not be available so there will be no need for us to use that alias again because we have imported them directly so at this juncture when we run this code again it will also work so that is it these are the major different ways you can be able to work with uh, models now before we go further we need to talk about the inbuilt before end as well end the lesson let's talk about the inbuilt uh, python models so because it's very important so i'm going to create another one let's just call it in build modules so python has a lot of inbuilt modules so let's just open another file here the inbuilt modules here we want to see that the python already has some inbuilt libraries uh, there are some you can even if you are not available here you can also uh, uh, you know put them to add them to your project you can install them in your project and make use of them but for them let's just make use of the inbuilt one for example we can just say import time okay so once we've gotten time time is an, one of the inbuilt module so for example then to make use of the time you can just simply say okay print hello this is an inbuilt module python inbuilt module so hello 
uh, okay print hello uh, or just say print weight that should be a better way print weight okay before then let's see some of the things how to know what is contained in a particular model the functions and the things that are available now for example you can just use the direct function dir function then say time okay let's see what is inside of it so that's how you check out for the uh, the contents of a model using the dir uh, function there so then you can say uh, let's call the name now this inbuilt pi inbuilt let's run it inbuilt modus inbuilt modus dot pi okay so we are supposed to be able to see everything that is inside here now so let's uh, print it inbuilt modus okay and uh, let's run there now so you see this shows us all the things all the uh, contents of the particular model we are using so you use the direct function and print it out okay so inside this particular place there's a particular uh, value we're looking for which is the sleep i want to let's see how we can make use of the sleep now so we have already understood this i'm going to com uh, uh, comment at that place so let's say print uh please wait for five seconds or five seconds so i'm going to come here and print something else so I'm going to say time dot sleep. Time dot sleep. Let me just put five seconds. After waiting for five seconds, I will print out something else. Just giving you an example of how to work with. Uh, okay, so hello. I am done waiting. Okay, just giving you using this the time module as an example of an input module. So let's just clear here for this example to be clearer so let's go now let's run the particular code now in build. so you see it's with helping us to wait sleeping for five seconds then when it's done you see it prints out hello i am done waiting so this is the end of this lesson on the python modules all right so this this end of end this end of this session and so we'll now move over to the next lesson so now over to the next lesson right now okay so in this lesson we're looking at object oriented programming in python talking about classes and objects so i'm going to call this file now just classes okay so simply what is a class a class is simply defined a class is defined as a blue as a blueprint for creating an object now for instance if you want to build a house for instance you don't just go and start building the house you need to have a kind of uh, architectural design in the paper which the the construct the person that builds the house the the building constructor can be using to build the house on the site all right so is that the same thing similar thing here okay then to create a class in which is a blueprint for creating the object we just go with the keyword class then you call the name of the class let's call it class then if you don't want to pass for the now, if you don't want to pass anything into the class yet, you can just use the pass keyword and does that. Okay, now, a class is also made up of members, such as you can have uh, a, uh, a class property, which is a variable inside the class context. Any variable defined in a class, you will refer to it as a property. Okay, then a, variable, a class also contains what we call constructor class constructor which is a special method that you use for creating a uh, object from a class and at the point of instantiating or creating object the the constructor is automatically called all right so let's go that for that so let's say class constructor constructor so in this place to get the class control you define it with the dev keyword like you do normal uh, method or functions so you call it is the, the special constructor is said to be in it okay so let's just say we want to just create a constructor we don't want to pass anything to the constructor just for the sake of example this is called a constructor we use a pass keyword here just to keep it empty 
Then in a class too, you can also have your own user-defined method here, or like function. Now, a function inside the class context is referred to a method. So let's say for here, in this place now, I'm going to say def, uh, def, and uh, my func, let's just say my func, which is a method here in this class context. Then if a method, you have to pass it a, a first parameter called self. The self can be any word, you can even call s, but it should be the first parameter. Okay, let's just leave it there. Then you can add other things there. Uh, let's say my func, then name, okay, another parameter. All right, we've already seen how to work with parameters. Then here we can now print. All right, uh, let's say print self, like referring to the current object of the class, self dot y. Okay, then also print a name. Uh, then we have to, in this case now, to be able to get the name parameter, we have to put it inside the constructor, pass it to the constructor. So here we we'll say name, and we we'll have to set the name parameter here uh, at this particular place. So self dot name self dot let's so let's put a okay. Let's leave it at that. So let's just leave the constructor at that juncture. But they, you could also be able to set some values here. But let's leave it at this to make the example as simple as possible. All right. Um, so pass. Let's leave the constructor this way. Okay. Now we'll just print the uh, the five and the name. Okay. But I think it's better we just be able to multiply with something. Let's say uh, uh, value. Let's just call it value. All right. Then here, the self multiplied by self y multiplied by the, the value parameter, okay, which will be passed at the point of uh, calling the instantiation. So with what we have here, this is already a class, which is a blueprint for creating object. So from the class, we can naturally be able to create objects. So let's create an object from the class. So simply put a, an object of a class, an object of a class is an instance of a class. All right. For instance, so now to create an object from the uh, the car class, you can just say my car, or let's just say BMW, or let or whatever my car. Just put it this way. All right. It's equal to uh, you call the name of the class cars like this and that's that you got a car uh, object then we can now use the car to reference a value that that is my car dot uh, my funk and this place now will just pass the value for uh, value which is just make it six so let's run this code now so now without creating an object of the class, the, this code cannot run. So let's just put it. So pi uh, classes dot pi. And here we have what? 60. So what happened is this my func that is being, this my func function is, or the method is what is now being used here, being referenced here. All right. Then finally, then if you want to also reference the y directly, that is the, a property of the class here directly y you can come along here and just say my my car dot y okay which is a property so if we now come over here and run this code now and uh, okay we didn't print it out so we needed to print out this for it to show up so my car dot y so we're using the object now to make reference to the members of the class. So you see it, the y value there is 10. So you see the, with the object, at the point of creating your object, the constructor is, which is here, is automatically called and is used for referencing the members of the class using what we call the dot notation. So at this, so this particular place, at this basic uh, explanation of a class, this is said to be the class, which is the blueprint for creating the object. Then, 
this particular point here where my where we assigned my car variable to car is all we have created the object so the my the cars object here my car object which is the variable holding this one is now used to reference to the members of the class to bring the members of the class to life much like if you have gotten a, you drew uh, a house plan on a paper now you need to go to the place to build it when building it you now be able to bring all those places that have been designed all the designs that are inside the uh, the the uh, the architectural work into life so the the class the the object here the, at this point of instance is what uh, is where we actually bring the the member the contents of the class to life to practical reality so this is just a basic uh, understanding basic introduction to the concept of class and objects in the python programming language so okay so in the next lesson i will also look at a very important uh, concept of object oriented programming which is talking about inheritance so this is the end of this lesson on python classes and objects so we'll see now to define a class in python and also how to be able to create an object from the class and use the object to reference the members of the class namely the the properties or the the methods and we'll also see now to write a, a class constructor so now over to the next lesson on uh, class inheritance okay so we have looked at the classes we got an introduction to the concept of class in the last lesson so in this lesson we want to look at, go a little further in, on concerning classes talking about class inheritance class inheritance a very important concept in object oriented programming all right now uh, we're going to also use a car example now we could have a class car in this place in this context now we're going to have a class car all right so here's a car class car then the all cars i think they should have a model so let's say model uh or let's say the car name uh, car name first name so we're going to get a, a property name which should be a string initialized to an empty string then cars will have colors okay, so let's say color the color of the car all right then we can talk about the make of the car uh make and uh, that should be enough for this example now so the make of the car then let's say the brand rather instead of saying name make uh let's say brand all right now we create a constructor here like we said this car will have a, a constructor to so def the, the special method called init which is used as the constructor so we pass itself now let's say in this particular concept now okay for the now we're going to just look for only the brand and make now so that we can be able to use it make for another uh, example all right so i'm going to say yeah, brand so we'll look for brand as a parameter in the constructor then we assign it to the the brand that is already there so self dot brand is equal to the brand parameter here all right then we also initialize the brand again here inside the constructor the self dot color so then equal to uh color that whatever color that is passed there at the point of instantiation all right now we can now say okay uh, once this is done let's all create another method here uh, apart from the constructor the another method the method will just have to uh, print let's say print car detail car detail print car or let's just say car detail that should be better off car or let's say car uh, details that should be clear enough all right then we pass it self and that's all uh, which is referring to the current object so now what we want to return here is just to say print we just print for us self uh the brand of the car that is put there we'll bring it out for us and uh, the color too uh let's say uh, self dot color the color will be written reprinted out all right so i'm going to just make it a little better uh, uh this is this is 
to make the thing more uh, uh, interesting so you say this is a what they call that brand of the car and a color let's say and the color is that okay so we'll print that out so now let's in let's create an object from this let's instantiate it so from here you can come over here and say my car my car let's just run it first so that we can get a better understanding so here at the point of instantiation we just call car so with car we can be able to uh, reference let's say print okay, let's say uh my car dot car details so i'm going to come over here car details and i'll pass it the parameter sorry at the point of uh, calling the way out parameter so let's just say a bmw bm uh, that is the name of the car bmw the brand and there yeah, the color should be let's say white bmw all right so at the point so we now reference it so let's run this code now we'll run it right now so pi pi classes underscore inheritance dot pi then uh we run it okay uh it seems it was wrongly spelt so it's class okay it's actually class dot pi not classes so let's just clear it so pi class underscore inher returns the name of the file was not properly done so you see this is a bmw and the color is white now i want to bring in now from here i want to talk about the concept of inheritance now after this now we can create another class which inherits from the car class two classes all right so for example i can create another class here a class called benz benz to inherit from cars it's a kind of car so if you take all the properties of all the member properties of the car so if i do this now I say pass for instance so that there will be no error then we can create another brand of car from here car another car class let's say uh vmw now although we, we were able to have an instance of vmw there but let's put it here now uh, let's say uh a class another class again here uh vmw this one is a class so you're going to inherit from a car class now to do inheritance of a class is simple now you need to understand some uh, a particular term concerning a class now okay let me just take this example before we talk about the the base class and the parent uh, the parent and the child class okay if i explain that concept so now let's just do an instance of the the, B, the bands for example they let my bands my bands which is inheriting from uh the car class so i'm going to use at uh, the instance of the car i can use the, the constructor of the car class now so car all right and uh pass the parameter there uh b uh, two b benz let's say benz 190 all right that's the name of the, the the kind of the brand of benz then uh, color let's say black all right now let's uh, run it so my bands and have my bands which is this object to reference car detail you see now it's uh, it can be able to assess car details so let's run again now and uh, pi plus inheritance dot pi you see it's still able to we are able to use the the Benz class to be able to assess the the car constructor because why the Benz and BMW now they have become the child they are they have inherited the car class and inheritance in Python is very easy all you just need to do is just to pass the parent construct uh, the parent class into the uh, uh, into the uh, class here yeah, at the point of uh, instantiation as at the point of declaration as a kind of argument all right so now let us understand the concept of a parent or base class and child class now this class car which benz and bmw inherit from as is said to be the base or the parent class 
to a parent class will just be any class at all you use normal uh, class definition and normal thing then the class that is inheriting as uh, uh, extending the functionality of the other class which is now passing the the parent class inside it uh, inside the uh, is a uh, parenthesis as a, a kind of a parameter is said to be the child class so in this concept now the car class is the is the parent of both the Benz and the BMW so the Benz class is the child of car and the uh, the BMW class is also a child of uh, the car class so the child uh, the car class has two children uh, ch uh, two children now Benz and uh, BMW so this is the concept of a uh, inheritance so now let's take it a little step for that that so let's say we want to work more on the the Benz class now so now i want to bring the concept of uh, so let's say if you want to overwrite the the car detail class that is it's also possible you can overwrite uh the the the, the members for example when i say car detail so you want to overwrite it the functionality there okay you see now uh uh this uh, particular ide which is a VS code helps us to call the super. And this is another concept I wanted to, to bring for you. Okay. The super class has its own stuff, but I don't want to use the super class. Super, if you call the super, if you use the super function, if super, uh, in view super method, it will refer to the method of the, the parent. Okay. So as it is now, if we run this thing again, now, it's going to still give us the same answer. Because why? It's calling the the uh the method the car details method of the parent but we can actually override that okay but before then let's run it first and see what it gives us so i'm going to just come over here right now and uh, so so we're going to paste this so you see it gives us the same thing again still runs properly so it was just calling this the pair the parent constructor then we can also override it that is add more things to it okay this see we also want to add the say print this is an addition to the child okay so let's run it now this time around so i'm going to come over here uh control z so we'll come over here right now and uh we paste that again so you see, okay, let's just run it properly on its own. It seems to be having an issue here. So clear first. So pi uh, class inheritance dot pi. Okay. So it's run, it's still, this, the Benz class is still running uh, uh, the, the the okay we have not made an instance of the Benz class so let's make an instance of the Benz class now so we're going to make an instance of the Benz class now using the its own constructor so we're going to say, come here so let's say my Benz my Benz 2 uh, equal to let's say Benz this time around Benz okay and it's going to now let's run it this way further before we now learn more lesson from that my Benz 2 using the Benz constructor itself. So car details of the Benz class. So we're gonna come over here. So pi class inheritance dot pi. All right, we are having an issue here. Okay, what does it say? It's supposed to also have, because it's inheriting the parent constructor, it throws the error because we're supposed to have the value our view is supposed to be passed for the brand and a color so let's say benz 2000 that is if that exists then this color should be brown okay the color should be brown all right so now let's when we run it again now this error will be cleared off so i just I purposely allow that error just to get you some to understand some point so yeah, let's run it again. So pi uh, class underscore in hairy hands dot pi. Okay, you see. So this is an uh, so it prints the parent inside this uh, method. The super keyword was able to bring in the execution of the main uh, 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 card details that is in the in the 
parent, the parent car before uh, executing the that of the of the child. What is also added to it? So you, you will actually add some more uh, stuff to the the what the already the method that's already existing in the parent. All right. Then the same thing can also be done if you also want to declare your own. Uh, you want this uh, particular uh, class here. The Benz class will have its own method, its own constructor rather. You can come over here and do this in it. When we do this, you see it calls the parent. So you can also, after calling the parent, you can also add your own now. So in this place now, apart from the parent caller, let's just see, we'll add another uh, variable here called make. Okay, then make, let's just declare another variable here, the make of the car. You can add that there. So at the point of uh, declare uh, of instantiation now this one can you can either use, either use the the uh you now have to make use of the uh the the child constructor by saying okay let's just call it here first let's initialize it in the constructor self make is equal to make okay so here we we'll have to add the make which is make so in this place, in the make of the car, okay, uh, make, this is Benz 2. Let's say Rio, whatever. Uh, let's just use that to signify the make. The one important thing is, it surpass the example. So now let's run this code again right now. And you see, it's done, all right? Then we could actually we could actually print that out okay, and and say so this is an addition to the child and the make and the make is let's put the make now let's print it out let me use of it here the make is self dot make all right so let's run again now and just this will be the last example on this topic and the make is real so that is it this is basically the understanding on the concept of class inheritance in python python class inheritance and it's almost it's similar in most other uh, programming language but this i will work with inheritance class inheritance in the python programming language so this is the end of this lesson on python classes and objects over to the next lesson right now. In this section uh, of this lesson, we want to look at what we call exception. Exception handling. Exception handling. All right. Uh, dot pi. I open that file. So what are exception? Exception simply means exceptional events. All right. That is events you don't want, you don't expect. You know that uh, could come up in your program in your development maybe due to one error or the other either error from the developer or from the system or from uh, uh, the the user okay for instance you could come over and say that well, there's a variable where there's no where, where, for example we can print name when we know very well that the variable name is not defined it's an ex it's an erroneous code but when we run it now now let's run that code this code right now say exception handling so by exception underscore handling that's the name of the file dot pi you see it throws an error with this error that is through is the exception and what is the exception here is name error exception so because why there was an error in our code we, we decided to print a variable where that is not defined so what you see now, this kind of message that is being printed here is messy. It's not nice for the, our end user. Supposing we have an application and this kind of error is being displayed to the user. It's very, very messy. So how do you handle it and make it nice? That's where the concept of exception handling now comes into. Now, we know that this particular code we have have an error. To make it the presentation to be nicer, to be nice to the user, we can handle it by using what we call a try and accept uh, Lock. So let me come over here. So let you use a tab to put the indentation. Then we we'll come and handle the exception by calling accepts. Now 
in the Excel block, if you want to just handle it generically, you don't want, we don't want to handle the specific error. I just come and just say print. Uh, there was there was an error in the code. Something like this, which is very generic, and the, it may not give the user a good, uh, the complete detail of the error. So if you want to give them a generic message, you can use this. So let's run it again now. I want to come over here right now. So you see, you see there was an error in the code. So it's, so this is very far more nice. This message like this, very plain. It's more user friendly than this mess here. Okay, this one could be easily understood by the developer, but for the end user, it will not be able to understand this, this kind of message. So we need that to print. So this one makes it better. So there was an error in the code. Now, if you want to make the message more specific again, you can say, okay, we'll come over here and handle the exemption. The exemption name here is what? It's name error. Now, there are many kind of exemption names. You can have zero division error and the rest of them, the arithmetic error and the rest. But so, how do you handle? You want to be more specific. So, we want to check. Now, in this particular code, we know that the kind of error that can come, especially when we anticipate the kind of error that can pop up, we now call the name of the error and handle it appropriately. So instead of just saying there was an error in the code, we cannot say what that variable, that variable is not defined. All right, that variable is not defined. So that our uh, error handling now, our message become more understandable to the user now because we know that it could be a, it should be a name error. But that's what we anticipate we can see clearly as the developer okay so in many many cases you will have issue that the error will come in all right uh, so then let's also check another kind of uh, exception or that could come exceptional uh, name of error for example i can have a variable like this let's say dividing divide i can say uh, now 10 divided by zero it's erroneous arithmetic what is it's going to print zero uh, er, uh, error say zero division error so i'm going to come over here and print uh divide divide so let's see it and of course we know that divide is going to throw error so i come over here now so you see it gives us zero division error so and of course we can go ahead and say handle it the same way so uh you can you see use your try and uh you'll come over here and okay let's just use a tab to make it faster then you come over here and accept accept and uh, you let's face that Okay, so then in case you don't want to execute anything there, actually that use let me use this as an example. In case zero division error course, you don't want to execute anything, you just want to keep mute, you can just say pass. So the pass uh, keyword can also help us in this scenario. Alright, so let's just run the code again. So and uh we run it. So it said okay, there was an error, the zero division error was not taken care of for some reason so what does it say to run oh, uh, divide by zero okay so i was going to put this division why this thing is going on is because it's supposed to be handled inside the code here so before printing it we would have come over here and put it so this is it so you put the drive block inside there to be able to handle it so let's go and uh, execute the code again so the block of code you want to execute that you, you want to handle it must be put inside the try and accept block then if there's um, regardless of what happened you know, there's a particular code you want to be executed no matter what happens you now bring in what we call the finally block so i want us to quickly introduce the finally finally keyword finally okay so let's come over now let's say i want us to use the, the this particular issue again so I'm going to come over now. Uh, okay, let's just add it in that place. Now, regardless of what happened, we want to execute a particular line of code. So let's say I come over here, say print. Uh, there was 
there was a zero division or you can't let's just say you cannot you cannot divide a number by zero all right then what if, regardless of whatever happened if there's a particular line of code a particular statement you want to print no matter whether there was an exception or not you cannot add in the finally dot finally right so finally okay you can just say print it could has been okay let's say the app the, the, the program has exited okay that whether there was an exception or not this error should be taken off the this particular line of block of code in the exception handler should be handled you're now bringing what we call the finally lock okay you will see in the course of other uh, lessons like we're talking about a file input and output we'll talk about you'll see how it, this is very important especially when you want to close a file uh after uh, opening or reading a file or closing the file you also have to make use of the final lay block we'll see how you use that there but for the now just know that the final lay block is the block that will be executed no matter what happens so this is it basically uh on the first let our first lesson here on exception handling in our next lesson we'll look at other type of uh, uh, issues concerning uh, exception handling such as the else find a try uh, accept and finally and how to raise your own uh, exception so now this is the end of this lesson so in this particular lesson we want to look at the concept of network programming we're going to say network programming all right so very important uh, aspect of this course uh, because uh, uh, ethical hacking or hacking in general is often done through a network so you must take your time and understand this concept very well now what is a network as we begin a network is often defined a network is is defined as a connection a connection of devices for the sake of exchanging resources and data resources or data all right all right then others will say a network is uh, a connection of devices uh, through media but either way is devices that are connected together and they share resources together exchange resources they exchange communication that is what a network is all about now Bringing it to network programming in Python. Now, the Python programming language supports network programming both at a low level at a high le and high level. Yeah, the, the Python standard libraries. All right. Now, at a low level, the Python programming language provides what is called socket, socket module, the socket module or the socket library for assessing for low level access low level socket module is used for what the low level access to the operating operating systems socket support that's at the low level to use socket programming for low level access to the operating the uh, your system of uh, a computer system operating system all right then in what we call socket programming then at another, it also supports what we call high-level access. There are uh, modules. It has a lot of modules for high-level access, which is also talking about application-level level access. Okay, such as it has something like a URL lib and the rest, etc. For assessing uh, application level uh, uh, protocols such as uh, FTP, 
HTTP and SMTP ETC ETC. All right. For the next particular lesson, uh, this session we're going to focus mainly on the low-level access uh, module, talking about the socket programming. So we're going to be dealing with socket programming in this particular session. Socket programming. Now, a socket is simply defined as the endpoint. A socket is a point. A, a socket. A socket is the endpoint of a bidirectional bidirectional communication communication over a network over a network all right now this uh, socket this uh, bidirectional communication ha is has architecture has the client server architecture this uh, socket that uh, the socket uh, socket uh, module or socket uh, programming has is built on uh, the the server client arch architecture all right so in, if you are doing socket programming you have what uh, you basically have two application one serves as a server and the other one works as a client so the python programming language provides us a module called the socket module for implementing socket programming which works on the basis of server and client all right now going further I want to quickly go into now to work with this uh, uh, socket programming in Python, you need to use what we call import. First of all, you, you start by importing the socket library. It's already inbuilt, so you're not going to you import the socket module, rather. Just import it. Then if you are creating a server, then the server has its own uh, unique, specific uh, methods with which, which you can use to implement a, a, a socket server. We are going to talk about them. They also have the client. The client uh, side of it of the socket has its own uh, methods which we use specific method. Then there are general methods which we use in both the client and the the server application. So first of all, the client. The, let's talk about the server specific methods. Uh, that is socket Python socket server specific methods so the methods you can use to implement a, a server in python and one you need to, the specific methods are one the bind you use a, a bind method bind method that is socket bind method then two you also need the socket listening listen method to listen to put the socket in the listening mode for clients to connect then it also provides the accept method, accept, accept method. So these are for accepting connection from uh, a client. All right. So these are the basic, the major method that are specific to a the socket server application. All right. Then for the server, uh, for the client, socket client application, socket client. Socket client specific methods, specific method, specific method. It's just simple. It's just a single method that is specific for the client. That is just the connect method. Connect method. And if from the name you can understand what it does, it's just for connecting to the server. All right. You use the connect method, the socket connect method. Then now, generally, there are the socket uh, uh, module has a lot of other uh, methods too, which are you can use. You use them both at the client, and that is general socket, general socket methods. Okay, you have here amongst others. The major ones we want to look at is the send method, the send method, and the receive method 
Uh, these are just the major ones, and there are others too. Then also the close. But when you have opened the socket, you should be able to close the socket. So these are basically the major concept of uh, network programming that we're going to deal with in this session. So for the now, we've got a good understanding. You have a basic understanding of what networking is all about because it's very important as an ethical hacker to understand networking. Now, apart from this lesson here, uh, what we're going to be learning in this session, if you really want to be very good, understand ethical hacking very well, you really need to have a good understanding of networking, computer networking. And also, you can also learn about computer architecture and uh, OS, is that operating systems. Your knowledge of all these three uh, aspects of computing will really aid you on the, uh, you know, help you a great deal in understanding ethical hacking and also becoming a great ethical hacker. So this is it on this lesson on, uh, in, this is just an this is introduction to uh, this uh, section of network programming, Python network programming. So in this next lesson now, we're going to kick off by first of all developing our first socket server. Okay, so in the last lesson, I did introduce the concept of uh, network programming in Python. And I also talked about uh, the socket programming, how the socket uh, uh, programming has a, the server client architecture. So in this particular lesson, we'll be quickly seeing, uh, trying to see how to implement a socket, a server, uh, a socket server application in Python. And it's quite very easy to do. So the first step, if you want to create, uh, to implement a server, is to, first of all, you import the socket module. Right, that is the first step. So you come over here, import socket. And with this, we have the socket available. Then quickly to step two, in step two, it will create a socket object. All right. So here, to create a socket object, you can just say socket, or you can call it any name you want to call it. Or let me just say S. S to represent socket. So socket dot socket. Then here we can uh, leave it like this. We can do the instantiation this way to work. Okay, yeah, socket dot socket, and uh, it will work by using a non-parameterized uh, uh, method, which is this socket by socket. Then we can also pass it the address family. Okay, now by the IP address family, so socket dot af. You see, there are a lot of uh, protocols, uh, the family address family, but yeah, I want to work with the IP version four. Uh, IP version 4 instead of IP version 6. We saw it there. If you want to use IP version 6, we could put a 6 here, but we are going to be working with uh, the IP version 4. Then the next thing you also call, um, since we want to have a reliable connection, so we want to use TCP, which is Transmission Control Protocol. So the, con the protocol we want to use is what we'll now reference there, the second parameter here, because, uh, second, second argument, where we come socket or sock, you call this. Uh, uh, this constant here, you can also uh, degram for the UDP, but here we want to work with TCP for a reliable connection. So with this, we can now simply print that socket uh, socket has been created. All right. Now the next step after creating your socket object is to now come over here to create a host. A host that is declare a host declare declare a host the host which you will be uh, using for the connection so you can just say host equal to uh, this now if you wanted you want to limit the connection to only uh, this uh, particular uh, local network we just specify it and say this now, but if I don't want every other, as many connections as possible from different computers, you just leave the open an empty string, all right, which we we'll use to bind. Then you also create a port. You open a port. You, 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 you make a port available, okay? Specify, specify a connection port, all right? Then here yeah, we'll come over and say port. Just choose any number from... 0 to 65,500 and something. That is the, uh, this, uh, the number with which you can choose your port number from. 
any port number from that range can go so i just use 1990 all right you can use one two three four five or one two three four like that just choose any port number that you know should not be in use in your machine then the next step here is to bind the uh, host with the port number to the socket to bind our host host and port to socket so we'll come over here and do the binding so just simply we we'll call on the socket object socket dot bind okay now we bind here yeah. inside here you must pass them as a single parameter put by putting them in bracket to the host variable and the port variable which already holds values there so with this it have a bound so the next thing we need to do the next step is to quickly put the socket or yes yeah, socket in a listening mode because it's the server we are creating here so the, serv the server has to be keep to be listening for clients to connect okay so to do that it's very easy just as s you call the socket object dot listen okay then you, we can specify the queue size that is when the server is busy uh, what are the number of uh, uh, clients that should be able to enter the queues will be accepted in the connection so for example maybe we don't make it 10 all right you may leave it open but it's still okay you can specify them since we are making it open for every uh, mini client to be able to connect to this server so we can now print at this juncture that socket uh, or server is listening we display this method that server is listening at or at uh, port so you put the port name here the port a variable here the comma port so add the port so it will display the port number in which the server is listening at all right then when the server is listening then from here we can now begin to accept connection through a loop so that you can continually listen for connection so while we use a while loop often time then we use an infinite loop you put the accept method in an infinite loop so let's say continue listening continue uh accepting continue okay continue accepting uh connections from clients okay so we put the uh the uh, server in the continually uh receptive mode to be able to accept connection from as many server as we have specified okay so to do that the server application a return the, the accept method as uh, at returns basically two values which are the client connection so let me just call it fully client connection clients connection let's just join them for the sake of client connection and also client client address so let's just follow this okay, let's just follow the normal rule uh, the naming convention client connection okay, which is one of the value then also it will also bring in client address so let's just say client address so then we call on the socket again and call on the accept method all right so now once that is done we can say okay we can just simply print a message and say uh a server connected okay received connection received connection from we well, that's called the address in where the connection came from by just calling the client address variable there client address so we'll call on the client address where the connection came from and maybe we want to return message at the end of the connection simply by or yeah we'll call the client client connection then send message uh, dot send send when well, we want to return message to the client as it connects just by uh, and of course the message we must send must be a byte and to do that is quite easy say thanks for connecting thanks for connecting then we have to uh, concat uh, we have to use the dot notation to reference the encode method because it must be encoded as a byte to so encode okay then at the point of receiving it at the 
other end we have to decode it all right so now with this our server is now we'll now close the connection that is a client connection we close the connection to the client client connection dot close so we call on the close method and that's that so with this we now have our server fully developed so this is our we have implemented a, a server application in with our socket module all right so the next thing we need to do before i leave over off this lesson let's just quickly uh, run it to see how the server runs then in the next lesson we'll talk of how we uh we'll connect we'll try to use it we'll create, create our the client application then see how to connect with the client to the server all right so here yeah, pi server dot pi okay so you see now this socket has been created and which is the first information right here that we printed out then server is listening at port 9 1990 so now we see that our server is well developed so in the next lesson now we'll now create a client application that would not try to attempt to use the client to connect to this server and if the client connects successfully the client should be able to receive a message saying thank you for connecting or thanks for connecting all right so over to the next lesson so this is the end of this lesson okay so are we in the last lesson we we're able to create the server our server application now we want to create the client which is the uh, we'll be able to use to connect to this uh, particular server now so how to create your client application that is socket uh client i'm going to just call it client dot pi right now to create client uh, your client application a lot of similarity between the, uh, the creation of a client application and that of the server just some you know, that the method is just the difference which is the uh, method connect method all right so let's go so the first step is to import the socket module you know, like we did for that of the server so we import the socket module we are simply say import socket and that's it we got our socket then the second step is similar to that of the server is to what create a socket object okay so let's go now so we can just see call it this is my my socket just to differentiate uh, between it and that of the server so my socket so we'll call on the socket then socket method socket then socket dot uh, af net uh, af i net which is the the i uh, address family then socket dot sock stream dot sock stream constant we call use it here to sock stream and that gives us our uh a socket object which is my socket and i'm going to copy it because i'm going to be using it often so I'll copy this very fast now. So copy this the socket object. So the next thing we need to specify we need to specify the port we want to connect to. So specify 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 the server port to connect to. Okay, and our server port. Let's see it again. The port number that we we we're listening the port the server is listening to is nineteen ninety. So you go over there and specify that one for in your client. We go over to the client we'll come over here and uh, say our port that we want to connect to is 1990 all right because that is the port that the server is listening to all right so now what next the next thing we need to do now is to connect to connect to the server so to connect is simple i'm going to just paste my the the uh, server uh, the socket object the socket uh, object which is socket dot connect socket dot connect all right then we now pass it the uh the host address and the uh, port number as a single argument and to do that is just to put both of them in a bracket inside the uh the connect method uh, parenthesis but you also now come over here so we want to specify that we are using connecting to the local network one two zero zero all right this particular ip all right for local host then when i specify the port number which i've defined already which is 1990 so with this our connection to the server is established 
now but we want to receive the message that the server we can see that our server is sending a thank you message so we want to have a way of receiving that message and printing it out for us to see which is thanks for connecting okay, we will need to look for a way to get it so to do that we, that's why we need to see how to make use of to receive we're going to say okay uh, let's say print received message received message from server all right so to do that is very simple so just print and uh, you call on the uh, object here which is socket dot receive then we specify the buffer size which is the amount of uh, uh, bytes that we want to be able to receive the maximum byte size of data that will receive this our uh, client is able to receive all right so uh, we want to specify uh, that it should receive at least one gig of data so once that is done the next thing that we need to do okay we need to decode because it's encoded in bytes so you need to go down call the decode method to decode the encoded method that is encoded message that is in bytes all right so when you in the server you use encode to turn the the, uh, the string that's in case you're sending a string so, so that it can be decoded so you encode it in the server then on the client side you decode it the method that you're able to print it out of your screen then finally when we are done you close the server connection the client server connection okay close the server connection the, that is the, this client connection to the server but to do that is just to we we'll call on the object the my socket object and just call on the close method and that's that our application our client application is ready now we want to use this client now to connect to the server so to do that we're going to run the server right now on a terminal and it will open a different terminal to run the server then we'll now run the uh we'll run the uh the client in this ide here so let's quickly to run the uh our uh, server so i'm going to go to the desktop i open here python lesson so that i can navigate very easily to a command line so that it will just open up very fast so i'm all right here now so i'm going to run the server pi server dot pi server dot you see now so socket has been created server is listening at port 1990 all right so let's go to our ide now run our uh clients now okay now server is already waiting listening waiting for connection so just come over here pi client dot pi so you see the client receive the server uh, client has received a message so it's connected successfully this show that the client was able to collect connect to the server successfully so let's check the uh, server right now you see server says server received connection from this particular address and it specifies the port number of, that of what of the particular uh, uh client that you receive from all right now our server if you look very well we program our server such that it can receive as many uh up to uh it can receive a connection from more than one client okay so we are let's just see we want to connect with another client now so to do that i'm just going to uh, open another terminal okay another terminal the same way we open the first one and again we'll run this time around we're going to run uh, by client so it's receiving one from the ide one of the client is running from the ID, and one of the one is running in this place so another connection has been registered so the server now has two connections all right on the same machine so let's see uh for the server now you see it has gotten two connection two clients as connected so you can go on and on maybe until 10 like that and keep on connecting so it's like so this our server now is serving like a central server where multiple clients are not able to connect so this is very important now if you want to test this out and you know, to make it more clearer you could like if you have two computers you can install the server you can you can start run, you can run the server in one of the, your computers then use one of uh, in another another computer that you have you run the client then you see the how it will connect so that is it is basically uh what uh socket programming is already the simplest example on how to work with socket to implement socket programming in uh, python programming language so that is it on this session on network programming so move over to the next lesson right now as we 
round up this uh, uh, session of uh, Python, the Python programming language, our lessons on the Python programming language, before moving further, uh, we want to talk about a very important aspect of Python programming, talking about not only Python programming, every other kind of programming, talking about file handling or file management. So I'm going to create a file now. But before creating the file, let's just explain it. I will use, I have uh, already written uh, some tests here uh, that I've commented here. All right, so for the sake of explanation. Now, in working with Python, or like other programming language, the Python programming language makes uh, file writing, writing and reading from the file quite very easy. Now, if you want to work with Python file, the first thing you need to do is to use the Python inbuilt open method. So before you can perform any operation in a particular file, either you want to create, you want to read, you want to write, First of all, you open the file first. All right, you start with the open method, the inbuilt Python open method. Then in the open method, you pass in the name of the file. Let's say my file.txt. Yeah. Then it will be a string. Then you pass in the mood. Now, what are the mood? The moods are the different purposes for which you open a file. All right, what are the some of that you can open a file for creating, uh, open the, uh, the, uh, the file for the sake of creating it in case it doesn't exist. You can open a file to write to it if it's already existing, or you can, if, even if it's not existing, you can create and write at the same time. The Python uh, mode can help you to do that. Then we have, you can open it for reading or for appending. That is a test already, the content is already there. You want to add uh, content to it. Now, so look at the mode. Let's see all the, some of the modes available, the modes that are available for you to work with it. Okay, now, you can use the S mode just for file creation in case the file does not exist. All right. Then you can use the, the W uh, uh, mode. What does it do? It opens a file for writing. And if the file does not, if over, and if the, there's already a content in the particular file, the write mode will overwrite what is already there, the existing content. Then if the file does not exist, it creates it. Okay? So the W mode, that is for the W mode, the write mode. Then arrow mode opens a file for reading. It will throw error if the file does not already exist. We will have an input output error. So we'll see how to handle it. So while you are working with files, you need to mandatorily handle uh, exceptions. All right. Then there's what we call op, uh, the A mode. It opens a file for appending. That is, but it does not override the existing content. All right. Now we have the. Then if you want to open a file both for writing and reading at the same time, you use the W plus. And if you want to open a file for write, reading and writing, you open arrow plus. Then for appending of file and reading at the same time, you use the A plus. Then if you want to delete a particular file, you can use, we can now import the, uh, the you can delete the file by calling the os.remove method that you will not, we now have to import the os module. So let's quickly see how to implement some of these things just for better understanding. So I'm going to create a file now. I'm going to call the file, the file underscore manage, manage, the last file that's called management.py. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, following what is here now, is to create a. Uh, we want to create a file, so I'm going to put the, them in a try and accept statement. So try uh, of uh, let's say f representing a file. Say open. Like I said, the first step you need to do is to create open with the open method. So let's say uh my test or my test my test dot pi okay, that is the uh, sorry uh, dot txt all right that is the file we want to create the file does not exist so we want to see how to work with the mode so you open the mode the mode is x to create a file in case it doesn't exist sorry we yeah it should be open 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 all right, then the exception that could come in case it doesn't exist is input output error. So we'll just hold it and just to save our time, all we just need to do is to print the error message. Okay, if the file already exists, it will throw error. Okay, so we need to always, when you're working with files, you handle exception accordingly. Then if the thing is actually created we need to have a way of receiving message so let's use the else statement here so that uh, it will help us to print message we talked about try accept and else before so yeah else uh pi 
has been successfully successfully created all right then it is also a good practice that once you are done creating a file uh, opening a file uh, in whatever file operation you are doing in python you should close it so we're going to use a finally block finally print let's say uh file dot close okay so this will close it so for you to just for us to know that the file will actually close let's just print out something here the file closed okay i think this will be, give us a better message so now let's run this code now so i'm going to come over here right now and uh, i'll type file file underscore management dot pi now we run you see file has been created let's see the file here now we can see the file here the name of the file is that we created was my test so my test.txt has been created, but you can see now it's just an empty file. So using the mode, so let's just copy this to save uh, some time later. So now you, the mode we use was the S just for creating of test. Now to write to this file that have been created, we're now calling the W mode for writing. Okay. So to write, we come over here and say f dot write. F dot write. Let us write something, a kind of test to that. This is my that you want to write into that particular file that has already been created all right then if we, if the file does not exist however the uh, w also can also help you to create the file in case it doesn't exist so instead of using the x for creating you can actually use the w to just achieve the same for uh, the two purpose because the w uh, mode will help you to uh, to want to write to a file if the file doesn't exist, help you to create it but we have already seen it's still good we also know how to use the x mode we have done it that already so this is my uh, Python file. Let's just say that. Then we'll see how. So once this thing is done, you can also print that. You say file has been successfully instead of created. Let's say written, written to. Okay, that's a good message for this now. So let's run it. So you see, it, file has been successfully written to. Let's read it before we use our code to read it. You see now, this is my file, my Python file. This is my Python file. Uh, why did we write that? We wrote it here. So we use our code to write because we opened it for writing mode. Then if you want to read this file now, how do we read? To read, you call in the, use the arrow mode. All right, so let's read now. So to read this particular file, it's already here right now. So we come over here now. Let's just remove this now. Or let's just comment it out. Uh, just comment. Then over here right now to read it then uh, we come and say f dot okay let's print it so we have opened the file for reading by calling the f mode so f uh, prints uh, f dot read f dot read all right then you can now we can come over here now and run you see, this is my Python file. So the content that is here, it was read inside our code, as we can see. It reads it. So these are the major modes. Then there's another way to read this file. Instead of using the read method, you can also loop through it. For example, you can say for V in F. Okay, we're already on a start looping. So you say print. So let's push this a little. For V in F, print V. So it will read each line of content one after the other. So let's run it. So you see it reads it the same way the read method did. All right. Then finally, before we cut off, we want to see what we call how to work with the append method. The append. Okay, so append. So we're going to forget about rereading for the now. Uh, let's not read now. Let's just append. Uh, okay, let's just say this is my. We have already written this is my Python file. Nice. We want to add more content to that the other one now. But let's just uh, oh, let, let's see how we are uh, overwrite to so see the difference between the, the W. So now, if I want to just overwrite what is here, if I use the W now, it will overwrite what is here. Just I want to just carry this example so that we can see the difference between the the write the rewrite mode and the append mode. So this let's say this is a new text 
Okay, let's run this code now. If it's written well, it will tell us that it was successfully written. So let's come and write here. You see, file has been successfully written. Too. So let's see, with the W mode now, you see, this new content here has overwritten the other one that was there originally. Now, but with the append method, let's use the append method now. Append. So let's say this is this this will be appended appended to the content appended to the content all right so yeah let's put some space so you are going to see now once we run this using the the append method is not going to overwrite unlike the the write method so let's run the code again now okay it's a file has already written to so let's go you see this is a new test this which was uh okay you see now it ends here this was what was originally there but then the append method uh, instead of overwriting what was there was added to what was already there so basically these are the major things you need to know about file input and output the the plus you can do a plus so that is for reading and writing at the same time then if you want to uh open for writing and reading at the same time you add the w plus then if you want to read and write open for reading and writing at the same time you put the arrow plus so this is it then finally if you want to now delete this file how do what do you do we say we need to, to delete the file that's already there what do you what you do is to use the os modal so import os okay so that we can access the method for deleting so let's say we want to delete this file now so uh let's leave those things as they are now you can just simply say um os dot remove you call the remove method like i said already and uh, put the name of the test the test file there is my test dot tst okay so with this we can be able to remove it so run you see it has gone off you see the file has been deleted from the system it's no longer exists so see if the file is still there let's just comment this out now and try to read it now all over let's try to read it again and we're going to see that it's going to throw error or let's try to write to it for the now let's try writing to this file again so come over here See, there was a sin invalid okay os that there was a valid uh, an error there. okay sorry we our comment here was wrong this is not a valid python comment so we didn't comment that place out properly let's clear so that it will be clearer clear then come over here now okay file close there no such file exists no such file exists so true error all right and that was that so this is the end of this lesson on uh, python file management python file management this is the end of this lesson all right so you've seen how you can open a file for uh, different purposes either to create a new file to re uh, to write to a file to read and append and also you also see now to delete so this is the end of this lesson and so over now to the next lesson extending from where we stopped from the our exception handling in the last lesson we're going to talk about in this lesson we want to look into other aspects of exception so let's just call it except okay so create a file called except all right so yeah what we want to do here is uh, we want to look into some other uh, aspects of exception handling like raising exception raising exception uh, using the exception alias or exception ally uh, arguments alias or alias arguments then we also want to look at how to use the introduce the concept of the else clause all right now talking about raising exception for instance if i say v or maybe you are taking a user input uh let's say 
user input user input so we now use the input value let's so like collect integer uh input type casting to integer because like we already know is the value is what i will be returning will be a string so enter a number between between one to ten so let's say this is the input we want to collect all right so i'm going to just come over here and to raise an exception so it is possible that the user may want to add uh, values that are not within that range so how do you handle we can actually raise exception for that we have other ways we can print normal error message but also another way of handling an error from such a, a, a scenario is also to use uh, what we call to it's also to raise exceptions okay so if user input is less than one or let's say user input is also greater than 10 so which means it's beyond the range so any value that is entered that is beyond the range we can raise exception instead of just printing you can say raise value error value error okay so we we'll come over here and say uh no you can only okay only values from between between one to ten is allowed right so with this we have raised an exception now let's try running this particular code now All right so pi except dot pi so we say let's just alter it with zero for instance so you see it an exception was raised said value error only value between 1 to 10 is allowed all right so there may be need for you to use this uh, 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 raise exception instead of just handling this not the other reason try and accept so you should also have that in your your is your knowledge box then the other one I want to talk about is also talking about uh, alias okay for instance uh, instead of raising exception I'm going to just comment this out. Uh, we have already known this one now, so just comment it. Right? Okay, so we want to talk about the concept of alias. So instead of using uh, it this way, I can come over here and I'll pick this. Uh, let's put this now in a, a try and cache block, a try and exit block. So try. Okay, then I come here, I put uh, a tab for for handling the uh, issue of um, indentation then they accept now the kind of exception i want to get here is value error okay then i can just use an alias of it and put every e or whatever value i want to use so i can come over here and say print uh okay i would say you entered yeah, okay there was an error in your entered okay or let's say you entered you entered a wrong value so then I will concatenate it with the value, the, the exact uh, system error, the uh, value error message. So I can come over here and let's run this again now. Now uh, for the now, let me clear here. So pi except dot pi. So let's put uh, instead of putting value of a number, now let's just put a string. You see, you say you entered a wrong. You entered, sorry, this was wrongly spelled, but it's still okay. You entered the wrong value. So the device was to put to end it here. So let's just see where it ends. Enter the wrong value. So 
you are from this uh, where the colon is you see the uh, the exception the information that is the value of the e now so from here it's a invalid literal for int with base 10 w so this gives us another error so or you can just go straight to the point and just use this it can help you take care of the error message if we just put only this in at the alias for the error or the argument the exception argument we just put it here and this will help us so let's just put another invalid value you see nice invalid literal for int with base 10. then finally as i round up this lesson on exception i want to introduce the concept of try and accept okay so we can actually Maybe we create a variable, just make another error, something like this, uh, like the example I used before. So I come to print name, okay, name. Okay, there's an error there. Uh, let's just say name equal to uh, one, right? And uh, say print name print name then there could be exception exception okay, let me just let's commit an exception there let's have let there be an exception so accept accept uh as a name error name error okay it is name error let's just uh they print the variable is not defined then in case uh, to add to there's another the python also provide what we call the s block where you can actually use to execute a code that didn't execute here in case uh, for any reason the try block was not executed or for the uh, the exception was not handled it can be printed here the, 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 uh, this uh, particular block of code can be executed in the else block so you can say uh, something or uh, non or uh, nothing happened or let's just say a try or let's just okay the better uh, message should be none of the blocks of code executed all right or better okay i think for better understanding is the try block a try block didn't didn't did, okay let's say did not execute for some reason all right so let's run it now so I'm coming over here now and uh, okay we're, we're supposed to get rid of that particular line so let's get rid of that so let me just do this now so we see the okay let's just do it we went ahead so it first of all the first one executed this first part which we use in the first example then for the other one okay it came over here and said the variable is not defined so ultimately the else block actually will only run if for any reason the a try block the try block the code after the try block did not execute uh, which we can see now and at the same time the except block did not execute that is when this else block will be executed all right you can read more about the python uh, else block the try except and the else block it's really the s uh, the s clause you can get more information about it online for better understanding so with this i think we've been able to cover the basic concept of the try and accept statement that exception handling in python the python programming language so in this session uh we want to quickly see how to set up our ethical Arcane lab so this is just an in this lesson is to introduce you on uh, this section this is kind of an overview of this session in this session we want to talk about we want to uh, see how to install our ethical hacking lab or penetration testing lab so then i've said setting up your testing lab all right because the another name for ethical hacking is te penetration testing so in carrying out your penetration testing or ethical hacking activities 
ideally you should have set up a lab you need to have your lab your which includes your uh, operating system which you use for your attack then you also need to have a, a, another operating system which you use as a target now in this particular session we'll be seeing how to install a virtual boss because we want to use the, which we have uh, which is an hypervisor then we'll, on top of it we'll be installing the uh, virtual boss uh, on the on our windows machine which is my host with the host machine now that i'm using my my normal operating system we install virtual boss on it then after installing virtual boss we'll now install our attacking machine which is in this case we're going to be kali linus very popular among uh, hackers especially penetration testers with a whole lot of tools to aid your penetration testing then again apart from uh, then after installing kali linus we will also see how to uh, uh, you will also be taken through in another lesson on how to install uh, meta exploitable 2 uh, which is an intentionally uh, vulnerable distribution of linus operating system which we'll be using for our penetration test which will be serving as our target machine all right so that is what this uh, particular session is all about it's just an intro to it in the next lesson now we're going to quickly start by seeing how to install virtual uh, virtual boss oracle virtual boss in windows 10 which is my uh, host operating which is my operating system and which will eventually serve as the host operating system so this is the end of this lesson this is end of the this is the end of this intro so we'll move over to now to the next lesson okay so like i already said in our last lesson on the introduction to this section of uh, setting up our testing lab uh our penetration testing lab i did say we're going to first of all start by in setting up our lab we'll start by setting up a a kind of a virtualization package uh, where we we'll install all our uh, machines where we install the attacking machine and also the target machine i said oh, now i have chosen to use a uh, virtual board and there are other virtualization packages such as vmware and the rest of them for this particular lesson in this particular course we're working with we're setting up our lab using the oracle virtual board which is totally free it's an open source uh, package that is free now the one i'm going to be using because i'm using a uh, windows 10 as my host uh, machine my hosting system and we're going to be uh, i've already installed the version for my windows machine all right so in this lesson what i want to do now is to guide you through how to be able to install it by yourself which is actually very very easy all right okay, now, so install it you just open your browser then visit www.virtualbox.org okay virtualbox.org so it opens then you see this button here showing the virtual boss download virtual boss and with the version we just click on it and it takes you to this place now there are different packages for different uh, platforms or different hosting operating systems now there is a package for windows there's a package for mac os there's a package for linux there's a package for solaris so depending on your your machine you have your hosting machine your your, your operating system you are having i want to install the virtual boss you choose the package you want all right now because i'm using uh, currently in my uh, i'm using a windows 10 i'm going to be choosing the one uh, for windows host so i just click windows host it will start downloading but i wouldn't want the download to complete because i already have it downloaded now after the download uh now in, in case you want to make it faster you can actually use uh a download manager in my case i use a uh, virtual uh i use a flash get all right yeah, look at this place now i have flash get to make to speed up my downloads all right then after the download uh you can just show all download here you can quickly you see now the thing didn't go uh, because i have to cancel it so but i already downloaded it so when you finish downloading it's supposed to go to your the downloads your download folder all right this is where it is so you can actually do the installation by just double clicking it from here for me just to organize my files i have to cut i cut it out from here cut just right click and cut that even i want to just cut this now to a folder you just right click to cut and you move all right that is basic uh, computing all right so now going back here now to what we're doing now so in this place now i already downloaded it and i cut it to this place now so to install it is just very easy so either you double click it 
you follow the uh, the installation process and it's quite easy you click next and next and next now if i click next now it's not going to be able to install because i already have it installed on my machine so it's not asking either i want to repair it or remove now i'm not going to go on with it just trying to show you how to go about it it's really very easy and if there is, if your system lacks any dependency it will prompt you then you just install the dependency and go ahead with installing it it don't be more it takes you about one or two minutes or uh, one two three minutes you should be done with the installation all right all things being equal unless there's any dependency if there's any dependency it wants to take you time to just install and that's it and when you are done with installing it you will just see it is shortcut on your desktop okay for a, a windows operate that you can even i think uh, this uh, process is almost similar for other operating system you should also see the, the shortcut on your desktop all right so it is already installed we have oracle virtual boss already installed all right so let me just open it to show you how it is now before as we try to round up this lesson so this is it this is the virtualization package so it's on top of this inside this particular package now we're going to be installing all the op different operating system we need you can go ahead and install different operating system here you can have as many operating systems you have you can have different one of them here the different virtual machines you can install other versions of windows here install uh, linux here install solar install mac os on this but in, in our case here we'll be seeing we we'll just need it we we'll just need only uh, we'll be using in this particular for we'll installing only two operating systems we're we'll installing uh, the kali linux which is one of the uh, more popular uh, distribution of linux uh, operating system for uh, for hacking and then also we'll be using that as our attacking machine and we we'll also uh, our attacking system they will now install another one as our target system which is metasploitable too all right so this is the end of this lesson on how to install virtual box oracle virtual box on windows 10 operating system of which if you want to learn for your if your system operating system is different you can easily just uh take just uh, browse online on how to install your own uh, uh virtual box on your own particular operating system now there's an alternative to virtual box uh without other alternative to it uh but I, the, one of the most popular alternative to virtual box is VMware. All right, but in this course, we've chosen to use virtual board. So, this is the end of this lesson. We'll move over to the next lesson on where we'll see how to install our major uh, attacking machine, our attacking uh, operating system on virtual board, talking about Kali Linux. Over to that, over to the next lesson right now. So, in the last lesson, we saw how to install our VM virtual, talking about virtual box, Oracle virtual box, and we're able to install it properly. So, this is the virtual box right now okay and uh, so in this lesson what we want to do now is to see how we can now install our first guest operating system which we're going to use as our attacking machine talking about kali linux very popular among hackers ethical hackers all right because it comes with a whole lot of tools over 600 of them we want to see how to install it inside our kali inside our virtual boss as a guest uh, operating system talking about like, like this a virtual machine so to do that all we need to do uh, to get Kali Linux, we just go. It's a very, it's a free uh, distribution of uh, of Linux. So we just go to Kali.org. So while we are at Kali.org, uh, you just click on download. While you are download, while you are download, you have you will see the installer images. You have virtual machines. So uh, we have images for for virtual uh, machines. So in this case, I'll just click for this. So while we move down, you will be able to see a lot of virtual machines here. There is VMware, VirtualBoss, Camo. But the one we're interested in is just for virtual boss. So I pick for virtual boss, the 64 bit. There's also the one for 32 bit. So but my for my system uh, configuration, I'm going for for the 64 bits. Okay. So right here. So right here now. So I click uh on this now so i've already downloaded this now so i'm not i'm not going to go ahead with it it's a actually end as it's a zip file originally with, you are supposed to be able to open it with a 7z application but now um, i'm going to be opening it with uh, i have going around my system you can also open 7z uh, archive file so i'm going to just navigate to my system now now i've already now i've already uh, downloaded it uh, i've already installed it as a matter of fact just trying to guide you through how to get it done now, when I got it downloaded, I have it here as a zip file. I have it as a zip file here. 
now i need to unzip it to unzip it just right click on it and just click extract here and once you click extract here it will start extracting well now i have to cancel you can already extracted it so right here we have if you are finished extracting it will have files like although you may not have some of them here until you finish running it when you run i've already run it before that's why we have some extra files here okay so now let's see now how do you now make it work inside your virtual boss to make it work in virtual boss is very easy so i just go back to my virtual boss that i've already opened we just click add and uh, you navigate to the directory which is on the desktop here so lab lab software that is the directory then you click on the extracted folder so here you just pick this particular one now you see it's already showing a curly line because this particular one now uh, the this particular uh, image is already uh, this particular curly linux image already is specifically built for virtual boss so it easily starts with a virtual boss so just open it so you are seeing it here here it's showing power off then you can check the settings in case you want to check uh, uh, correct the settings so you see it the name is uh, Kali Linus Virtual Boss. We can actually change the name as it were. So let's just change the name. Can I just call it Kali Linus? Kali Linus. All right. So as it is now, so you see it's a, a Debian base. So there are a lot of settings here. You can change the settings here uh, for the display. If you want to enable 3D acceleration, you can do it. But when I did it, when I enable 3D acceleration, the system uh, began to show blank. All right. So I have to leave it at that. So, uh, uh, so i have to leave it at that so now to start it to boot it up now all you need to do is just click start then you wait kali linus now begin to boot now while i was doing this at the first time i cut an issue with the virtualization technology being disabled on my particular machine so in case you have that same issue what you just need to do is to just go to the internet and just google uh, for you uh, how to uh, enable virtualization uh technology in your own particular system for my own particular system i'm using windows on hp computer so i have to just check it that way and just okay, so you will easily see some video there youtube video you can watch within two three minutes they will be able to guide you on how to uh, enable virtualization on your uh, particular system so that can in line us can be able to boot effectively so that if they say in case you come in and uh, across such error you'll be able to easily fix it now as it is now can line us I won't click start in virtual boss. It's booting now into our virtual boss now. So just wait a while. It's going through the booting process like a normal operating system. All right. So we we'll just wait a while. It will finish booting. Once it finishes booting, we'll now be able to log in. So it's booting right now. We'll be able to log in and see what is inside. Then also be able to, and then I will be able to guide you on how to also install our uh, favorite ID we are using for this course, which is a VS Code inside it to enable us to write some of the Python codes we will need to write. Okay, so just wait a while now. Why Kali Linus is booting, so it's almost getting done. Let's just wait a while. All right, so it's booting as a virtual machine now. As it's booting now, as we are using Kali Linus as a virtual machine now, whatever we do inside Kali Linus does not affect our host operating system, which is Windows, the Windows 10 operating system. So that is why we, it's important we use it as a virtual machine. Now, you can also use it as your own. A complete operating system your original host operating system too but it's not advisable so often time it's good to use it as a virtual machine all right so especially for your ethical hacking uh, activities okay so now now the username and password i used was the kali and the password was also kali for the, the, the latest version i just downloaded right now as at the date of uh, producing this particular uh, lesson right now okay so it's kali the username and the Kali is also the password. And by default, when it loads, we're going to be logging you. It's going to be logging you as a user, not as a root. It's not going to be logging you as a root user. All right. But you can also log in as a user using the same password too. Okay. So as we come over here right now, it's bringing up uh, the terminal, although I opened it before. So right here now, this is the desktop of uh, Kali Linus. Okay. Right here, I was able to, I've already uh, downloaded uh, this. Uh, you can see the trash can file system folder you have home then right here we have uh, uh okay there is a uh we have a mozilla firefox which is a special uh, kind of mozilla firefox previewed into uh kali linus okay uh, then uh that is for browsing then uh, there are a lot of terminal here there's a terminal for if you want to log in as a root there's powershell there is a test editor here, so it has a, a test editor 
uh, just like uh, you have so it's a very simple test editor here you can use for writing stuffs yeah okay, even there are other editors too in the command line such as the such as vim and nano okay now but now so this is it now kali line or one of the major reasons why many hackers use it is because first it's it's free it's open source linux distributions are free it's a, a, a linux distribution which is open source then secondly it has it comes with a whole lot of ethical hacking tools right off the bat from at all different stages of uh, hacking from rec uh, reconnaissance to scanning to uh, attacking password uh, cracking to post exploitation and the rest of them even social engineering tools they are all available over 600 tools of them are, are currently available in Kylie Linus to enable you make your ethical hacking activity very fast but i'm not going to be talking about those tools now because those tools are beyond the scope of this lesson maybe in the future lesson we'll be talking about how to use those tools to make your life very easy in ethical hacking but apart from those two primitive uh, tools you still need to learn how to create a uh, python so that you're able to create your own custom tools ethical hacking tool because you can't just be depending on third-party application yes most of them are free but most of them may still have some limitations which you may want to solve all right so you won't want to only depend on third-party tools so that is the essence of learning python so but what python combined with ethically liners become very robust you, you have a very good good tools on your hand to be able to do ethical hacking very effectively so that is the essence of learning python for ethical hacking okay and as you are learning python for ethical hacking it will also help you to understand how most of the tools that are inside this uh, kali liners and other uh, ethical hacking uh, platforms work better so it gives you a better knowledge of ethical hacking okay so that's why we're working with uh, the python uh, uh we're working with python programming language so if you want to work now you know, if i as i round up this lesson quickly I want to see how I was able to install VS Code so that you, you won't have any problem with it. So quickly to do that, to install a VS Code, you can just click on this uh, uh, the Mozilla Firefox here that is here to browse the browser here. Just normal process, just Google, Google.com. Uh, so right here, when we get to Google now, we just simply say VS Code uh, download. So search it out on Google. So we probably can be able to get the exact link. So we can get the exact link. So we can get the exact link. So you can click here right now. And uh, once the link just opens, then you can be able to download. We're going to be downloading one for our Kali line. Or the, the version we're going to be download for Kali line is the Debian package. Okay, Debian and Ubuntu. But we just click dot the dot deep package. So you all click on it now. We need to download it very simple to download we follow normal download process but i've already gotten it downloaded so i'm just going to stop it so now i already have it so let's just navigate and i'll show you how to install it so once it's downloaded majorly it's, going to, it's supposed to show in your download folder download directory all right but from the download directory i have to copy it to the desktop but now i i downloaded mine actually i downloaded it in my uh, uh host uh, os then copied it down to this place all right now, now when it is now inside your kali linux how do you install it and the process is actually very simple you just open your terminal here all right as a user then let first of all list all the directory that's available so that we can navigate straight to the, de the directory where it is so cd desktop we know that it's already in the desktop so to the desktop now now in the desktop we want to see that particular file there so ls okay so this particular File is there. This is a file that I the downloaded file which can be used for installing. So the Debian package for VS Code here. Yeah. So right now, what next to uh, make it to install? All you need to do is sudo apt. Guys, look at the command there. I've already written it before. So let's see it. So sudo apt install the full dot. That is to reference the path in the place. Then you can put the slash there. Then put in the name. Then you can now hit enter. So it's demanding for the root password for you because for you to be able to store install something uh, here you need the root uh, permission so now it is not reinstalling because i've already gotten it installed all right now how do you launch it once it's installed to launch it all you need to do is to type code and it will, the vs code will be launched so just wait a while now it will be launched by just typing that word code anytime you want to launch it since it's, if it's already installed all you need to do is just type code on the terminal and it will vs code automatically be open for you 
All right, so here is VS Code, Visual Studio Code, which is our IDE we're going to be using for the rest part of the uh, Python lessons. Now, after installing our uh, Metasploit table, which is going to be our uh, 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 target machine in the next lesson. So now I have Python here. Now I have some code here. At the desktop, I have a full a directory which I created here. A directory I created right now. Uh, here on the desktop, you just to create a directory is very easy. Just say create folder, all right? And uh, you'll be able to give the name of the uh, uh, folder and uh, create it. Okay, so, so I created the directory and I called it, uh, I called it Python. Then I just create, save the file, the way we used to save it in a VS Code before, and I called it testing.py. So we can use it to test our VS Code. Now, let me open the VS Code now. Now, in the, inside the particular place, and I, I had all I just need to do, needed to do was, uh, uh, was just to import the folder. I to open the folder here, okay. So you click open folder, and I was able to put ring in Python, the Python folder. Then, okay. So while we are here, uh, the file that is inside, I could be able to run it. So let's just run this particular file now. You can run it normally way we used to do in all our previous lessons on Python, okay. So while we're in this place now, so you need to just just a little different here. You need to do the Navigation yourself. We know that the file is on the desktop, so say cd, cd desktop. Okay, so here is desktop. Then cd again to the particular place, the directory where the thing is located, which is the Python directory. So Python. So here we are in there. So from here we can now easily run it. Now the command for running your Python code in in Linux is now different. Is different from that of. Uh, of a window which is just pi but this particular place now you use python so you say python testing.py so let's run it so as you can see now it prints hello neighbor so this is it on how to install kali linux on virtual boss in windows 10 all right so this is so we're using uh, kali linux now is now being used as our attacking machine okay which we'll be using from here we'll be launching all our ethical hacking attacks or penetration testing attacks okay in order to discover vulnerabilities in a particular system. Now, well, in the next lesson, we're going to create, uh, install another operating system here, which is Metasploitable 2, which we are going to serve as our target, which we're going to be using for our testing purpose. We're going to be using our attacking it to be able to learn how to do penetration testing. So, in the next lesson now, so now this is the end of this lesson on how to install Kali Linux and how to install, uh, uh, then we also learned how to install uh, Visual Studio Code as our IDE. In the next lesson, we'll go and learn, we'll be talking about how to install Metasploitable 2 as our target machine. So over now to the next lesson right now. We have uh, installed Kali Linux, which is our attacking machine in the last lesson. In this lesson, now we want to talk about how to install our target machine, uh, our virtual machine, which I said we're going to be using a uh, Metasploitable 2. All right, and now uh, you can also use other uh, machine as your target, such as uh, you can even download the Windows uh, so your target maybe like Windows SP and old version of Windows as your target machine. But in this course, we're going to just limit it to just using Metasploitable 2, which is an intentionally uh, vulnerable uh, distribution of Linux operating system. So we want to see how to, uh, now that we already have, uh, how to install it on virtual bus. Now that we already have a Kali Linux already installed on our machine and our uh, virtual bus. Okay, so to do that, it's also very easy. So to, to get it, the first thing you need to do is actually to come over and uh, open your browser as usual, then go to Google, this time around, just Google it, because it's very available at SourceForge. So just say Metasploitable, Metasploitable download. Okay, so here, it's at the, you choose this link now to, to SourceForge. And uh, once you are here, uh, you just click download. Now, what is uh, Metasploitable? You see here now, the description say, tells you that Metasploitable is an intentionally vulnerable Linux virtual machine. Now, this VM can be used to conduct security training, test security tools, and practice common penetration testing techniques. Okay, then here it gives us the, the password and the rest. So, to do that, just click here to download the file size. It's a bit also uh, large, but not as large as that of Kali Linux. So, uh, what I've already gotten it downloaded as usual. So what I'm just going to show you, I'm just showing you how to kick off with the download. Just click download, it starts downloading, but I'm, as usual, I'm going to pause it because I already downloaded it. I use FastGet, which is my download manager. 
about 800 uh 825 megabytes it's already downloaded i use flash guest so you can use flash guest too to make the, the download very fast so once it's downloaded uh following this process uh, i copied mine from the download folder to this place that i'm already uh installing all the uh, lab uh, softwares here so it is here meta exploitable linus 2.0 all right so i have winrad there then the first thing you need to do now before we can use it inside the uh virtual box first of all we need to unzip it like we did that of uh i told you for that of uh uh a line uh kali so let's extract it so you just wait a while it won't take time so i'm extracting it now once it's finished extracting i go guide you through the process on how to uh make use of it to so start it up uh in kali line how to install it in kali line a very easy uh process it won't waste us much time so let's just wait let the extraction process get through all right, so once it gets through now, we'll just move over to virtual boss and get it done. All right, okay, so just wait a little while. Uh, it will soon be done. Yeah, now it is done. We have all the files we need here for the installation. Okay, so now that uh, we have extracted this, you move over here very simply. Just click here so that Kali Nanos is not a uh, make sure it's not selected. Then just click new. Okay, so when this one launches now, we want to add a new virtual machine here. So first of all, before we forget anything, we need to let the system know that it is uh, we're actually dealing with a Linux system. So for this, just say order, go for order Linux or 64 bits, order Linux 64 bits. Then we are going to give it the name. Let's just call it Meta Exploit Table. Meta Exploit Table. Okay. And uh, yeah, we have to leave the image ISO image. Leave it like that. Uh, so basically these are the things we need we need to uh, add it differently so uh, let's just go now so click next so uh, talking about the hardware uh, size uh, memory 512 leave it at the default is okay leave everything the default values are okay like this you move the next uh okay so for uh, mb the disk size that's okay the 8 gigabyte is okay so now what do you need to do now that you click use diff use an existing virtual hard disk Okay, once you click this, you see it's showing the that of the hard disk of Kali Linux. Then you click on this folder uh, image here. So just click here. So you'll be able to get the actual uh, uh, what we need, the hard disk we need. So you all come over here. So click add. So just come over here. We'll go over to our lab software, Meta Exploitable. Then we'll choose this one for Meta. So this is what we want to use. All right. So we're choosing this. So you see now it's now showing in this particular place now as our, our virtual hard disk. Okay, so you can now click next. So when you say next, we have, yeah, so we move forward, so finish, so we click finish, so it appears here now, we have Metasploitable here. So now let's run it to see how it works, just to have a feel of how it works, so we just click start, so since it's selected, we just click start, so um, as we click start now, you'll wait it to boot up, all right, uh, just like uh, Kali Linus used to boot up, so we just wait a little while now, uh, the Metasploitable interface, we put in interface, we show up for us. Install installation interface we show uh, it will be installing now on a uh, virtual bus okay so it's installing now so we might exploit it is installing right now inside our uh, met, uh virtual bus right now so just wait so if a few minutes it will be done then we'll be able to log in and uh, see how to just to test it out okay, it will soon be done in a few minutes right now so let's just wait all right uh, usually it won't, shouldn't take some few minutes to be done and uh, we'll be able to proceed just a few minutes a few minutes will be done with this installation all right and uh, it's almost getting through and following through to the end Installing some other stuffs inside, and it will show, show us once it shows us how we can where we can log in. The login prompt, then we'll be able to know that it, the installation is done. Now, right, it's done now. Meta exploitable. We say login. So right here is showing uh, login with ms msf admin slash ms admin to get started. So just go so to log in. I just say msf admin as the username. The login and then msf admin as the password so you see now we are logged into meta exploitable as it is now you've already got meta you already 
have my exploitable tool installed on your virtual bus so just to just add a little command just, just look for the ip now just to do a little thing here so yeah you see it works if config shows us the ip address the mac address and all that stuff here all right so this is basically how to install meta exploitable tool which is going to act as our target machine in this uh, course so that is how you install it so with this our lab is now fully set up so we are we able to proceed in on the net from next now we we'll proceed on how to create some uh, ethical hacking tools using python or uh, on the uh, uh, Kali Linux, and also we can be doing some of the testing using a uh, meta exploitable tool. So, to exit here, we just click exit. So, we are logged out. So, you can just click here. Once you click this, it will show you whether you want to power off. You just click, you check the power off the machine, and then uh, it will take it off. So, that's that. So, that's how you install meta exploitable on. Kali uh, on a virtual bus. So we already have our attacking machine, which is Kali Linus, and we have our target machine, which we can use for and uh, our attacking uh, target machine, which is Metasploitable Two, which we can be using for our uh, ethical hacking practice. All right. So basically, as you practice ethical hacking, you should be using these two. Then, I, like I told you already, you can also uh, put other uh, add other uh, virtual machines here, such as Windows, especially old versions of Windows or even new versions or you can also add a uh, mac os solaris different kind of operating system even android operating system can also be installed there but for this particular within the scope of this lesson uh, this course i are going to be working with these two using kali linux as our attacking machine then might exploitable tool as our target machine so now over to the this is the end of this lesson right now on how to install a uh, meta exploitable tool on virtual bus on windows 10 so now over to the next Lesson. So in the last lesson, we talked about uh, uh, how to install the Metasploitable framework. Then after uh, Metasploitable of, uh, OS, a Linux distribution. Then I did talk about us going into uh, uh, how to create a custom ethical hacking to using the Python programming language. But before we go into the how to uh, learning how to create the Python uh, uh, custom ethical hacking to using the Python programming language, we'll first of all go through some basic things. Now there are, there are two there are basic things I want you to understand, which are very important to you as an ethical hacker. Now the first one we want to look into is how to uh, understand some basic Linux commands. All right. Then after then we'll now be able to in the next lesson we'll talk about how to create anonymity. Anonymity. All right. Your anonymity is very important in ethical hacking. But in this particular lesson, I want to first of all look at how to create how to uh, uh, introduce you to some basic. Uh, Linus command which will become very handy for you as an ethical hacker. All right, so let's go uh, Okay, so first I launched the terminal my te uh, the Kali Linus terminal. All right, most of these command they are uh, similar for most uh, uh, Linus distribution All right now. So if you are born to distribution for Debian uh, It's not like we are having a Kali Linus now that is based on Debian and there is also, there are also uh, use also in other distributions of a uh, Linux. All right. So the important so there are several of those such uh, commands and uh, command line tools. But out of those, I just want to show you a few of them so that you be carried along when, especially when we make use of the the terminal for our ethical hacking as we create the tools. All right. So that you be able to uh, also it also uh, make it to be more effective. The more you understand this. Uh, Commands, the better you are as an ethical hacker, and also gives you a lot of speed. All right. So now the first command I want to go into is what to, I want to get to understand is what to call the PWD. Now the PWD command helps you to display, displays to you the current working directory where you are working. Okay. So so the PWD may kind of be said as a present working directory. Or let's just go. So if I say PWD, you see now it shows you. Your working directory. Now the next command I want to look into is what we call the sudo direct, uh, command. Sudo, another word for super uh, super user do. So they, this command is used for operations that requires super user or root user permission. So if you want to perform any operation that requires super user uh, uh, permissions, you call the sudo. All right. So, so we come over now. So let's say I want to add you as a user 
add okay, let's say user add okay user add uh let's say emi emilo a new user now want to add a new user you need the sudo command is require so i'm able to so it requires that i should add uh, a password okay, the password for kali that is the super user password which is kali all right so um, that user has been added now uh, i've added the user i also want to add the password to the user so to add the password i also need sudo they say pass to do pass word pass word all right the password option and uh, uh the username to be choosing here this time around is emilo okay so it brings a place for us to put in password so let's say we want to use the same password uh, the username as the same as the password let's just say emilo all right so emilo again so password updated so i can want to switch user to emilo now so let's say to switch user all i need to do this another command again you just say su which is switch user so i want to uh, so now we're in kali as our user now and i want to switch to emilo which is the new user that have just been created now so i can switch now to emilo all right so and uh I, it prompts for the password which is i'll use the name again so you see now i've already been able to enter into that user so yeah so basically this is what the sudo command does so you use the sudo you're passing the option or the flag you know for you to add user then you have to ask password there are a lot of things you can work so a lot of every any kind of operation that you want to perform that requires super user permission you make use of the sudo command all right so now here uh, i want to uh, get out of this place now so i uh, will just say kali so i put in the password i switch out of i switch back again so we have learned two command now the pwd and the the sudo and uh, we're also having able to do this now now the next thing we want to learn another command we want to quickly learn is the the ls command ls ls you see me use it before to just list out all the directories in a particular uh, directory you all the files or the directories in a particular directory now now we are in the in the uh okay where let's just go again now pwd tells us that we are in the cal home slash kali directory now i want to list out all the directories that are inside all the files and everything inside we want to list out all the directory that are inside the particular directory or you just put the ls a command and it shows you all the directories that are inside the the home kali directory now the next command i want to look into now which you have also seen me is what we call the cd cd okay, let's want to change the directory to the desktop from while we are inside the kali home okay so uh you say desk and change to desk also cd means change directory so from the, the the main directory the root directory we are in now which is the kali that i don't want to move into the desktop directory. so you say cd so the cd command me uh, uh, command takes us to the desktop so we can also use the ls again to list all the files that are there so here we are seeing python and the rest of them so basically that's what the cd directory does all right now the next thing now okay let's say uh we want to now cd now into while we are in the desktop, let's go into the Python directory. Okay, sorry, let's just, now the next thing we need to do, now let's talk about uh, uh, the the next command again, let's talk about the CP. Okay, CP. So let's say CP. Uh, I want to copy. The CP command used for copying. Let's say I want to copy the Python now. Python directory uh, to uh, the, the document directory now. So copy python then uh, i come over here now so i put in the, the full qualified path then i come here home kali and uh, over to the documents i want to move the 
uh, this uh, the Python directory to there. I want to copy it. Okay, it's missing the arrow. So let's go. Uh, so come again, copy. Uh, R, the, you put the R dash R flag to copy everything, uh, every of the content of the Python directory to so Python. All right, and we specify the path, which is home, Kali, which is a user, then document. So, yeah, so we've copied this, the Python directory now to the document. Okay, so now let's see now. So if you go over now and uh, let's say CD documents. So I say, so let's go into the document, the direction. Okay, sorry, we uh, we are inside the, the desktop. So first of all, we are supposed to uh, move back. So CD. Okay. okay so we are back to the main uh, Kali directory. So to return to the main directory, we have to use that dash that i think there so let's this again to ensure we are in the main directory you can you can see we are there now so now let's navigate to the documents now so cd documents documents so here we are so now let's check if the python directory that we we copy this inside you can see it is right there all right now uh i want us now for better understanding another command we want to talk about so let's uh see how we can just move now let's talk about moving so there's another there's a file that i already created there called test or from this python directory now uh, this uh, documents now let's move the the python directory now to the download which another command so to move to say move the python okay uh so we want to move it to home Kali downloads downloads so we see now we've moved it so if we check the ls now we shouldn't see python again the python directory has been moved and we moved over to the download directory okay so now let's go to the main uh the parent directory now okay so we are now back to the main kali directory so now we want to move over now to uh, the downloads directory. So see the downloads, downloads. So let's see if the Python directory is there. So sure enough, it is there. All right. Now let's just navigate again now back to uh, to the desktop, to home, Ali, uh, desktop. So while we are the desktop now let's see how to create a directory another very important command is what the make mk dire, uh, um, command so let's say a uh, test t let's use that or oh, let's, let's say let's say my okay let's say my test let's just create a directory like this called my test so you use the mk dir uh, dir uh, command you'll be able to create a, a new directory on the desktop so if you look at your desktop now we have a new directory in here called my test okay then we can even check it here as well all right and here it is okay then what next then if i want let's say we want to now create a file let's assume we want to create a file inside that uh, my test so let's cd into my test my test as it is now is empty to so cd my test okay so let's check you see there is no nothing there let, now let's say you want to create a python file inside this particular place now all right so let's say uh, now to do that you use, to create a file you use the torch command very important torch so uh the home Kali, Kali, and uh, desktop. So we are, we are putting the fully qualified path. And uh, let's say hello dot pi. So this file hello pi does not exist. You can as we just check now. You can see my test. Sorry, we are supposed to specify the my test directory. 
my test or uh, my test as the directory we want to create the file so we're going to just say hey, let's call the file hello.py so you come over here and then it is created you can check it from here let's just open it so you see now hello.py has been created by using the torch command now let's check here you can check it also here you see hello.py now uh if you want to open the file now to work on it so we need to also call what to call the we have a, what to call uh, there's a, a command there are some command line uh, editors that comes with uh, every linux uh, operating system all right so uh, linux distributions now for one of the most popular is what only one i want to walk, uh, show you now is a nano editor so nano so while we are here in my test so to open it to read it so nano nano let's say hello dot pi so you see the nano editor opens so right here now we can come in now and type in whatever you want to say print uh hello so we are putting in our python code now so without any other test editor you want to be fast you just can use this uh, editor so hello world and uh, close it and when we are done use this do control o for saving just click enter it is saved now to exit it just control x and you are out now that is for creating the file now we can run that particular file now while well, so long we're in this directory by just using python uh hello dot pi you see prince hello world all right then there's a way if you want just want to uh to read out the content of a file just any file you want to read out the display the content of a file to the standard output you can use what we call another command called a cat command cat let's say you want to read the content of hello.py for instance not to print it not to execute it like the py with the python uh, uh, command that we do you want to read out the content you can just come over and say cat hello.py all right so it shows you the content of that file so there are a whole lot of the uh, useful uh, Linus uh, commands which you need to get yourself acquainted with and, and, and such as the, we also saw the apt command for installing let's say sudo uh, apt uh, can say apt uh, update okay this will update the entire system if sudo apt install now like we use it for installation that is a advanced uh, package too where that is the meaning of the apt and of course working with it requires you to have a super user a permission so and the rest of them so a lot of things you want to change user to a file you use the chown the c-h-o-n like that all right and uh, a whole lot of other things but for the now these are just the basic introduction you need to go and learn uh, a whole lot about the uh, the linux commands the more the better understanding you have about them the quicker you are the more effective you are as an ethical hacker but i don't believe these are just a good ones as an introduction maybe as we go on with the lesson other commands coming i'll just explain it along the last work with them along the line if you want to all right so for the now i think we will have to end this lesson here the lesson ends here so in the next lesson we quickly see how to make ourselves anonymous while we are carrying out our penetration testing activity so uh, in this last last lesson i talked about us uh looking into how to stay anonymous when we are conducting our ethical hacking activities. Now, uh, for this lesson, I've already started off my uh, virtual bus and I've also loaded up, I've uh, booted up uh, the Kali Linux on top of it. So Kali Linux is already running. Now, in your, when you are doing ethical uh, hacking or penetration testing, which is the other name for it, you always will want to be anonymous. You don't want to be announcing the fact that you wouldn't want, you want to cover up your track while you are conducting your penetration testing, when you're carrying out your penetration testing activities, all right? So even if you are conducted with a company and the company has paid you and you are well documented, when you are doing it, you want to actually be anonymous to keep your, yourself off track, all right? Now, so I want to, there are, well, there are several uh, configurations you need to do, several things, you, several ways to get an, uh, to be anonymous in Kali Linux. I'm just going to be showing you the major, uh, two major ways 
you can be able to stay anonymous the two major uh, things you need to do to be anonymous all right now uh, so the first thing you need to do to be anonymous in Kali Linux is to use what we we'll call the Tor browser the Tor browser so I'm going to open my Mozilla now and just direct it to the, the place where it is located right now uh, talking about the Tor so you, uh, you just say Google you just go to Google all right and uh, we move over to the Tor project so you can just say Tor browser which is going to take us to the Tor project so once this is uh, so the first uh, uh, step is in getting your Tor browser okay the Tor browser like I said already helps you with uh, to maintain some level of anonymity then we'll now add some uh, configuration on our Kali line to be able to make us really anonymous okay we say to a very great extent all right to hide our true identity so you can download the top uh, 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 the top uh, browser and uh, use the app get apt uh, install to install it just the same way we did for in the earlier lesson on a uh, vs code uh, but there's another way of the installing which was the method i use which is just going using the uh, the from the terminal and using the apt command which i've already talked about uh, to uh, do the installation so i'm going to go over there now and show you how to do that right away using the terminal instead of uh, downloading it here so here now to download your tor browser from here you just say tor uh, apt get okay i typed it before so because i've already done the installation so apt get uh, sudo apt that uh, get install tor because we use sudo here because uh, it requires uh, installing uh, uh, an application requires a uh, a super user uh, privilege so we're adding uh, the sudo so you can just enter once you do that then you request for your uh, root user password then installation will take place now this is happening because i've already gotten tor already installed on my machine okay so that is the first step so once tor is installed in your machine the next thing you need to do is just to do a little configuration that which won't take us much time won't take you much time then you'll be anonymous with very appreciable level and that to do that uh, let's use a uh, sudo the sudo uh, there is a, a particular file in the uh, etc directory which you need to do some little configuration on in order to stay anonymous which is so you say sudo we're going to use mousepad to open that particular file because we're using sudo again that because it requires uh the activity we want to do now requires uh uh activity we want to do requires uh root privilege so we're going to open it with mousepad editor test editor here so mousepad has opened so if you look at this place a lot of uh, this one called prosy chains this one is prosy chains 4 for this particular uh, uh version of uh, kali linux we are using here now in this place now you're going to see different kinds of prosy chains different types of them you can and of course you, now you have to lay use one of them at a time so but by default, they are used, the what is uncommented, what is being used now is what we call street chain, and the street chain uh, the, the uh, uh, demands that the process you are using, if you are using process one, two, three, or four, all the process must be alive, else there will be an error in connection. But we don't want that, so the, the better process you use now, so, so that the, the one we want to use is the what we call the dynamic chain. So to be able to stay anonymous, so you, you configure this, so you. We have to comment out the, the one that was there by default, that was enabled by default, which is street chain, then on comment dynamic chain, which is what I'm going to use. Now, the essence of using the dynamic chain with the dynamic chain, uh, if you have more than one process, which you should, um, if necessary, then if one of the process is down, it skips to the next one. You can read uh, about the documentation. They are properly well documented there. You can see the comments for documentation on how these uh, different process work. But just uh, simply you just for this particular lesson sake what i'm doing now is comment out the street chain which is there by default then uh on comment dynamic chain which is the one we want to use now you must use one at a time then at the bottom here you will see the process that are here all right so quick explanation of the process how to uh, uh, add process to your uh your your this particular file then let's see the explanation of how the process are that are properly documented like i said now the first part of this prosy here is called the prosy type which you can see here then this other part is the 
the IP of the Prozy, Prozy IP. Okay, then the following it is a port. Okay, the port of the uh, the port number of the Prozy. Then finally, if in case you are using maybe uh, a Prozy that requires username and password, or it's a paid Prozy, you put the username and password. And of course, you have to separate each of the Prozys with at least a tab or some space like that. All right. So that is what they did there. So you see, the, the Prozy that is being used here is this for the local host here. So you're using SOX4 pro, uh, Prozy type, then with this and this. Now, for us to support uh, more modern browsers, we can uh, come over here and use a SOX4 type of Prozy. SOX5 rather, uh, right? So and we come over here now and, uh, and say SOX5 so that we can be able to support modern browser now apart from these proses that are here if you can want to add more proses you can go and get paid one and also apart from paid one there are also many free you can just go to the uh, browser your google and just type free proses and you'll see a whole lot of uh, website that provides free proses which you can come and pro configure according to like the examples you are seeing here you see socks 5 and uh, you put the ip of the proses you put the port in case it's half uh, thing, you can configure as many uh, you can add as many proceeds as you want but for the now for this particular thing this is just enough for example so once i are done here use as i'm using mouse pad now i have to save it so just click save and uh, we close this so that's for that so we are done with configuring our prosy now now to just test it out now we're going to use uh, a, a browser i'm going to use a a, a, uh, a search engine which doesn't uh, you know track so much of ips we we'll just show you example of how this anonymity works. So now I'm going to just say, okay, uh, Rosy chain, Rosy chains. Okay, I typed it before. Rosy chains use Firefox. We are opening the Firefox and using our Rosy chain, hiding our, uh, becoming, uh, keeping our. So in order to keep our anonymity when we're working with a Mozilla, uh, with the Firefox we are using here this uh, particular browser here. But we're using it now to open DocDocGo which is a, bra is a, a search engine that doesn't track uh, much of uh, uh, IP, so it won't be giving us uh, uh, connection issues like other search engines such as Google, so just to show you how uh, anonymity works. So uh, while we are doc, doc go here, yeah, so the next thing we need to do is to just show you an example now. So let's say uh, DNS leakage, leakage uh, test leakage test so we'll go back to this particular tool and uh, use it to show you how our uh, we are maintaining our uh, anonymity here to so just to show you how the anonymity is working here we we'll wait a little while uh, so that the dns uh, leakage website will be uh, will be open once it's open uh, for we'll be able to test uh, we'll see our IP address, then I'll also show you how it works on our uh, host machine to still show you the difference. So now, while we're on Kali Linux now, let's see the IP address of this particular place. Okay, you see, it's showing, you know, you say, hello, uh, this is our, I, the IP address is detecting, okay, on this Kali Linux, which is not actually, this very wrong IP address. Now, let me go over to this uh, place now, and uh, now over to our the, our main uh, host machine here which is uh, this windows now to show you the difference now so on windows i'm going to go to google.com uh, because we are not uh, using any prosy here so i'm going to say dns at leak test so we're going to open the site again here you'll see now it's going to tell you another my real this place will reveal my real ip address let's quickly just check out that one again now so you see the ip address here Okay, the IP address is this particular one. Now, in this place, now let's check it now. On uh, this, my host machine. So the, this particular place actually is my is for the, this is for the the Kali Linux IP that is detecting where I, I am staying, uh, my location. But well, that is the wrong one. Now let's just a little patience. Once this uh, thing just opens right now, we're able to see. My real IP address, and you see that it is going to be different from that of my uh, uh, my real uh, IP, uh, this particular one that is here. Okay, 
Then, uh, apart from the why we are still waiting, because it seems there's a little network uh, challenge right now. Let me just use that opportunity to explain some uncertainty to you why, we, why it's uh, opening the IP there. Now, apart from uh, doing this ProZ uh, configuration, you can also use uh, change your MAC address. You can also, uh, in order to remain anonymous, then you can also use VPN. So these are all uh, different techniques you can also use to maintain uh, anonymity. You see now, so this place in the DNS leak test, it reveals my true IP address in my host uh, machine, which is a uh, Windows. But in Kali Linux here, you know, it's revealing a, another IP address, which is not mine. So this is majorly the way you stay anonymous in your Kali Linux when you are doing your ethical hacking. Okay, so when you are there, all you just need to do is to, if you are opening, want to open a browser, you want to open a particular website uh, anonymously, all you just need to do now is to use the Prozy chains. Just open the Prozy chains, call the browser Firefox, then DocDocGo and or uh, whatever uh, website you want to browse, you can be able to use uh, a Prozy chains to open it in order to stay anonymous so long you already have Tor browser installed on your machine. So this is the end of this lesson or now to maintain anonymity or stay anonymous in your uh, in Kali Linux when conducting your ethical hacking uh, activity. So for next lesson now we'll talk about we'll start developing some ethical hacking tools using the Python programming languages that we have a language that we have learned. So now over to the next lesson. So uh, having uh, been able to see how to maintain how to be able to create uh, stay anonymous we've seen how to uh, some uh, Linux command in the last lesson we talked about uh, uh, staying anonymous. So now that, that those uh, preliminaries are out of the way, we want to go into the main major part of this uh, course. It talks about creating how to create uh, ethical custom ethical hacking tools using uh, Python, the Python programming language, which I've already learned. Okay, so we learned the Python programming language. We want to see how easy it is to be able to use the Python programming language to be able to create. Uh, uh, custom ethical hacking tools. Now, ethical hacking has uh, basically uh, five phases. One, the first phase is what we call the information gathering phase, which is called the rec another word uh, for it is the reconnaissance stage, where you gather information about the target in which you want to uh, you want to uh, conduct the penetration test on. Of course, since we are ethical hackers, you need to take permission from the organization. In which you want to conduct the ethical hacking all right you cannot uh, conduct penetration testing on an organization without permission so you first of all get an uh, information about it maybe the company may just give you you may just have access to the company name but you need to first of all gather information about the company okay so that is the stage called the reconnaissance which is information gathering after then you now go to the next stage talking about scanning report scanning vulnerability scanning then after scanning, the third phase is gaining access or exploitation. You gain access and exploit the system for your penetration test. You, you mimic the uh, kind of attack, attack, the possible attacks in which the malicious attackers uses on the system to be able to find out the actual vulnerabilities, then be able to report accordingly to the organization you are working for so that they can take proactive steps to be able to defend against the malicious attacker that is talking about exploitation. And after exploitation, by the post exploitation level, we now have what we call maintaining access level, which is the, the fourth phase of ethical hacking, of hacking in general. All right, all right. So that because even some of the bad guys they still go through uh, all those processes too. Then finally, we talk about covering your track. After maintaining access, when you are done with whatever you want to do uh, with the, uh, the system, with your hacking, you need to cover your track so that you will not be uh, traced. Okay, so for each of these phases of ethical hacking, we're going to be producing some of the tools that will be helpful for us in doing all this, uh, going through all this phase of ethical hacking using the Python programming language. Now, like I said before, most of these tools, there are plural, plurality of a lot of, of tools, ethical hacking tools that are available already here in the Kali Linux uh, of OS here. But we are, uh, because that is not our, uh, it's beyond, uh, talking about those tools are beyond our scope, we're not going to go into them. We're going to be talking about so this uh, course talks about how to create your own custom uh, ethical hacking to using the python programming language uh, why is why is that so 
because they, most of the, even though most of the tools are uh, free, they, they, you may be limited just depending on third party application. You may want at the time you want to be able to develop your own uh, or maybe add some features to already existing tools. Or then some of the tools are also uh, paid for. And those tools that are paid for, and some of them are very expensive. You may not want to. You may not want to be able to spend such money. If, so your knowledge of uh, Python, will be able to, with your knowledge of Python, you'll be able to create your own custom uh, hacking tool. So this uh, uh, the part of the lesson, we're going to be looking at how to be able to develop some of a custom ethical hacking tool, some basic ones, and, and uh, then uh, so that you'll be able to develop them by yourself. Then maybe in you know, subsequent uh, courses, we'll be able to talk about how to do some other more complex tools. Okay, so to develop the first tool I'm going to do, which is going to be the most simplest uh, uh, Python ethical hacking tool uh, for the reconnaissance stage. So you can, most of the time, if you want to do reconnaissance, the first thing you need to do is to at least get an IP address of the target. Okay, so I want to just show you how easy it is to be able to use the Python programming language to create such a tool. So for this, I hope, I'm running a I've uh, run uh, work on our, uh, our VS code from the terminal by just typing code there, as you saw there. Your type code, so it launches uh, a VS code here. Then already did uh, when we we're uh, creating it, I did this particular file and the rest. Okay, so uh, and, uh, so now to just show you how easy it is to be able to develop ethical hacking to using Python. So let's just take the first example. In this one, we just want to get IP address. How to get IP address of a particular web address okay because if you are gathering information about a particular uh, company the first point of contact should be the website so i'm going to get this one called if i get ip.py all right so with a few lines just two line of code here yeah, or we can be able to create a tool that a python tool that will help us to get ip address of a website now before you work on any website it's good you get permission. I keep on repeating it. If not, you can, uh, if you are caught, uh, some company can, you can be sued if you are caught, uh, you know, uh, conducting testing or scanning or any particular system without permission. All right. So you need to stay within the law. So to, to print this, so I import the sockets uh, model, which I already know about in our previous lesson. So socket dot get host by name just call this function now i'm going to just use my own blog address my abandoned uh, free wordpress blog so i'm going to say uh, just say uh, the web blog name address is righteous righteous faith dot wordpress dot com okay so with this alone we have been able to uh create Okay, I'm going to have that. Uh, this alone now will help us to get the IP address of this particular website or web address. Okay, so now let's just run it. So I'm going to launch the terminal now. So launch the terminal. And just say, we're already in the directory. So Python to so get ip.py. You see, it prints out the IP address of this particular web address or website so you can use this now to get the easily get the ip address of a particular website using this simple code so you see how easy it is to use the python programming language to be able to create a tool an ethical hacking tool or a, uh, yeah, a tool for your ethical hacking so this is just the first lesson here talking about how to get ip at the reconnaissance level so we're just being able to create a simple one of the most basic tool for our ethical hacking activity and what it does is just to be able to help us to grab the IP address of a web page so you can change the web address here and it will just help you to give you the IP address so for your reconnaissance so this is a kind of a, so this is a reconnaissance tool that we have been able to develop our first reconnaissance tool so in the next lesson now we'll talk about we'll create another tool uh, which will help us to get the who is address of a particular a web address all right so in the last lesson uh, we, we started off with creating uh, uh, one of our most simplest uh, reconnaissance tool we just uh, two lines of code talking about uh, how to get ip at the reconnaissance uh, stage in this lesson we're going to also be uh, uh, creating another simple 
uh, reconnaissance to using Python, and I'll also show you how to do it with just two lines of code before we proceed further to add other stuff to it. All right. So now I'm gonna just say my who is the next reconnaissance we want to do is a who is to a to a Python tool with which you can use to get at the who is information of a particular web address. Okay, because that is very important. So I, like I said before, the at the reconnaissance stage, you want to gather as much information. It's called the information gathering stage where you have to gather as much information about a particular uh, a company or a particular web address uh, that you are working on. Okay, so now we are talking about uh, in the last lesson, we haven't talked about getting IP. Then the next one to look at is how to get the whois information. Now, uh, normally you are supposed to actually go to whois.com, but you can actually create a, a tool in Python that can help you to conduct whois uh, information gathering. Okay, so to do that is very simple. So first of all, you need to import whois. Now, most of the time, in uh, Kali Linux comes with uh, one version of uh, whois, which may not be able to help you to do what you want to do now. So, for instance, now, if you after importing whois, and uh, you do dir like this to check the contents, you can just do dir. If you don't get the same result, I'm going to get. I'm going to show you what you need to do now. So dir whois. So I'm going to launch the terminal right now launch the terminal i'm going to say python all right uh my who is my who is dot pi all right so okay we're supposed to print it out let's print it out so that we can see all the contents uh so print and uh let's run it all over again so python my who is so you see it shows you all this plenty content so if your version of who is that you imported did not show you all the especially with this particular method in it you should uh, you need to do some installation let me i will show you how to do the installation all right so you need to install the python who is it means you are not having the exact python who is which is needed for this particular lesson so in case you uh, you what in your own version of UIS you are having is not there, you need to do this. You can just do Python. Uh, you do you do a PIP installation of it. So you say PIP install Python UIS. You just run this at the terminal here. Yeah, this will help you to install the Python UIS. This is this particular uh, module we are using here. So you need to install this in case you did not get the particular. Uh, when you did this uh, print there and you didn't get those uh, information printed that exactly or you are when you are using the UIS that you have and you have an issue then you need to install python UIS. all right with that out of the way now so let's quickly see how to get it, the UIS information of a particular website just with uh, a single line now after the importation the second line now we we'll just say UIS. we we'll say print UIS dot UIS call on the whois method and uh, we put in the web address for the now you're going to use that my abandoned blog which i've been using for this because oh, we are not allowed to just begin to work on any website a live website without permission and uh, neither do i also want to make use of my live website okay so this uh this particular way i want to conduct a whois uh operation on it they just they gather uh, the who is information from it using the python so with this i can be able to get the who is information so just go now so python and uh, my who is so we just wait a little while the information are being fetched from the net now so it's going to quickly display so long we have the internet you see we have the internet connection you would also have internet connection for that to work so you see all the server information okay there was an error and i think that was how to do with network so i have to clear and let's do it all over again so uh i will have to check my internet connection yes there's internet connection so we have to run that again so python my who is all right and i'll wait a little while and of course the UIS information comes as so that at least what just happened goes a long way to show you that you need to have internet connection for the for you to contort your UIS operation. So you see now it prints out all the UIS information of that particular 
website just with just two lines of code now just before i close just to make it a little better the information that are here we can actually write instead of just printing them out like this on this uh, terminal to the standard output you can actually write it to the uh to a file which you can get to later to be able to gather your let me just say who so we hold it as a variable so i'm going to come over here right now and uh, hold it so i just call the variable who let's just call it who then uh then uh let's uh do file equal to open all right we've already learned how to write to a file before so i'm going to just bring a file even though the file does not exist i'm going to just scale my who is my who is dot txt so it's written to a test file and uh i open here for writing so w the mode open a w mode all right that is the uh, capital a that w all right it's open okay, i'll just put the w there okay it's open for writing just small letter w uh, you already uh, learned about that so with this the file will be open then once that is done uh, then i want to write it right to the file so let's say if uh, f dot write we want to write the who information there now it must be a string as it will throw error to who if it's written properly then uh it should tell me okay sorry that is there's no curly brace in python we have to use uh so it's supposed to be the same task we're getting here is wrong all right so got to be this if this all right is this then okay then uh, simply print written successfully successfully all right so if uh the writing uh, file dot write so once this file has been written to this particular file here even which doesn't exist and because we have opened it for writing it will create it if it doesn't exist it should give us a message that it has been written to so let's run it right now so let me clear here so it to be clearer now okay so python my who is it will wait a little while it take me a little while to get information from the internet and uh, the rating to the file all right okay so it is being done so all those information have been written to that so that is what we'll see now all the information have been written to this particular file so you can always go back there to check out the who is information of that particular website so instead of printing it to the standard output all right so this is just it how you can use uh python to create a u uh, a who is two okay how to create a who is two using the python language in the very simplest form even when we are writing now you see how simple the codes are just one two three four five lines of code and you are done with that too all right so this is just the two tools we'll just be looking at at the reconnaissance stage so in the next lesson we'll look at how to create some tools also for the second stage of ethical hacking we're talking about uh, uh, scanning all right post scanning and also vulnerability scanning so now over to the next lesson right now uh, so in the last lesson we created a very simple tool talking about uh, using a python programming language to create an uis tool uh, a uis tool uh, for getting information a python tool for getting information of a particular web address using uh, uh, Python, yeah, the who is uh, information about a particular web address uh, using the IP, the IP version 4 of it. Okay, so now I've already started uh, Metasploitable 2 in our VM uh, in a virtual bus, okay, which is uh, Metasploitable. You, you saw when we installed it, we just said the essence of it is for us to be able to, uh, for our test penetration testing exercises, so we need to carry out some of our testing. So for this, what we're going to do here is to first of all check out the IP address of this our Metasploitable uh, VM here. So to do this, we just say 
IF config because uh, which is similar for every other Linux system, IF config. Then, uh, sorry, we have to log in to Metasploitable first. And, uh, okay, so Metasploitable login first of all before any other thing, MSF admin. All right, then MSF admin. All right, so we are logged in first. You need to uh, log in to Metasploitable first. So I made an error then. So I've corrected it now. We first of all log in to the Metasploitable uh, uh, VM before we talk about uh, getting the IP address. So uh, to get the IP address, I just say IF config as against uh, that of Windows. If for Windows, you say IP config. So here it gives us the INET address, which is what I'm interested in, which is 10.0. Point two point fifteen. So this is the IP address of this uh, Metasploit table. All right. So and that's what we're going to be using for our, this particular lesson. So we have to get put this uh, IP address in mind. We have to memorize it for the now. Ten point uh, two ten point zero point two point fifteen. Okay. So that is the, our Metasploit table address. Okay. So I will now move from here now over to our Kali Linux now. The Kali Linux place now I already have a uh, VS Code open, so we want to see how to create another tool here talking about uh, a port scanner. Okay, port scanner. So, there, so I'm going to say port scan, port scan, port scan dot pi, port scan dot pi. All right, to create a port scanner is very easy. Okay, so all you just need to do first of all, we'll start with it. We're going to use a Python socket module. So socket, we import socket, import socket. All right, then the next thing we need to do is to get the address we want to. Okay, for that, we can use an input. Uh, but for the knowledge, just uh, make it uh, manual. You can actually use the input uh, function to get user to give you their input. So address. So for here, we just want to do a local scanning of the our metasploitable framework now you can actually get uh if you want to get a remote address you can use uh, socket dot get host by name if you want to socket uh to uh, for example now let's just say you want to scan uh, my uh you i want to scan a remote uh, website a remote address i could just say get uh socket or get host by name so i put in the web address here say righteous faith dot word press dot com okay so this will get the uh for us so if you want to get the uh the ip version 4 of the uh, remote host you can use it but I, for the particular lesson i want us to see to make use of our metasploitable uh address okay so which i already got which is 10.0.2.15 that is our metasploitable to ip address all right so having gotten that the next we need to do now is just to simply do a port scanning. So for port, you use a for loop. So for port in range, the range of IP address we want to add, uh, scan. Now IP address can range to from 1 to 65,535. But we will not be able to have the time to do all that. So I'm not going to be scanning from range 500 to 65,000. 535 which is the this uh the port size okay all right then so for port in range this so we say i will now create a socket object here socket dot socket dot uh socket dot socket then we'll put in the address so socket passing the parameter a f i net talking about the IP address, uh, the IP address family talking about IP version four, then socket dot sock stream. We are going to do a TCP uh, protocol. We want to use TCP uh, connection here. Sock stream. All right. Socket dot sock stream. All right. Then once that is done, okay. Maybe before the connection is go goes on, let's just print and say scanning uh scanning scanning target at okay let's just put uh, the address here we are scanning this address here 
address let's just say the address then uh we just put some uh, colon uh, some uh, ellipsis dots why the thing is still scanning okay so while we are here we now say uh if okay let's just get result using the connection now result equal to uh connect socket dot connect okay let's just change this one to make it more clearer let's just use the variable s instead of calling it socket too so that it will be just clearer okay socket dot connect x okay then we we'll pass it the uh address address and uh, the port or the port from the that will be scanning then we we'll come over here and say if result equal to zero which uh, which shows uh for this connect x the result is equal if result equal to zero that means success so why the result is equal to zero all right then we'll say print we print the uh just say print f okay uh port we'll call the name of the port 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 which is this port in this loop here that's all the port that we uh, open will be uh, shown here okay so we we'll call out the port then port this is open all right then once that is done we want to be able to close the uh the socket object so if this you should print that then socket should be closed so close all right so we'll close the socket now then we cannot run it so let's do that we can be able to modify that code later but first of all let's ensure it's working first by running the code so let's go now so python so we call it uh that is port can port scan dot pi port scan dot pi so let's go right now so you see scanning target at which is a meta exploitable that is already open it takes some time so it's it scans but for some reasons it didn't print it out so we have to do that again so if result equal to this we'll print this so we have to just run this can so it's ports ports can dot pi so let's go all over again so python port can dot pi okay and uh, once is the scanning is done okay so we see the first time the scanning didn't work now the second time it was so it says port port the five five three thirty four is open so this is it and uh, we now have see how to use uh, to do port scanning we have been able to scan the our meta exploitable framework now to make this code a little more robust we can actually do some uh, error catching okay by just coming over here now you can use a try and catch statement to catch some error that are likely to occur while running the uh, scan so i just use a tab here and uh, come over here right now at the bottom here uh except uh, so the error one of the error that can come is in case it didn't connect for the connection failure we want to be able to catch it gai error gai error we say print uh connect there was a connection field so it should be able to report errors to us okay the connection field okay that's one error that can come up then sys dot exist we need to import the sys uh module sys dot exit so for this we need to import the sys module so that the system can just easily exit once that error is encountered so port dot sys so we have imported sys 
all right so that the system will not throw error so the module is there now so the another exception we can catch amongst others is and say keyboard keyboard or key uh interrupts okay let's just leave this exception for the now let's just this should be enough just for the example I want to do now to just save us some time okay so they could interrupt it maybe uh um uh, typing maybe control c and the scanning could be interrupted but for the now this should be enough to save our time right now all right so except socket dot gai error so uh and if there if this kind of error is encountered the system should as uh, so we should be able to handle some uh, exception but i want to make the code as simple as possible all right so that is going as so python port scan dot pi okay all right so okay it seems uh, there is an error somewhere in line nine so let's see line nine okay uh, okay so for this okay, it well we have an indentation error there so hence we added exception a block we had to mine the indentation so the indentation have been done properly now so that error should disappear right now so let's run it again now uh the copy and paste right here and uh so let's run out over again so the port is scanning it's scanning right now so we just wait a while see okay that port was seen open so only one port was open again at this time of this scan so basically this is how you do port scanning in a pi and using python so you see now we just use the, the socket module you get the address you can use if you want to do a remote address uh, i already told you what to do you can just do socket or get us by name so that i can grab a remote uh, address but i, I just use this uh, particular lesson now to show you how to work with your meta exploitable uh, free, uh, VM which we have already installed for the sake of testing and once you got the address you can press something to show the the, thing, uh, the scanning and progress then you uh, you do uh, a for loop then inside the for loop you are able to do your port scanning so this is the end of this lesson on port scanning in the last lesson we talked about uh, how to do port scanning using the socket uh, python socket module then in this lesson, we're going to be looking at another powerful way of doing post scanning in, in Python using the Python programming language. Now, the, for that, we're going to be talking about how to use, in this lesson, we're going to talk about how to use the Nmap uh, module, Python Nmap module. All right. Uh, so I'm going to call this Nmap scan or Nmap scanner.py. All right. Now, the Nmap module. Is a very popular uh, open source uh, post scanner that is used for ethical hacking penetration testing. All right, uh, as, matter, as a matter of fact, it is already inbuilt into Kali Linux. There's a, already an inbuilt version of it in the Kali Linux. But uh, like I said already, uh, this course concentrates on how to use the Python programming language to create custom ethical hacking tools. So we're not going to be making use of the Kali Linux. Uh, the one that is already built into Kali Linux. Rather, we're going to be using the one that is inside the, the Python uh, module, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that is, uh, the Nmap uh, Python module talk, they're called Python Nmap. All right. Now, for you to be able to make use of uh, the Python Nmap, you need to first of all do a, an installation of it because it's not built into Python. All right. Now I've already done the install. Now you have to do to install it. All you need to do is to just say pip install python nmap, and that will help you quickly install the nmap uh, python module into your uh, your working uh, environment here. Okay, so I already got it installed, so I'm not going to be able to. I won't run this, but for you to install it, you just need to run this pip install python nmap, and this will help you to get it installed. All right, so let me close this now. So now that it's already installed, the first next thing we need to do now to make use of nmap, I just need to import nmap. So the, the module is imported first. Then the next thing you need to do now is to create an instance of the nmap. Let's just say nmap. Okay. So using the post scanner method. So just say nmap. Nmap dot port scanner. There are other methods. Okay. 
Are you, for instance, if you want to do uh, 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 do your pulse scanning in asynchronous mode, you can do port, uh, pulse scanner async. But now I'm not going to do that. Just make use of this. So we can just go ahead here and do the pulse scanning. Okay. Well, before you scan, you need to get the host where you need to uh, that you want to scan. Now you can use a remote host. But like I've often said, you are not supposed. You shouldn't conduct scanning. You are not supposed to conduct scanning on a, a network or an application that you do not have uh, uh, permission to do so. So for that, uh, this particular lesson, we're going to just make use of. We can add up scan our uh, locally. Okay, we can scan, uh, scan our local machine here by calling on this IP. Okay, this host here, or we can use our Kali Linux. Uh, ip address any of the object above is okay but let, for this one let's just make use of this uh a local host here uh, on our local machine so let's go now to scan it become very easy all you just need to do now you just say print uh says you call on the end map instance there instance variable then you say scan you call on the scan method then the scan method require that you pass it the host which is that IP address we're going to be working with, we already defined it there, then we will pass it the range of IP you want to scan. So let's say we just want to scan just from 70, 72 down to 480 just to save our time. So do this within this range, we want to scan within this range. Okay, so this will help us to do the scanning, but when we do this, it's going to print out a dictionary uh, of values or different values of information okay then once we are done with this i don't want to use it on, let's just see how these functions first then we'll look for that better way i'll show you a better way to do the presentation using a loop okay so for the now uh, we we'll come over here now and uh, say python uh, and map scan and map scanner that is the name of the file and map scanner dot pi so it scans through it, okay? So look at it, it brings in a kind of a JSON uh, data containing a whole lot of information which we cannot be able to really, if you go through them, you're able to see all the information it has brought about our host, especially telling you about the open pores and the closed pores and several other information. All right, so it is very effective way of doing uh, port uh, scanning. Now, let's for example, now let's want to also uh, scan this uh, uh, this our uh, meta exploitable framework uh, meta exploitable VM uh, port here. So let us uh, the whole the meta the VM machine there. Let's just see how we can scan it too. You can just place, place this here. So once you are already getting uh, able to grab an IP address, like we learned already in uh, in the getting IP. Uh, lesson you can be able to just get the IP you'll be able to do the conduct the scanning using the IP so I'm going to come over here now so let's do the scanning on the our meta exploitable so let me just uh, clear this so Python okay, and map scanner so it's going to give us it will help us to scan the ports for our meta exploitable VM all right so now this is done already now to make make it more presentable now let's uh, look for a way now to make it more presentable for the information to be uh, better off so the, all we don't need to want to do now from all those uh, plenty information that have been brought let's just see how we can just get only the state that is just to know whether a particular port is open or closed so for that the ip that we're going to start i'm going to just say start uh, the port we want to scan let's say the beginning we'll say start uh, start from 72 and uh, and at 80 okay then we'll do the scanning we we'll just have to do the scanning in a loop so we'll say for v in range okay uh start which is uh, talking about uh uh 72 then and 80 now we want to make sure that 80 is inclusive so we need to increment it by one to make ht inclusive because if we end it at just end 80 will not be inclusive in the range so it will end at 79 so for 80 to be inclusive in the post scan you have to add one to that increment the end value by one so okay so let's go now 
Now the next thing we need to do now, so let's the first thing we need to do now, let's have use a variable now to do the scan and now just exactly the same way this is here. So I'll come over here and say my scan. Okay, let's create a variable called my scan. Let's just make it this way, my scan equal to nm scan. We pass it the uh the host. Then for this particular one, I want to do the first scanning one after the other in the loop. So now the the uh, the ports, as you can see here, must be a string. So we have to type cast the, the value of v to a string. So we just call the stray uh, function to so type cast v the values of v here in the loop, the value of v to a string. All right. So now going for that, the next thing we need to do now is now to do to pick in all those dictionary of information, assess the state of it. So we we'll just say let's say result, okay, the result of the state, right, the state result. So for that, from that dictionary of values or JSON value, we we'll to want to locate the uh, the only the state of of the uh, the port that have been scanned. So for that, you just come over here and say scan. Then we get the host's name, which is the IP address. Then going for that, we locate ECP. Okay. Then going for that, then the V, the value of V. Okay, for so that we can delete that is the port number. In okay, we, we also add uh, pick the port number. All right. Then finally. We locate the state of that port. So this will just give us the state of the port, whether the port is closed. So from that uh, long addition, uh, that uh, plenty information that was brought out earlier when we ran this, the only thing we will use this now to pick out is just the state of the of the port that is being scanned, whether the port is closed or open. All right. So now let's go now and I say print. Print F so that we can be able to add both uh, all the strings and the variables along together very easily. So let's say port. Okay, particular all the ports are being held with V in this loop now. So port V is result. So the result variable will tell us will show us whether it is open, the port is open or not. So let's run this now. So this will give us a more presentable. Uh, output okay, from the terminal now so let's run so python python uh and map and map scanner dot pi okay so wait a while to be scanning okay say so it tells you port 72 is closed port 73 is closed port 74 is closed port 75 is closed Port 76 is closed, port 77 is closed, port 78 is closed, port 79 is closed, and finally port 80 is closed. So basically, this is how you do port scanning using the Nmap uh, model. All right, very powerful, and it's an open source uh, model uh, library, which uh, is often used for security scanning all right so this uh, this is the end of this lesson on how to use uh, the nmap library or module for uh for scanning in the python in python all right so this is the end of this lesson so in uh, now this concludes our field to the two tools we want to build at uh, the scanning phase of our ethical hacking of the ethical hacking phase okay so in the next lesson i'll be looking at how to create a simple attacking to exploitation or access gaining access to using the python programming language so now this is the end of this lesson so in the last lesson we talked we were able to see how to create a, an nmap uh, scanner port scanner so in this lesson we quickly going into how to create a password cracker at the gaining access or exploitation phase of ethical hacking all right
Now, before go talking about this, now I, will, I will have to let you know that there are several tools already available in Kali Linus and all over the internet that can help you easily with uh, effective password cracking. Now, for example, now in this particular tool session, when you click here now, all right, uh, for the tools, yeah, so that is what is called application sessions. You'll be able to see here at the password attacks category, you see a whole lot of password cracking tools such as uh, uh, you can see something like Hydra, you can see John, John the Ripper, and the rest of them, uh, Medusa, ETC, word list. Now, these tools are here yeah, and they are all very effective. These tools here for uh, password cracking. But like I said earlier uh, in our, our former lesson, that the essence of this lesson is, is to teach you how to be able to use the Python programming language to be able to create your own custom ethical hacking tools. Then even if you don't want to create your own ethical, custom ethical hacking tool, at least you'll be able to modify the already existing one to add in your own functionality. All right? Then if that is not actually your ambition to then, you should also, at least if you're able to know, understand with your, your knowledge of all these things now, with your little knowledge of uh, the little uh, knowledge you are getting from the production of this, uh, uh, the creation of these custom tools here, if you're able to understand now, it will give you a better understanding of what is happening under the hood in those tools that you are using. So that the things, the tools you are using doesn't appear as if they are just magic. Okay? So that is the essence of it. So that you don't remain a, what we call, refer to as script kiddos or your, or your, uh, you know, your hacking, ethical hacking uh, adventure. So that is the essence. So in this lesson, we'll be talking about how to create a simple uh, eth, uh, password cracker, and which also demonstrates to you the major uh, science or mechanism behind, uh, logic behind password cracking. Most of the password cracking tools are available, okay? So now in this approach, we're going to be working about talking about a, a brute force attack using word list, okay? Now, a little time to give you a little understanding. I've divided this lesson to, into two just to, uh, for you to get a better understanding of it. For, uh, so this one will be the part one of it. So in this particular part, we're just going to do, take a little part of it. So now let's talk about a brute force attack. What does a brute force attack mean? A brute force attack means it can, it's a trial by error way or method of trying to guess a password by just trying out different possible uh, password that could actually be the right password. And most uh, applications on the internet have been compromised through this approach. So you need to have a good understanding of it, especially in your ethical hacking or cybersecurity uh, career. Very important. Brute force. Guessing a password through trial by error approach. Now, so that's important. Then again, the next thing you need to understand is that passwords are often hashed or hashing that the passwords that are used in applications are not stored as plain tests. No. Oftentimes, most developers, especially experienced developers, they store the, the, the password that their users use in a database in hashed form. So now, then when the, 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 when the user wants to log in to the membership area or the admin area, they, the, the, as the user type puts, uh, imputes the password, a hash of that password that is inputted is created, then the hash is now compared with the hash of the password that is already in the database. And once the, both of them are the same, then an access is given. All right. So now, so that is the same, that mechanism is what we're now trying to do. So what we do now in the particular lesson now is we'll have a kind of a database, a kind of a word list, a storage of a, a passwords where we, uh, we attempt to where we will now uh, try to guess all the passwords that are inside, okay? So we we'll get them, then we we'll, we'll put in our password, then compare, we we'll check through the word list to see if the password we added will be able to match, okay? So now before then now, the first one we're going to take now, we want to first of all in this particular part, we want to see how to create password hashing, how to hash a password because we we'll have the hash of the password that is in the in our database or in our. Uh, a place where we store our data, yeah, is our database for the now, which is going to be a file for the next test file. Then we we'll also be able to see how to hash them because both of them have to be hashed. Then before we we'll now compare them, so that the essence at the end of the day is that we'll be able to get a better understanding of how password cracking tools work. And then also, be in case you also want to create your own custom uh, uh, password cracker, you'll be able to have a better understanding. 
So for this particular lesson, in this first part, uh, whether in the for this whole uh, tool I want to create, I want to in, to use the concept of uh, uh, classes as uh, object oriented programming, so that you, at least to give you a better understanding of how classes and objects are applied in uh, in practice. In practice, okay. Although we have learnt it in a formal lesson talking about classes and objects, so now I want to see uh, show you in this particular use this particular tool now to show you how to apply it. All right, so for this particular lesson, so we're going to create a class called Cracker. All right, I'm going to call it Cracker. All right, so now in this particular part, this part one, we're just going to create only a method that helps us with the uh, the hashing of a password, so that we can pass a, pass a, a password parameter, then it will be able to hash it. So let's say uh, uh, password hashing method all right so let's go now so i'm going to uh, uh, so use the def keyword then i say p hash let's call it p hash that is password hashing okay so hash our password and i pass it the self parameter referring to the current object of the class which is uh necessary for creating a method in the class all right so here uh the next parameter I want to collect, the only parameter we want to be uh, passing in as argument here at the point of call is the password parameter. All right. So what we just want this to do is to return. Then once the password, once we grab a password, we pass in a password, a test, plain test password, it should be able to hash it. Okay. And to do that, for us to be able to hash, we need to have a library called a Python library called hash lib. So we just import hash lib hash lib which will help us to do the uh hashing password hashing so we just come over here to hash it you just say return we call on the uh hash lib library okay so we say return hash lib hash lib dot we're not putting the algorithm we want to use we can use either uh two five six or uh, SHA-1. Now let's just make use of SHA-1. There are several other algorithms. There is Bcrypt and RipeMD and the rest of them. All right. But for this lesson, to make it as simple as possible, we're using one of the most vulnerable algorithms talking about SHA-1. Okay. So let's, let's come over here now. So the password that will be passed, uh, that will be added as argument, we want to encode it first. Okay. Uh, it will be encoded. First, so once we have encoded it, we want the character that will be returned to be in hexadecimal form. So we'll call the eggs digest method, which will help us to turn the the password, the, the encoded password uh, with the, uh, the SHA-1 into a hexadecimal uh, character. That is, it will be made up of num uh, numeric and uh, uh, that is alphanumeric uh, digits. So with this now, because this is what we want to end this lesson. Let's just see how this hash will be uh, appearing now. So I'm going to move down here and uh, create an instance of this class. So we already got in the class. The next thing we need to do is to create the object. So so create uh, uh, guys instantiate instantiate the cracker class. That is to create an object from it. You need to instantiate. Okay. So let's say p word cracker let's call let use this as the instance uh, variable now so we're going to come here and say cracker so this gives us an instance of the cracker uh, uh, class all right so the next thing we need to do now we need to grab okay let's just call first before we talk about uh, the password now so let's just use a uh, pw cracker which is our object now to reference p hash just to show you how the p hash uh, the hashing algorithm works uh, how the hashing a, a method works so here yeah, i'm going to pass it a password so we need to pass it a password as argument so let's say pw okay so now to grab this password let me make it a little dynamic so that uh I'll make it interactive so that a user will be able to type in the password and uh, we grab it and make use of we want to pass it in so that place now. So here we just use the input method, input as function, which we talked about in the formal lesson. So let's say enter a pass 
word. Okay, enter a password. So that's the instruction to the user. So once the user pass, uh, passes the password, we want to print out the password the user passed as a hash. We want to hash it and print it out. So let's print it out using this method just for you to see how the hash looks like. So now with this, now let's just run our uh, run the code now on the terminal now. So I'm going to open the terminal as we round up this first part of the lesson. Okay, so Python uh password cracker dot pi so we'll say enter a password let's just say tennis because uh, many users are fond of using only single words and like that so all right so you see now a hash of the tennis has been created so this is simply what hashing are you hash a a password so this in often time when developer develop application this is what they do so the the, the password you the plain test is hash and put in the database then when the user now wants to put in a new one uh, to log in they also hash the password and compare the hashes together and see if they correspond then and access is given so basically so this is the end of this particular this first part of this uh, password cracker lesson when the next lesson will complete the code that and be able to see how to you know they complete the the, the password uh, cracking uh, too and adding by adding other methods uh, that will help us to complete the brute force attack so uh in the last lesson we have been able to in the last first part we we're able to create our hash hashing uh, method so i'm going to clear this so in now in this particular uh, lesson we'll be completing the the password cracker okay so the next method we want to create here is a method that will help us to read reading uh, reading the word list reading a word list as a list of uh, exposed passwords uh, which have already been collected and put in some files that are available online most of them are available in github you can get them in github I've already gotten some of them some of the urls or with some of this word list okay so for this particular uh, method, what we do now, we just say, let's say, read word list. Let's call it this way. Let's call the name of the method this. Read word list. So as usual, you pass it because you're in a class contest. Pass it the self parameter first. Then the next thing we want to get is the URL of the, uh, the word list. Or we can just say word, or let's say word list word list url okay that's a parameter we we'll have to pass it the word list url so now to do this when they bring the word list what we want to do first of all is to read it to open the url to have for that to happen we need to import another method another uh, uh, stuff that we did there yeah. okay another very important method talk about uh, so from uh, url lib using the python uh, url lib uh, module url lib dot request okay we are going to import url the url open uh, method url url open okay all right so in this place so we use the url open method here to open the word list url that will be passed in word list url then we just call on the read method to read it to read all right then after reading uh, we want to read it then we decode it it, should, it will be encoded so we have to decode it and uh, we have to uh, decode it from utf8 encod encoding then finally we want to br uh, break the lines we want to uh, 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 split them into the, the words into uh, into a list of new lines 
okay now this particular url that we're going to do we have one right that we're going to use to test here which i've had here okay i have two of them here yeah this one contains uh, up to uh, 1575 probable words uh, passwords and yeah this particular one has up to 1 million words now i'll be using this one to save our time okay so there are a lot of these uh, word list url available on the internet you can just go to the internet and just type a word list for password cracking and they tap it on google and a lot of them will be brought out for you so but the body now i have only two here but i'll be using the first one here for the particular lesson now let's see how these passwords uh, these words look like now i've gotten one of them open here okay so here we are going to have uh, okay so right here we have a lot of words here thousands of them if i open the other one now you're going to see uh, up to a million of them this particular one has millions of them so that's what we're going to be using for the now so okay now returning back so this one will help us to split lines or you can actually go this other approach you can just split then we can use a new line a character to do that by saying this this will also work any of them will work okay so let's make use of this one okay so this one will help us to get the uh the word list we'll pass it the word list url here yeah? At the point of call then we we'll use url open to open it then read it decode it in utf8 encoding from usdf8 encoding then be able to split it into a list for us to be able to look through okay once we have done that the next thing we need to do we can now go ahead to do our brute force great do okay let's just say do brute force at a uh, uh, brute force cracking so let's do the proper the brute force cracking now so we'll now create a method that will help us to do that so let's say brute force or let's say brute forcer okay so self yeah for the brute force i need to get the word list url let's say word url okay or let's say word list uh, we'll pass it the word list word let's say word url okay let me just complete it word list url again uh, even though there's already a parameter there but let's still use it all the same then yeah the guest guest password the password or uh, or uh, yes guest password so let's use that now so we come over here now and uh, the first thing we need to do is to just put a uh, the uh, hash of the password. So let's say guest hash. We need to hash it first. This particular password will be guest. Yeah, so I think I made a mistake here. So guest. Okay. Guest password. So we're going to call on our hash. Hash method. Yeah. So I'm um, so refer to that. We need to use itself. So self p of hash and we want to hash the guest password guest password then the para this parameter will be hashed so once we are hashed that then we can now go over to doing a simple loop our for loop say for guest we have already guest password so say guest pw okay in word list url if self dot p hash the hash of the guest p but we need to hash it while we are trying to do the comparison so if it's equal to the guest hash which is a particular one guest hash if it's equal to this one i will also hash too then we should be able to say now it will print the the password as your pass let's say your password your password is 
So now I have to pass it the the placeholder for the password, which is guess guess b w. Okay, we we bring out the plain test of it, which was entered. Then we can just say okay, try. So I just say uh, it was easy. Okay. it was easy to be guessed try to change it okay so that will give us the message of if the password once we guess the password correctly okay now once that is done the system should exit okay we exit the application then but if that is not possible, we should also print a message saying we could not, we could not guess the password. All right. So once this is done, we are ready to check out things. So now let's make use of them in this particular place now. So for us to be able to use the the guest password we need to use the word list. So read word list. So that is the first we need to do first. So we we'll come over here uh, to read our word list. Now this is not necessary anymore. I've already seen that. So let's say word URL. So like I said, I've already gotten the links available. The URL. This one contains the. This is the one I intend using. So I'm going to copy it now. So we'll come over here now and paste and of course we have to make it a string it has to be a string okay and so once this is done the next thing we need to do now is to be able to read it using our method so, so let's come over here and say word list reader or reading let's put it that way so we're going to come over here and call in the method that will help us to read it which is read word list read word list okay and now we have to use the, our object to locate it which is pw cracker dot this so it has to read all right so we have to call in a word url okay and let's just uh, break it down to make it clearer pw cracker that is our object we are using it to reference the read word list method Okay, and we are passing the parameter. So finally, we now call on the the what we do the brute force, which is so we say uh, uh, B W cracker dot a uh, brute. For, that's called the name of the function now. The method there rather is brute forcer. The brute forcer. Brute forcer, then the parameters it takes are a password, word list first, which is this word list reading we're going to put here. Word list reading. And it also takes the password, the guest password, which is going to be the PW, which is the input that will be passed here. Okay, so with this now, we are ready to test our password, complete password cracker now. So here now, so Python and uh, password cracker dot pi. The prompt source, so I'm going to put in tennis again. All right, so wait a while. And uh, okay, your password is, it seems we made some mistake there in passing it. Okay, so let's see where we missed it. So your password is 
this okay we didn't put f for the formatting so i'm going to do that again that was just what was missing so password dot by so copy just copy it to make it easier now so paste and uh, let's run it again now so let's put in again tennis so wait a little while now okay so you see it it was able to crack it say enter a a password we put in tennis and it says tennis it was easy to be guessed try to change it your password is tennis okay your password is tennis okay, let me just put a, a full stop there okay it was easy to be guessed we try to change it so yeah let me come over again now let me just put something like uh uh, let's go through that word uh, let's just put the tennis again now uh, let's just say mario another simple password again so well, let's see it so you see mario was cracked so your password is mario it was easy to be guessed try to change it so basically this is the mechanism uh the the logic behind password cracking okay so with this, we have been able to take it, uh, you know, see an example of an exploitation to uh, an ethical hacking exploitation to so in the next lesson, we'll just be taking a, a seeing how to create a, one of our, the last uh, example of uh, uh, two we're going to be creating with Python in this course will be how to create a, uh, a backdoor. Uh, in our last lesson, we talked about uh, how to create a password cracker. Now talking about the gaining access stage of uh, ethical hacking. Then another stage at the last, uh, the, at the fourth phase of ethical hacking that like we talked about, we talked about maintaining access. Now, using a password cracker, you could actually crack password and gain access. Then maybe before you accomplish your what you want to do, you, your your activity may easily be dis, uh, discovered and the password could be changed, and you may not have been able to accomplish your uh, exploitation activity before you know the password is changed or other ways. Now, what are the ways? Through which, so and for that and for that kind of purpose, you need to have a way of maintaining access to the computer even without a password or even when the password has been changed, so that you can be able to have kind of a remote access to the computer, to be able to carry out your assignment, to be able to carry out your uh, hacking exploitation, your ethical hacking exploitation effectively, so that you are able to have something to pre uh, present uh, to your person that hired you as an evidence. Okay, so in order to do that, uh, one of the most effective and most subtle post-exploitation tool, which is also called it, which is a tool for uh, maintaining access, is called what we call backdoor. A backdoor. Now, what is a backdoor? Now, let me create the first file. First. Let's say uh, target, uh, target, target backdoor, so that we can leave this particular scene of the password cracker pack that's not say target target uh, target back door back door dot pi all right target back door dot pi now what is a back door a back door is simply a program or an application which is used to gain remote access to a computer to a particular computer machine okay to use it to get a remote access Especially, uh, then you're able to now, once you gain the remote access, you're able to control the, the computer, the machine that you have gained access to using shell, often using shell command. Okay? Now, increasing the backdoor, two programs or two components are needed. And it follows the concept of uh, uh, socket, or, uh, uh, network programming, which we talked about when we were learning the uh, normal concept of uh, uh, Python programming. So we're in, we, we are using the concept of a socket programming, that is a, a network programming, to be able to, you, you, uh, to create a backdoor, you use the concept of network programming or socket programming, which I've been taught. So now that is if you want to do it in using a, as we are doing it using a, the Python programming language. So which means it follows the, the, the server client uh, approach. Okay, now the client uh, app, uh, application or the client program is what we use for creating the victim or the target uh, application. So it's the application that will be deposited in the victim's machine 
which we with which we'll be able to use to communicate with uh, uh with the machine to be able to get the resources to be able to exploit the machine as much as we want okay so in creating a backdoor you have to create two application one for the target machine or the victim machine which will be deposited there through several means can be deposited through video through open source applications through uh, uh different different means even through videos and uh, several other means it can be sneaked into the uh, the victim's machine without their knowing even games that people download all over the net so that's why when you are downloading things on the internet you have to be very careful and even at, apart from that then also your computer system uh, you have to configure it the firewall effectively to, uh, to be able to know the kind of uh, application that will be run uh, will be uh, uh, given the uh, the privilege of running or not because the what we're going to be creating now a backdoor is one of the most subtle one of the most uh, you know dangerous uh, application program that is used for attacking a machine all right so we want to learn in this particular lesson how to be able to create your own custom backdoor even though like i said there are uh, even though like the password uh, tool like we talked about there are also several uh, inbuilt uh, backdoor uh, applications that are already available in our Kali Linux. If you see, look at the application, uh, uh, this uh, application icon here now. You'll be able to go to post exploitation here. You see a lot of backdoors are here, you know, standard one which you can use effectively. But like we said, you need to also have a, a way of be able to create your own tools. You don't always want to depend on third party tools, and you don't always want them to be looking as if. They are magic that are using them so how are these tools created that is what we are learning in this python course and this is going to be the last like i said this is the last tool we're going to be creating for this course all right so now so in in creating a backdoor the first tool we need to create here is the client or the victims application which is going to be a client application so to do that we follow the uh, normal process we use a python socket module which we've talked about before then to be able to, when I want to be the application, the client should be able to help us to execute some uh, shell command. So for that, we need to import another powerful module called sub process. Sub process. Okay, that will help us to execute our uh, Python, uh, uh, our shell command that we are going to be writing from the server. Okay, but in this particular lesson, we are just looking at how to create the target first, which is the victim client, uh, client application for the backdoor application we are, a program we are creating now so once we've gotten this created now the next thing we need to do now is follow due uh, normal uh, process of a uh, socket creation now of course we know that uh, uh, the client application of a socket program all has only one main method that is specific to a client so for the first time first we need to do now is to create a word a client uh, a socket uh, object so how to create a socket object Okay, before going further so create a socket object so here right now you're also going to say let's say uh, let's call it clients uh, let's say clients that's enough so socket we call on the socket module dot socket okay we can leave it at this or we go ahead and uh, put in all the family af underscore inet and uh, a the socket uh, TCP uh, type we're going to be using a, a TCP that is socket stream okay so once this is done uh, we have a client uh, ob uh, socket object now so what we need to have the host which will be the host uh, uh, they are, they are the local IP address so we create a host which will be using to uh, which the client will be connecting to uh, the the server host okay and uh, we come over here we let you use one two seven talking about the local machine uh, host name host ip so we come over here now and talk about the port so for this we can choose any port we like we said before so let's just say then okay, the port has to be a number so for 3040 for instance we can use that we can use 3040 or anyone you want any of the ports okay within the range of 1 to 65535 all right you can choose any port you want to use there so i chose to use that port then the next thing we need to do now is to connect the client need to connect to client uh 
dot connect okay so we just come over here and say client dot connect then we come over here and put in uh, the host client will have to connect through the host and the port okay so before connection we may need to just print some message and say uh client waiting client are waiting connection from the server okay then once we are call on the client method here we can come over here and say uh print that is once the the connection has been successfully done so say we can just print and say a uh, client connected connected uh, to server out awaiting commands okay just for us to be able to be getting some information on what is going on on the background then once this is done the next thing we need to do now is to use a loop a an infinite loop to be able to uh, get the information we want so once this uh, is established so we need to get a client so let's use the audit uh, uh let's just call it command so let's make sure our indentation is right so let's say command so it will have to receive a, a command a command from the server so dot receive the receive method so we have to receive uh, a command that's at a will not have it let's just give it a buffer size here of uh, one gig so then once that is done the next thing we need to do is to execute the command that have been given all right so let's get the command so let's say sub process so we say uh, then come over here and say uh sub process which is the module we've imported already dot pop open e open okay this method will help you to read the our help us to read the command so, so we'll come over here and put in the command that have been fired Okay, then we say shell equal to true. Then we need to get the standard error. Standard error. We say sub process dot pipe. Okay, then here uh, the next one again is the standard uh, output std out okay so we say sub process dot pipe again so these are majorly the parameters you need to put in place you pass all these arguments to be able to read to be able to execute the that this will help us to execute the shell uh, command so once this is done the next thing we need to do now is to get the error so let's say error output so that we can be able to send it out error output so for this you just uh, come over here sub uh, dot uh, st error equal to dot uh, read we read the error if there's any error we read then uh, output let's say main output output so we have to get it over to the the server back so it will read the error if there's any error message in the process of execution of the command and sub dot st out okay dot uh, read okay so it will read the right uh, output that will be sent back to the server then once that is done now the next thing we need to do so we can now uh, uh, send it out so we call on the our client to send out to stand, send send uh, we call on the send method it will send both uh, 
the error output as well as the main output okay so once this is done our client application is now ready so this is will be for the this is the uh uh the target or the victims application that will be stored in the victims machine so let's run it to see if it's okay okay uh, although it's going to die down uh, it's going to break out because of uh, there's no server the server is not running server is supposed to connect to so after a while it's going to cut off so let's what all this let's run it and see it working fair before we go over in the next lesson we'll create the the server application so python uh call this is target backdoor dot pi okay okay so you see now okay host is not defined did you mean host okay we made a mistake in the process of connecting so let's just connect that okay so it's actually this particular place all right so we have to come over here and uh, host okay so once that is done now so let's run the command again now it's so um, Copy this, paste it. Okay, so okay, so there, there's no connection. All right. Now, however, uh, because the uh, information, okay, so this is it for uh, the target machine. So for the now, the the host is not running. So therefore. Uh, there's an issue here so connection refused that right, because the server is not running so this is first of all how we create the the client uh, application or that the victim application so this application is what should be fired or should be installed into the victim's machine or the remote machine in order to gain uh, a remote uh, then when with the server through this uh, client we're able to get a remote access especially a high level access to the the victim's machine you know the high level access in this course it talks about administrative access which is the uh, ultimate goal of uh, hacking okay so now this is the end of this lesson so in the next lesson we'll, we'll be able to complete uh, we'll be able to we'll create the server and uh, we'll be able to also complete uh, what is also missing in whatever is missing also in this client application in order for all our backdoor application uh, program to be complete so this is the end of this lesson over to the next one right now and so uh, in the last lesson we we're able to create our uh, victim or target uh, backdoor application so in this lesson we want to quickly see how to create a server the backdoor server let's say uh, back, uh, backdoor okay attacker or let's say attack attack backdoor so which is what the attacker which will can be used this this now this particular application is what enable us to be attacking the the uh, the client so to be able to send message and receive receiving information and be commanding sending command to the client to be able to execute on the exploited uh, machine where the machine where the target uh, our client is uh, installed or running okay so for this to create a, a server we follow normal uh, socket module uh, socket uh, approach of creating server uh, uh, a server so for that we also import a socket that's all we need and with that we just also go ahead and create uh, a socket object here almost socket dot socket and uh, we come and we'll do the same thing we did for that let's just say af inet and uh, it should be a tcp connection as well so dot sock stream so it's a tcp connection so once we've gotten that we need to also specify the host which uh, will be presenting for the uh, the client to connect to which the client is already listening uh, connecting to uh, waiting to connect to which is a local host ip then the port so the port is 30 40 we'll make this available for the client to connect to and once this is done the next thing we need to do is to quickly bind to bind the hosts 
uh, the port and the, the host and the port. Okay, so here we come over and say host and uh, port. Okay, so uh, we can now give a message and say print, uh, say uh, server binded to uh, a host. Let's just put the name of the host already binded to this host. Okay. So once this is done, the next step is simply to begin to listen. Okay, server has to begin to listen. So server dot listen. We make sure you just listen to only the client, only one application in this context now. So server dot listen. So we can now print and say uh, the server, the server is listening at port okay, let's say at port I'll put the port let's put colon here so it will be listening at this port port number yes yeah? so it's listening okay right then the next thing we need to do now is to get the accept method so the client address, the client itself and the client address. Okay, then we we'll use the, the server dot accept, call on the accept method. Okay, so with this, the, uh, the, the server is listening. So once that is done, the next thing we need to do is to, in a loop, we'll be able to create a loop from where we'll be sending command and receiving response from the client so for the first thing we need to do here is to uh, command okay so here we use the impute method to be able to use uh, commands so yes uh, the input so the user is able to put his input the command here as an input so we can say enter a command enter a shell or let's say enter a command okay okay enter a command that should be enough for the now so you, you put your command there and once you get the command a command will be sent okay then once we're getting the command right now then we need to do uh, uh send the command out so send so we call on uh, client dot send send a command but at this juncture we have to encode the command okay so encode right so its command is encoded so once that is as the command is sent we also want to look a way to to receive it back so client dot receive okay so it will receive and uh, it will have to have uh, the way put the, uh, the buffer size and when it is receiving it will also need to decode it okay so decode and so what it receives we need to print it and let's say output output from the or the response let's call it response response from the client so once this response is gotten we have to now print out so print response response here so print response okay so with this we are able to get our server application done now for uh, because we are decoding the uh, well, the what we send to the clients who also need the clients also need to decode too okay so in this place now the clients need to decode as well so this is we have to put this in place so as it is now we have our client application we have our server now so we can now run the boat now so for this the target application will go over to 
to run it on the uh, we'll start first of all by running our server here so we'll come over here and uh, we'll say python and guys attack backdoor dot pi okay so it's listening at that port so we'll go over to uh our terminal now to so begin to run uh, another application here right now so let's create an open another terminal for this so we'll just open another terminal uh, okay so in this terminal now we'll navigate our python this thing is here so we have here so at the desktop to so cd desktop to so cd uh, python so while we are at the python here we can now run our command here for so python and uh, the name of the file let's get to know the name of the file again the name of the file we want to run is the client. So while the server is running, we need to call it backdoor.py. So we'll be running backdoor.py, yeah? So, so it's gonna be backdoor, target underscore backdoor rather, target, target underscore backdoor.py. Okay, it's connected. So the client is uh, connected to our server. So the server tells us to enter a command. So for example, let's just say we want to just list out what is in the server there. So you see, it lists out all the application that are inside the, the client. With the help of the client here, we're able to see all the applications that are there. All right. Although we have to keep on, we're able to put this particular uh, line in a loop, but it's still okay this way. So you see now a client helps us to list out or helps us to execute the command by as the command in this uh, uh, shell here, that is what is in, in this, uh, our Kali Linux system, uh, the particular directory, then returns the response back to the server so we are able to get information from the server right here by just sending a shell command we just said ls and it brings out all the stops that are there so you can even go again now now for before we leave this by particular lesson now let's say we want to just uh, uh create another uh, file now for example we can create another file by just running it because we know that our target is a linus uh, machine so we just say touch uh uh uh, let's say my test okay, okay let's say attacker dot pi for instance so it helps us create it it didn't bring any back this in but we see now we have attacker dot pi created the uh our clients was able to help us to create that all right so you see it now we are able to control the system from this place here okay so this is how you do it. so basically this is how a backdoor works so you have two application one as the client which you install on the target machine through several process now some of them if it's in a game you can put that in a game uh, so once ever the person the your client the, the target or the victim innocently opens this game the, uh, the target uh, backdoor is open, is fired. And if then the uh, the server can be started and be used to communicate with it. So, but apart from that, they may even not require the, uh, without the uh, the user, the victim uh, opening any application, they may, if the, uh, the, the backdoor can be programmed to become a kind of a daemon, a daemon so that it can be running on the background. So at that stage, whether the user opens a, the application or not, the backdoor can be running. So as such, each time this, the, uh, the user opens the system, the hacker can be having a, using through shell command to be able to get whatever information you want to do, can be able to deposit, can be able to create files there, can be able to attack, 
can be able to, uh, you know, be able to steal some information from the exploit this system. So basically, that is the concept of this is how you maintain access in uh, uh, using Python or access with, uh, in a user a target machine using what we call backdoor. So this talks about the how to create a simple backdoor using uh, the Python programming language. And for this uh, this particular call, this is the last two we'll be producing talking about uh, backdoor. So giving you a good way so with what we have learned so far you've been able to get a good information on how to create some custom uh, ethical hacking tool so in the last ne uh, last lesson on the next lesson which will be the last lesson we'll be giving you the final words and the conclusion concerning this course and the ne way forward that you need to go from here so over now to, this is the end of this lesson over to the next lesson right now so, uh we have come finally come to the end of this course on python ethical hacking and basically, this course are taking you through the Python programming language. You've been taught the, the basics of the Python programming, programming language from the, the basic to an intermediate level. Then from there, you will learn also how to set up uh, a very effective and secure uh, ethical hacking lab. All right. Then also from there, we have been able to also see how to develop some basic and simple, um, simple and custom ethical hacking to using the Python programming language. Now, with the lessons you have learned in this particular course, on that we, on, we believe that you'll be able to do with some little research on the internet, you'll be able to create your own custom ethical hacking tools, then also be able to modify some existing ones and add your own functionality to make it more robust. So as such, you will not end up uh, being a, uh, a script kiddo, you know, just depending on third-party application or just always wondering how things are working under the hood. All right, so that is the major essence of this particular course. So that be able to, you know, it teaches you mainly how to be able to create your own custom ethical hacking tools using the Python programming language. All right, now just to let you know that uh, uh, we have plan for a future uh, series on this eth on ethical hacking, the future uh, course series. So in our future course, we're covering uh, some more lessons on some more uh, on how to develop uh, other ethical hacking tools such as. Uh, uh, other ethical hacking tools and also some other ethical hacking techniques so with, in the uh, future courses we're talking about uh, looking at how to create uh, e-logger to do wi-fi hacking how to do web hacking and then hacking with kali liners uh, email hacking how to do social engineering web crawler denial of service attacks etc and etc so just keep up with us keep uh, just stay tuned with us and uh, eventually we'll be able to and learn or learn much much more ethical hacking techniques from our courses so from here onward i will say thank you for your time and goodbye
So uh, we have come to, finally come to the end of this course on Python ethical hacking. And basically this course are taking you through the Python programming language. You've been taught the, the basics of the Python programming, programming language from the, the basic to an intermediate level. Then from there you learned also how to set up uh, a very effective and secure uh, ethical hacking lab. All right, then also from there we have been able to also see how to develop some basic and simple um, simple and custom ethical hacking to using the Python programming language. Now with the lessons you have learned in this particular course, on that we, are, we believe that you'll be able to do with some little research on the internet, you'll be able to create your own custom ethical hacking tools. Then also be able to modify some existing ones and add your own functionality to make it more robust. So as such, you will not end up uh, being a, uh, a script kiddo, you know, just depending on third party application or just always wondering how things are working under the hood. All right, so that is the major essence of this particular course. So that be able to, you know, it teaches you mainly how to be able to create your own custom ethical hacking tools using the Python programming language. All right, now just to let you know that uh, uh, we have planned for a future uh, series on this eth on ethical hacking, the future uh, course series. So in our future course, we're covering uh, some more lessons on some more uh, on how to develop uh, other ethical hacking tools, such as uh, uh, other ethical hacking tools and also some other ethical hacking techniques. So with, in the future courses, we're talking uh, looking at how to create uh, e logger, how to do Wi-Fi hacking, how to do web hacking and then hacking with Kali Linus, uh, email hacking, how to do social engineering, web crawler, denial of service attacks, ETC and ETC. So just keep up with us, keep, uh, just stay tuned with us and uh, eventually be able to uh, learn, or learn much, much more ethical hacking techniques from our courses. So from here onward, I say thank you for your time and goodbye. Goodbye and thank you. I appreciate you so much for your patronage. All right. Bye for the now. Bye.